Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> Let's start. Now, today we will have an uninterrupted session, and that is on environment and ecology. Now, good afternoon to all of you. Fine, to all of you. Let's start. And uh, what we'll do is that one by one we'll discuss the topics. And on those topics, uh, I have arranged some questions. So we'll try to solve the objective questions on those topics. And uh, first of all, we'll take up the fundamentals and also principles of ecology as well as conservation as chapter. And on that, we have uh, set some questions. So let's uh, answer those questions also simultaneously. <coughs> And uh, then we'll discuss ozone layer, ozone layer depletion. Then discuss the questions on ozone layer, ozone layer depletion also. Then discuss global warming and climate change, questions on that also. Then environmental pollution also. And uh, in the last science and technology segment, uh, biotechnology has been missed. So we'll discuss biotechnology at the last also. So let's cover up and if you uh, are along with me, I'll take it to as much extended session as I can. Clear as much extended session as I can. Yes, I'll see the chat also. Fine. Let's start. And uh, let's start one by one. Let's see. We start from the fundamentals today. <coughs> and in between, we'll deviate to include many other things contemporary issues as such. Now, the first thing that we'll deal with, what? The first thing as a, a terminology, we'll start with what? We'll start with biosphere. So, let's start with biosphere. Now, we know that, that suppose this is the surface of the earth. The extent of biosphere from the surface of the earth into the atmosphere is to a height of about 8 kilometers. That's the extent of biosphere in atmosphere. It means that the lower lying part of atmosphere is a part of it. Then it includes the lithosphere, that's the land surface. And not only lithosphere, in lithosphere it can go to a depth of about 2 kilometers. But this is not hydrosphere. This is that part of lithosphere which is devoid of water. Clear, this is that part of lithosphere which is devoid of water. We'll deal with the conferences in sequential manner from 21st to 27th. We'll deal all the terms related to conference. <coughs> and then we would be responsible also. Now, if we'll deal all, first of all, let's deal with the terminology, then the principles of ecology from where the questions are framed also. Conservation is a part of your syllabus. Let's cover up that. And then we'll come to ozone layer, ozone layer depletion, etc. So, let's start with that. Now, in lithosphere, it can go to a depth of about 2 kilometers, but in hydrosphere, it can stretch to a depth of about 9 kilometers. That's the extent of biosphere we are talking about. When we talk about biosphere, we say that biosphere is defined as what biosphere is called as the organic world. <coughs> it is referred to as the organic world. It is that part of the earth where organisms are present. Clear? It is that part of the earth where organisms are present. Yes, yes, we'll start with that also. We'll deal with that. We'll deal with biotechnology also at the end. And I'll take care of the chat session also. I'll take care of the chat session also. Don't worry about that. We'll deal with all the conferences, all the major conferences in the form of questions also. And we'll start from COP 21st to deal with COP 27, also the CBD, which was convened recently. So let's deal with the, all those things. Don't worry about that. But let's start with biosphere. Now, biosphere is called as what it is referred to as the organic world. organic world. It is that part of the earth where organisms are present. Clear? That part of the earth and uh, the also there is a demand for being bilingual. Let, let me see that whether I can be bilingual at times. Clear? Let me see whether I can be bilingual at times. Now, <coughs> it is called as the 
organic world it is that part of the earth where organisms are present and uh, also you can see that as far as biosphere is concerned biosphere is also defined as what it is also defined as a narrow zone narrow zone of contact between it's a narrow zone of contact between land water and air land water and air that's how we are responsible for defining biosphere but when we talk about biosphere we can see that biosphere consists of what biosphere consists of three components the first component is called as what it is called as abiotic component now you can see what is abiotic component constituted of abiotic component cons consists of what it consists of lithosphere atmosphere and hydrosphere these are three abiotic component which is present in biosphere so when you are talking about abiotic component in biosphere we can see that the abiotic component in biosphere includes what it includes lithosphere it includes atmosphere and also it includes what it includes hydrosphere these are abiotic component in biosphere but when we are talking about biotic component biotic component in biosphere includes what it includes plants animals as well as what as well as microorganisms so these are biotic component of biosphere but when we are talking about the energy component energy component energy component of biosphere includes the source of energy source of energy and we can see the main source of energy is what the main source of energy is sunlight sunlight which is utilized by plants for photosynthesis and then plants when utilize it for photosynthesis they would be behaving as what they would be behaving as autotrophs they are behaving as autotrophs they would be called as primary producers of the food chain because a food chain would be constituted taking the plant at the base clear so they would be called as primary producers of the food chain they would be called as autotrophs all these things but they are not going to ask you all these things very simple fine now let's start with here plants we say that plants are primary producers of the food chain they are referred to as primary producers of the food chain they would be called as what they would be referred to as autotrophs autotrophs means they are manufacturing their own food so plants are referred to as autotrophs they are called as what they are called as primary producers of the food chain fine they are referred to as primary producers of the food chain they would be referred to as autotrophs clear just one second they would be referred to as autotroph yes we are going to cover today all, uh, the entire syllabus of environment clear the entire syllabus of environment dekho <coughs> प्लांट्स को क्या कहते हैं प्राइमरी प्रोड्यूसर्स ऑफ फूड चेन उन्हें कहते हैं ऑटोड्रॉप्स अगर हिंदी बोलने बोलोगे तो हिंदी में उसे कहते हैं क्या प्राथमिक उत्पादक समझ आएगा हिंदी या उसे कहते हैं स्वपोषी क्लियर सो प्लांट्स वुड बी कॉल्ड एज व्हाट प्राइमरी प्रोड्यूसर वुड बी कॉल्ड एज ऑटोड्रॉप्स एंड यू नो वेरी वेल दैट द फूड चेन वुड बी कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड वेयर प्लांट्स वुड बी प्राइमरी प्रोड्यूसर्स ऑफ द फूड चेन वेरी गुड वी नो दैट so plants are autotrophs but now here let's include some intricacies also an agency can be autotroph not on the only on the basis of photosynthesis an agency can be autotroph also on the basis of chemosynthesis see we can see that as far as primary producers of the food chain is concerned when we say who are the primary producers of the food chain we say that plants are primary producers of the food chain photosynthesis is performed by plants so are primary producers of the food chain but photosynthesis would be also performed by some bacteria clear now those bacteria for example cyanobacteria they do have photosynthetic pigment present in it so they would be responsible for performing photosynthesis clear also algae are responsible for performing photosynthesis 
some modified roots are responsible for performing photosynthesis. So, all these agencies are responsible for performing photosynthesis. Plants are responsible, some bacteria we do, which do have photosynthetic pigment present in it would be responsible for performing photosynthesis, algae would be responsible for performing photosynthesis, modified root system would be responsible for performing photosynthesis. So, all these are the agencies which are responsible for performing photosynthesis. First of all, now when we talk about algae, now let us gather information as much as we can on algae. When we are talking about algae, we can see that different types of algae which would be responsible for performing photosynthesis, they generally perform photosynthesis. Some algae are called as what? Red algae. Some algae are called as what? Brown algae. Then we can see some algae are also called as diatoms. Some are called as zooks anthellae. So, let us see. And there is an algae much in the news in India, this is a type of weed and that is called as what? That is called as kappa ficus. So, let us see what is kappa ficus also, clear? If we talk about, yes, I will continue with English, but in between is suppose. Yes, this session would be exhaustive. Yes, this session would be exhaustive and I want to bear you all with me that this complete environment at one go. It's just think that we are sitting in a class for revision session. Clear? Just think that. You are not wasting time. You are sitting in a class just to revise all these things. Clear? Now, see, if you are talking about <coughs> algae in India, we can see in the coastal areas of India, if you are talking about the coastal areas of India, there are more than 900 varieties of, more than 900 varieties of algae. Algae are also referred to as what? Algae are also referred to as seaweeds, clear? So, there are more than 900 varieties of algae or seaweeds. We can see that red algae is used for what? Red algae is used for making of agar sticks. Agarbatti, clear? Red algae is used for making of agar sticks. And when we are talking about brown algae, brown algae is used for making what? Brown algae is used for making of liquid fertilizers. Clear? We are saying that red algae is used for making of agar sticks. Brown algae is used for making of liquid fertilizers. And the state in India, the coastal state of India has, which has and the coastal state of India which has maximum number of algae, clear? Coastal state of India which has maximum number of algae, wo rajya jaha par sabse adhik shaiwal maujud hai tratiya chhetra mein. Coastal number, <coughs> that state of India, coastal state of India which has maximum number of algae is Tamil Nadu. Why? Because there are more than 300 varieties of algae which are present in Tamil Nadu. 300 varieties of algae which are present in Tamil Nadu. And as far as the other types of algae are concerned, one type of algae is called as what? One type of algae is called as diatoms. Look at in UPSC, they have asked you in preliminary examination question on diatoms. Now, di means what? Di means two. Clear. Now, these algae are having two shield like structures. What they are having? Two shield like structures. So, have, they have two covered genoma sanrachana unke paas hai. So, two shield like structures are there. And since two shield like structures are there, that is why they are called as what? They are called as diatoms. So, they have two shield like structures. Then we can see they are single cell. They have only one cell. Clear, that is another information. And everybody knows that we have talked about the algae being primary producers of the food shown. So, the algae would be autotrophs, definitely. So, they are autotrophs, they are primary producers of the food chain, they perform photosynthesis. But when we are talking about diatoms, diatoms perform photosynthesis that we know because all algae are responsible for performing photosynthesis. 
all algae are responsible for performing photosynthesis. But about diatom, one thing which should be known to us is what that more than one fourth of entire biomass of earth. We are saying that more than one fourth of entire biomass of earth, entire biomass of earth is made up of what? It is made up of diatoms. We are saying that more than one fourth of entire biomass of earth. When we say biomass of earth, biomass of earth means dry organic weight. Clear? Dry organic weight. Hindi walon ke liye, do shushk jayavik bhaar hai, usse kehte hai, what biomass? Clear? Jaysa shukhe patte hoon, to usse kehenge biomass. So it's one fourth of the entire biomass of earth is known is made up of diatom. It means what? It means that the diatoms are present in abundance. Clear? The diatoms are present in abundance. And there are two factors required for its survival. First is what? First is moisture. And second is what? Second is sunlight. So, we are saying that there are two factors required for its survival. First is moisture and second is sunlight. And why moisture? Because they would be present in water bodies only. And why sunlight? Because they perform photosynthesis. Clear? So, the fishes, small fishes are responsible for feeding upon diatom. And a food chain would be constituted. Clear? A food chain would be constituted. Also, we can see that as far as diatoms are concerned, diatoms have one lakh shapes. And these 1 lakh shapes of diatoms are used for making desired material in nanotechnology. These 1 lakh shapes of diatom are used for making desired material in nanotechnology. Clear? Fine. Okay, you are with us at night. Okay, Himanshu. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's an organic world. Yes, you can say it's an organic world in that, in that sense. See, but those are very, uh, very conventional type of things. May not be asked in your examination. Concentrate on what we are doing right now. Diatoms. It's a question which has been asked in your examination. Clear? So, when we blend the conventional topics with the contemporary issues, pay attention to that. Clear? Now, this is about diatom. Kya kya hai there are two shield-like structures, single cell and... They have single cell, they have two shield like structure. Photosynthesis is performed by diatoms. One fourth of the entire biomass of earth is nothing but diatom. There are two factors required for its survival, moisture and sunlight, and they have one lakh shapes. And since they have one lakh shapes, these shapes are utilized for making desired material in nanotechnology with the help of diatoms. Clear? With the help of diatoms. So that also. The inner content of diatom is silica. And suppose this is a beaker, this is a beaker containing magnesium or a like contaminant. It's may magnesium hai ya koi contamination hai. And we immerse diatoms into it. The silica would be going out and magnesium would be coming inside diatom. So it means that the diatoms can also be used for purification of water. So we can see that diatoms can be used for purification of water. What more information you want? Purification of water. Now that's about datum. Clear? It can be used for purification of water. Now, yes, dugong, dugong. Dugong, dugong is uh, according to IUCN. Uh, just listen. According to IUCN, strictly speaking, if there is an herbivore mammal in the marine ecosystem, then it is dugong, dugong. And dugong, dugong is responsible for feeding on seaweeds. Clear seaweeds. Dugong dugon is responsible for fishing or seaweeds, which is nothing but sea algae. And so diatoms would be feeding, uh, feeded by uh, these things. They would be consumed by dugong dugon. Clear. So dugong dugon is what they should know is strictly speaking, according to IUCN, the only herbivore mammal in the marine ecosystem. And we are discussing here why? Because it is responsible for feeding on what? It is responsible for feeding on the seaweeds. Clear? Now, how water purification? Just one thing. Yes. 
Yes, a biotic component is lithosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, plants, animals, and microorganism are biotic component and energy component is sunlight. Okay. Yes, dugong dugong feeds on di diatoms, definitely Anushka, Pankaj. How for water purification, sir? Now see, water purification means that, dekho, inner content of diatom is silica. Clear? So, if suppose this beaker, this glass has magnesium as the contaminant and I insert diatom into it, the diatom silica from diatom would be coming out and it would be replaced by magnesium. So, water would be purified. That is why we are saying that it is used for purification of water also. Yes, diatoms help in carbon sequestration. Why? Because diatoms are performing photosynthesis. Obviously, it will be responsible for absorbing CO2 from atmosphere. Clear? Now, let us see second one. Because we have limited time, only till midnight. <laughs> so, we have to cover the entire environment and biotechnology in that session. Now, see. Next thing that you have to know is Zooks and Thele. Clear Zooks and Thele. Now, Zooks and Thele is an algae. But this algae is in a symbiotic relationship with. We are saying that this algae is in a symbiotic relationship with whom? Corals. Suppose this side is the coral. So, it is in a symbiotic relationship with corals. Clear? Zooks and Thile is in a symbiotic relations with corals. And what are corals then? Corals are invertebrates belong to the class of Anthrozoa. Corals are invertebrates without vertebral column they are belong to the class of Anthrozoa. They are marine organisms. And they are also called as polyps. So, they are referred to as what? They are referred to as polyps. And they are invertebrates. Invertebrates belong to the class of anthrozoa belong to the class of anthrozoa ye anthrozoa ke class mein aate hain inhe polyps bhi kehte hain corals ko and they are living in a symbiotic relationship with zooks and thile wo sahjeevi sambandh mein rehte hain ek sehwal ke jinka naam hai kya zooks and thile and we can see that what is the symbiotic relationship like now corals are responsible for providing zooks and thile a protected area so that they can perform photosynthesis. We are saying that corals are responsible for providing zooks and thile. A protected area so that they can perform photosynthesis. On the other hand, zooks and thile is an algae. It would be responsible for photosynthesis. It is primary producer in the food chain. And zooks and thile would be responsible for providing coral carbon compounds that is the organic matter. Clear? See, whenever photosynthesis is performed, organic matter like polysaccharides or cellulose would be generated. Now, these are what? These are carbon compounds. Clear? Now, these carbon compounds are being supplied by Zooks and Thile when they perform photosynthesis to the corals for their survival. Clear? To the corals for their survival. And Corals are responsible for providing zooks and thile what a protected area so that they can perform photosynthesis. Clear? So, they are responsible for providing corals a protected area so that they can perform photosynthesis. Now, this is the symbiotic relationship that can be seen between corals and zooks and thile. When we are talking about coral reefs, when we talk about coral reefs, this is Hindi mein kehte hain kya bachon? Hindi mein kehte praval vitti. When we are talking about coral reefs. Now, coral reefs are what? Coral reefs are deposition of calcium carbonate. They are calcium carbonate deposited by whom? Corals. So, reefs when we say. Reefs are nothing but deposition of calcium carbonate by corals. Clear? And there is a symbiotic relationship existing between Zooks and Thile and the corals. Clear? There is a symbiotic relationship existing between Zooks and Thile and corals. Just let me see your queries.
yes carbon uh, it helps in carbon sequestration sea beads don't have stem root and leaves even there are there is seaweed bar in yes they do not have generally seaweeds are nothing but sea algae only uh zooks and tele feed on coral polyps symbiosis yes they feed on coral polyps they are responsible for giving corals see corals give them protected area to perform photosynthesis and zooks and they when they perform photosynthesis they would be responsible for supplying coral the organic compounds clear good afternoon okay shelter yes calcium carbonate is caco3 not caco2 carbon compounds carbon compounds are what carbon compounds are polysaccharides and cellulose which are developed through photosynthesis and these are stored in different parts of the plant whenever photosynthesis is performed clear fine this much is clear now now this should be known to you that what is coral reef deposition of calcium carbonate what is coral it's called as polyps is invertebrates belong to the class of anthrozoa they are definitely marine organism they live in a symbiotic relationship with what they are living in a symbiotic yes both would be benefited yes definitely both would be benefited no problem about that now we'll try to <coughs> uh cover up as much as we can for the pt 2023 clear so that's why we are going in a depth now see we'll discuss everything about corals right now clear we'll discuss everything about corals right now now first thing we have discussed this now let's expand this and discuss what and discuss what is cupophycus and also discuss what is oceanic acidification clear what is oceanic acidification now see when we are talking about co2 which is present in atmosphere co2 which is present in atmosphere is absorbed by oceans and one third of co2 which is present in atmosphere is absorbed by the oceans clear CO2 which is present in a atmosphere is absorbed by the forest also and we can see one third of CO2 which is present in atmosphere would be absorbed by the forest too clear so these are two big carbon sinks as such but in oceans suppose when we are talking about CO2 is being absorbed by oceans where it is utilized now CO2 absorbed by oceans is utilized where it is utilized by phytoplankton and we are phytoplankton means phytoplankton means the plant life in ocean clear it is utilized by what it is utilized by the algae algae like diatom red algae brown algae or zooks and thele for performing photosynthesis phytoplankton is a general term for all plant life in ocean clear it generally includes the sea algae the seaweeds but algae we have put separately and all these are responsible for utilizing the co2 absorbed by the oceans for photosynthesis clear photosynthesis but if suppose more of co2 is present in the atmosphere in the take the case that more of co2 is present in the atmosphere and more of co2 is present in the atmosphere due to industrial emission then definitely what will happen more of co2 would be absorbed by the oceans clear so if more of co2 is absorbed by the oceans and which is in surplus with which is in surplus with the requirement of phytoplanktons if we are saying that more of co2 is absorbed by the oceans which is in surplus with the requirement of phytoplanktons we can see that this excess amount of co2 that is beyond the requirement of phytoplanktons and algae for photosynthesis so this excess amount of co2 would be combining with water to form what to form carbonic acid and this is the main reason behind oceanic acidification clear so when we are talking about oceanic acidification we can see that the main reason behind oceanic acidification is what it is 
nothing but excessive amount of CO2 which is present in atmosphere. This is nothing but a but excessive amount of CO2 which is present in atmosphere due to industrial emission and because of that oceanic acidification is taking place. Clear? So, we are referring to oceanic acidification is taking place. I explain once more that if suppose excess amount of CO2 is present. Just one second, corals provide protection. Yes, Zooks and Thile provide food. Yes, coral reefs deposition of calcium. Yes, yes, Sandhya, that's correct. The correct sequence you are having. Now, see, <coughs> when we are talking about oceanic acidification, we know, I will explain once more. We know that, that if excess amount of CO2 is present in atmosphere due to industrial emission, more of it would be absorbed by the plants for photosynthesis, more of it would be absorbed by the oceans for photosynthesis, more by phytoplankton for photosynthesis. But if excess amount of CO2 is present in atmosphere, more of it is absorbed. Now, this is beyond the requirement of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton do not require it more for photosynthesis. So, what happens is the excess amount of CO2 which is absorbed would be combining with water to form carbonic acid that is H2CO3 and this is the main reason why this is the main reason behind oceanic acidification clear. So, this would be called as the main reason behind oceanic acidification, but do remember that it is not the sole reason. The other reason behind oceanic acidification includes what it includes fertilizer waste. So, we can see that. The second reason behind oceanic acidification is what? Fertilizer waste. So, if they ask you that oceanic acidification occurs due to enhanced industrial emission, fertilizer waste and also cement industry waste. All the three would be correct option. So, second we can see that also happens due to what? It also happens due to cement industry waste. Cement industry waste. Clear? So, when we are talking about oceanic acidification, one factor which is responsible for oceanic acidification is formation of carbonic acid, carbonic acid and this is why this is due to absorption of excess amount of CO2 from atmosphere, but the other two factors are what fertilizer waste and cement industry waste. So, all three reasons behind oceanic acidification, clear? three reasons behind oceanic acidification. Now, you would have studied in your, yes, I am coming to, just coming to coral bleaching, just wait for a few seconds. Now, you would have studied in your school days about what weak acid and strong acid and then do not say me no because you cannot pass the examination without studying all these things. So, you would have studied in your school days about weak acid and strong acid. Weak acid, so carbonic acid is what? Carbonic acid is nothing but a weak acid. Clear? So, if it is a weak acid, if you are talking about carbonic acid is a weak acid, carbonic acid would be responsible for release of hydrogen ion. In se kya hoga? Hydrogen ion bahar niklenge clear hydrogen ion in niklenge bahar. But this would be combining with the carbonate ion which is naturally present in the ocean. Carbonate ion which is naturally present in the ocean. And the carbonate ion which is naturally present in the ocean. Now, this would be further continuing what? This would be further continuing oceanic acidification. Clear? So, it means that again acid would be formed and this would be further continuing oceanic acidification. Is that clear? Further continuing oceanic acidification. Yes, surface and fertilizers. clear. See, as far as, now as far as the pH value is concerned, the pH value of oceanic water you are saying is 7.2, but that is due to the basis which is present clear. 
and oceanic acidification takes place uh, because of global warming. It's not a very widespread phenomena that every part of each and every part of ocean because ocean is a big chunk of water. So, on average, the pH value registered 7.2, but in certain areas where oceanic acidification has been noticed, the pH value decreases. <coughs> Clear? Now, let us uh, see further. Now, this further results in oceanic, this further would be resulting in oceanic acidification and acidification would be continuing. But if we say that the impact of enhanced level of CO2 in atmosphere due to industrial emission is global warming, which is also leading to oceanic acidification. We can see oceanic acidification leads to coral bleaching. Clear? Oceanic acidification leads to coral bleaching. And when we are saying that oceanic acidification is leading to coral bleaching, it means that now we sometimes jump to the conclusion that Coral bleaching means that the corals turn pale. Now, it does not mean that corals turn pale only because corals, if you see, corals are brightly colored. They are of different colors. They are of red, brown, green, blue, pink, different varieties of color they are. Clear? So, it does not mean that the corals turn pale only and it does not mean that the reefs turn pale only that the coral reefs turn pale because of coral bleaching. The greater implication of coral bleaching is what? That the density of Zook's anthere declines because of oceanic acidification. And why? Because the photosynthetic pigment present in it would be reduced. Okay? So, coral bleaching means that the corals ke rang jo hain, wo fike pad jate hain, ya reefs ke rang jo hain, fike pad jate hain, lekin Zook's anthere jo hain, Unka ghanatto ghatega and why density is reducing because the photosynthetic pigment due to oceanic acidification would be getting reduced. Clear? Would be getting reduced. Now, this would be reducing ecological productivity of that area. And if the ecological productivity of that area would be reduced, if the ecological productivity of that area would be reduced, now this would be responsible for what? This would be responsible for. <coughs> ecological productivity of that area is reduced, then we can see that photosynthesis is very less performed in that area because the photosynthetic pigment which is present in Zook's anthele is definitely missing. Clear. Thank you, Himansu. Yes, we will try to explain all those things. Just wait for some time. You cannot explain all this thing at within one or two minutes. Just wait for some time. I have just started. Now see, this is called as coral bleaching. Just remember that in coral bleaching, not only the reefs or the coral turns pale, but the density of Zook's anthere declines at the as the photosynthetic pigment present in it is getting reduced. Now, connect the IPCC report. The IPCC assessment report of 2015. It said what? It said that why the world cannot afford temperature enhancement beyond 1.5 degree centigrade. Clear? And it said that why the world cannot afford temperature beyond uh, enhancement beyond 1.5 degree centigrade. And the reason provided by IPCC was that this would be leading to a catastrophic situation in which 70 to 90 percent of corals would vanish. Clear? So, even if we are meeting the target of 1.5 degree centigrade enhancement also, 70 to 90 percent of corals would vanish. So, the danger is posed on corals also. There is a danger posed on corals also. So, this is said by the IPCC assessment report. Clear that 70 to 90 percent of corals would vanish. Corals would vanish. So, what needs to be done for this purpose? Now, for this purpose, we can we can adhere to what is called as what? What is called as the 50 reef project. See, in the 1950s, there was an economic theory given by an uh, economist. His name was Markovich. Although this is an economic theory, but it carries ecological significance. And this theory can be utilized by you anytime for writing your answers. 
that 50 reef project 50 reef project means that suppose aapke paas paisa hai you want you have money you want to invest safely somewhere now you would be selecting those areas for investment which are coral reef areas so 50 reef project calls you to invest in 50 coral reef areas of the world if you want risk averse investment if you want risk free investment clear and why 50 coral reefs area of the world why not other coral reef areas of the world because these 50 reef coral reef areas of the world are likely to survive the adverse impact of global warming and climate change clear but they can be used for repopulating other coral reef areas of the world clear so they would be utilized for repopulating other coral reef areas of the world fine and if this is done this would, would be of a greater economic significance because coral reef areas is not only of ecological significance because also of e economic significance as a number of nutrients as a number of medicines come from coral reef area so your investment won't be going in waste clear your investment won't be going in waste kaval narain yeah, eutrophication, yeah, eutrophication, I'll teach, but the eutrophication has no linkage with coral bleaching as such. Please understand. I'm saying that, I repeat once again. I repeat once again. I'm saying that, that if this is the condition, coral bleaching is taking place and the IPCC has said that even if we meet the target of 1.5 degree centigrade enhancement, in its assessment report which was published in 2015 then also 70 to 90 percent of corals would vanish so what should be done this is nothing but a emergent emergency kind of situation so what should be done for this purpose now for this purpose we can use what is called as 50 coral reef project 50 coral reef project was a economic theory given by markovich his name was Markovich and he gave this theory and called all those risk averse investors those who have money they want to invest uh, without any risk so it called all risk averse investors to invest in those areas which are uh, 50 coral reef areas of the world and they are likely to survive the adverse impact of global warming and climate change but they can be utilized to uh, repopulate the other coral reef areas of the world because they would be getting damaged due to global warming and climate change and since coral reef areas is not only of ecological significance but also of economic significance we can see the investment won't be going in waste because a number of medicine a number of nutrients come from coral reef areas clear coral reef areas but this is not only the thing that yes 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 now <coughs> this definitely 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 now, this is not only the thing that you have to know about corals. See, in the news is what? That government of India is trying to establish a marine biodiversity park. In fact, the national park, not biodiversity, national park in Tamil Nadu. Clear. But a weed happens to be a concern for India. And that weed which is a concern for India is called as what? It is called as Kappa ficus. Kappa ficus is a seaweed. So it's a sea algae. And this is much in the news. Now you'll say that what kind of teacher we are listening to has started from a uh, term <laughs> biosphere and he has gone to coral bleaching IPCC report then 50 reef project <laughs> and now coming to uh, invasive weed in India which is called as kappa ficus but that's how the questions are framed I'm helpless I'm helpless that's how the questions are framed clear that's how the questions are framed <laughs> now see kappa ficus kappa ficus is a algae that's a seaweed and this weed is proving dangerous for whom dangerous for what we have discussed now corals 
clear this sea algae this seaweed is proving dangerous for corals because corals are of different colors they are corals are of brown corals are of red green blue clear fine so all these they are yellow but the corals are never gray corals are never black so kappa ficus is responsible for damaging the corals and because these corals get damaged they are turning into what they are turning into black and gray corals so if you see black and gray corals these are nothing but damaged corals clear so they would be called as damaged corals damaged corals now kappa ficus is what it is invasive in india invasive in india means what that when you talk about any vegetation that any vegetation is any vegetation is certainly endemic in area endemic means that it is exclusively found in that area clear but if suppose we are talking about any vegetation to be invasive in india invasive in india means that it is responsible for environmental degradation in india so endemic in some elsewhere and invasive in some elsewhere now as far as now as far as a kappa ficus is concerned is responsible for damaging the corals and turning it into black and gray corals clear black and gray corals as such responsible for damaging the corals and damaged corals they are turning into gray but from where we brought this why we brought this sometimes what happens invasive vegetation reaches your ecosystem automatically sometimes it is brought to your ecosystem so the it has reached our ecosystem how it has reached our ecosystem not automatically but we brought this the farmers in the coastal region of india are cultivating kappa ficus we are saying that the farmers in the coastal region of india are cultivating kappa ficus and kappa why should kappa ficus be cultivated now kappa ficus is cultivated why because it is responsible for giving you a substance which is called as carrageena carrageenan and carrageenan is what carrageenan is an emulsifying agent emulsifying agent means which is responsible for mingling two unlike things which is responsible for mingling two unlike things clear so it mingles and generally it is used in food stuffs the emulsifying agents so it was cultivated on a large scale and used as a emulsifying agent and today what is problem that kappa ficus when it is cultivated on a large scale is damaging the corals so we brought it from where we brought it from japan in india it was brought brought from japans but we can see that it is endemic in where it is endemic in philippines it is endemic in philippines clear so it happens to be endemic in philippines and this is called as kappa ficus yes mosses and protected corals yes definitely definitely fine okay thank you so much invasive india means see i'm uh, i'm repeating yours just one question i'm repeating now see invasive in india means that these uh, type of weeds were endemic in some other ecosystem for example it was endemic in philippines it was brought to india from japan and it was cultivated by the farmers of coastal area for deriving a substance called carrageenan which is used as an emulsifying agent which is used as a emulsifying agent and it has turned out to be invasive for india why because it is responsible for damaging the corals in the coastal ecosystem clear coastal ecosystem now we can see the corals are turning uh, gray and also black so they are called as damaged corals but the chapter on corals is not over now just remember one thing when coral bleaching takes place and we have said that in coral bleaching the density of zooxanthellae declines 
because the photosynthetic pigment would be getting reduced. Obviously, the Zooks anthellae won't be producing the amount the same way photosynthesis. Ecological productivity of that area would be declining. Clear? But when we are talking about that uh, photosynthesis is being reduced, ecological productivity of that area is obviously declining. Now, that means what? That means that if the corals do not get organic matter from Zooks and There, then they are responsible for what? Then they are responsible for expelling Zooks and There from them. So, the corals, Mando ye corals hai, and Zooks and There is here. So, corals, if they are not getting organic matter from the cor uh, from Zooks and There, they are responsible for expelling Zooks and There, removing Zooks and There from them. Now, these type of corals, which removes Zooks and Thile would be called as what? It would be called as stressed corals. It would be called as stressed corals. Okay? Look, Zooks and Thile and corals are in symbiotic relationship. So, if you think that Zooks and Thile is not able to perform photosynthesis, then what will happen? Corals would be responsible for removing Zooks and Thile from them could be responsible for removing Zooks and Thile from them. So, expelling Zooks and Thile from them, we will remove These kind of corals which remove Zooks and Thile would be called as what? It would be referred to as stressed corals. It would be called as stressed corals. Then there are certain corals which were situated deep inside the ocean. Deep inside the ocean. These corals. And these corals do not have Zooks and Thile along with them. So, they are called as what? They are called as a Zooks anthelate. A Zooks anthelate. These corals. And they derive their nutrition from plankton, from life in oceans. हाँ मैं हिंदी इंग्लिश मिक्स करके ही पढ़ा रहा हूँ ठीक है ब्लैक कोरल्स क्या है ब्लैक कोरल्स रेशो है डैमेज्ड कोरल्स ग्रे या ब्लैक कोरल है डैमेज्ड कोरल्स और डैमेज्ड कोरल्स किसके कारण है एक वीड है इंडिया में कोस्टल एरिया में जिसे हम लोग कहते हैं कप्पा फाइकस एंड दिस वीड हैज टर्न आउट टू बी इनवेजिव इन इंडिया इट वाज ब्रॉट टू इंडिया फ्रॉम जापान एंड दिस हैज टर्न आउट टू बी इनवेजिव इन इंडिया एंड दैट्स कॉल्ड एज कप्पा फाइकस एमएलसी फाइंग एजेंट का मतलब है टू अनलाइक थिंग्स को मिक्स करने वाले एजेंसी को कहते हैं हम लोग एमएलसी फाइंग एजेंट जनरली फूड स्टफ्स में यूज होता है ये क्लियर फाइन Thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much. Yes, binding together, yes, very good. Or I mix it and I'm studying it. I'm going to speak in Hindi. My Hindi is a little weak. I'm going to speak Hindi. Don't worry about that. Fine. So this is called as Azuk's entry. Now this is about corals that you have to know. But since we were responsible for discussing invasive weed, Kappa Ficus here, let us discuss some invasive plants also which are very prominent in India. And these invasive plants which are very prominent in India include what? Let's see and how they are responsible for, clear, how they are responsible for having an adverse impact, clear. Generally the corals are present where? Then generally the corals are present in the continental self. They are, they are present in the continental self, fine. But first, let's complete invasive plants also. We have completed the topic of corals. So, let's complete the invasive plant also here. Now, see, when we are talking about invasive plants, we can see invasive species. It can be both plants and animals. Invasive species means that they are not endemic to your ecosystem. They are endemic in some other ecosystem. They are exclusively found in some other ecosystem. But they have turned out to be invasive for your ecosystem. They have reached your ecosystem and they are responsible for environmental degradation in your ecosystem. Clear? So, they have reached your ecosystem and is responsible for environmental degradation of your ecosystem. So, they would be called as what? They would be called as invasive plants. Fine. Invasive species. Now, they can be both animals also and plants also. 
clear let's consider here plants vegetation so one vegetation we have discussed is in the form of an algae which is called as capophycus but the other vegetation which are invasive in india so if we talk about only and only vegetation let's take up vegetation in india and talk about what invasive vegetation in india invasive plants in india so invasive plants are also called as what are also referred to as exotic plants are also referred to as what it is also called as alien plants invasive plants exotic plant or alien plants clear and these are not natural to your ecosystem so they are not natural to our ecosystem to our ecosystem clear they are invasive in our ecosystem so they are natural to some other ecosystem but they are invasive in our ecosystem that's why and they are invasive why because they are responsible for large scale degradation in our ecosystem clear large scale yes my voice is like tharoor sir very good and <laughs> oh, what maza aa raha hai sir great session thank you so much thank you so much okay whatever time i'll get see whatever time i'll get i i i want to continue till midnight 3 o'clock clear 4 o'clock but if you are with me then i'll continue for that and try to cover up environment and also biotechnology clear is it all right that we continue today fine so let's see till when we continue not let let us not fix a target let's see how much can we done now this is this is invasive for our ecosystem that's not natural to our ecosystem but they are invasive for our ecosystem now these kind of plants these kind of vegetations are responsible for remove for uh, emission of certain chemicals they are responsible for emitting certain chemicals now these chemicals are called as what they are called as allelo chemicals what they are called as allelo chemicals and uh, these allelo chemicals impede the growth of they impede the growth of they stop the growth of other vegetation clear other vegetation so when they are responsible for stopping the growth of other vegetation by release of these chemicals this phenomena is called as what this phenomena is called as allelopathic effect clear this phenomena is called as allelopathic effect so in upsc they have asked you what is allelopathy clear what is allelopathy and uh, this is called as allelopathic effect they are also responsible for what they are responsible for release of allergens clear they would be responsible for release of allergens too so this is called as allelopathic effect and these kind of plants would be called as invasive exotic or alien plants i think that's clear but let us in upsc they can ask you questions on this also but they can ask you questions on examples also clear they would be asking you questions or uh, examples also so let's take some examples clear let's take some examples now one example that we are citing here is of parthenium second is of lantana third is of water hyacinth fourth is of blue pine so let's talk about all these kind of now see first is called as what it's called as parthenium parthenium is what parthenium is a type of weed type of weed and it came to india how when we were responsible for यस यस अब अब बच्चों तो आप लोग ध्यान दोगे इधर अब शशि थरूर को छोड़ दो मेरी वॉइस कैसी है जैसा आपका वॉइस बहुत ही अच्छा थैंक यू सो मच अब उन्हें छोड़ो आप आप थोड़ा इसे याद करते चलो साथ साथ क्लियर जस्ट इसके साथ साथ चलो और इसको याद करते चलो डोंट वरी अबाउट शशि थरूर शशि थरूर इज फेमस फॉर समथिंग इन फेमस फॉर सम अदर थिंग्स क्लियर सो बी लेट्स कम यर नाउ टाइप दिस इज कॉल्ड एज वॉट दिस इज अ टाइप ऑफ वीड now how it came to india it came to india when we were responsible for importing 
wheat from US. Clear? So, when imported wheat from US, the seeds of Parthenium reached India. Clear? The seeds of Parthenium reached India and it has spread on a large scale. You can see on near the railway tracks, Parthenium is present. Near the farm fields, Parthenium are present. In ba Bangalore is the worst affected city due to Parthenium. Earlier it was called as Garden City, now it is called as Parthenium City also. Clear. <laughs> so Parthenium. But what kind of impact it has? Now it is responsible for impeding the growth of. growth It impedes the growth of the growth of vegetables vegetables then also leguminous crops legumes legumes are responsible for enhancing the fertility of soil legumes and not only vegetable legumes but also grasses so it is responsible for impeding growth of legumes also vegetables grasses and as such it reduces the fertility of the soil also parthenium clear as such it reduces the fertility of soil also now second is called as what it is called as lantana lantana fine lantana is what lantana is if this is a weed it is a type of shrub now this was this didn't automatically come to india but it was brought to india and brought to India. Why? Brought to India because it was used as an ornamental plant. Now, when we say ornamental plant, it means that it is used for what? It is used for decor purpose, decoration ke liye, because it has brightly colored flowers. So, that's why it would be called as what? It would be called as ornamental plant. Clear? It has brightly colored flowers. So, that's what it would be called as ornamental plant. So, it's a shrub. It's ornamental plant. It's used for decor purpose. And this is responsible for, this was brought to India. This is responsible for impeding the growth of coffee plantation. Coffee plantation. Then also teak plantation. Then also not only coffee plantation, teak plantation, but also eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. And also we can see coconut palm. So if they ask you, allelopathic effect of lantana, allelopathic effect of lantana is in all these vegetations. Clear? Then there is another invasive plant in India which is called as water hyacinth. Water hyacinth is what? Now it is also an ornamental plant. It has also brightly colored flowers. You can see in lakes, water hyacinth is present. And this belongs to where? This belongs to the Amazon basin. This is belonging where? It is belonging to the Amazon basin. And it is responsible for what? It is responsible for degradation of lakes in India. Degradation of lakes in India. Fine. Degradation of lakes in India. ठीक है ये क्या कर रहे हैं ये तालाबों का निम्नीकरण कर रहे हैं डिग्रेडेशन ऑफ लेक्स इन इंडिया कहां से आए हैं एमेजोन बेसिन से ऑर्नामेंटल प्लांट है क्योंकि डेकोर पर्पस के लिए आप इसे यूज कर सकते हैं सो दिस इज कॉल्ड एज वाटर हाइसिंथ एंड इट रिड्यूसेस और क्या करते हैं ये इट रिड्यूसेस द डिसॉल्व ऑक्सीजन लेवल बिकॉज़ देखो ऑक्सीजन लेक्स में रहते हैं रिड्यूसेस द डिसॉल्व्ड ऑक्सीजन लेवल Oxygen is always present in the lakes, clear, which is utilized by aquatic organism for their survival. Clear, jo jaliya jeev jantu ke dwara upyog mein lai jate hain oxygen. To oxygen agar level kam ho jayega to kya hoga? Degradation of lakes would take place. Clear, degradation of lakes would take place. Now, Yes, it indicated also a high nitrogen level. That's also another thing which is associated with that. Then we can see another invasive plant is called as what? In India is called as blue pine. Blue pine can be seen where? Kaha dekha ja sakta hai? Hilly tracks of hilly tracks of Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir. It can be seen in the hilly tracks of Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir. And if you talk about blue pine, this is also subtropical American in origin. 
so it belongs to subtropic region of america american in origin and blue pine se kya hota hai blue pine hilly tracks mein aap dekh rahe ho hilly tracks of himachal pradesh and hilly tracks of himachal pradesh mein aap dekh sakte hain ki ye paaye jate hain now this is impeding the growth of what ye kya karte hain jo आठ वनस्पति हैं जिनको कहते हैं हम अष्टवर्गा जिसका उपयोग किया जाता है आयुर्वेद में सो द एट मेडिसिनल प्लांट्स विच आर यूज फॉर आयुर्वेद पर्पस नाउ इट इज इम्पीडिंग द ग्रोथ ऑफ अष्टवर्गा इट इम्पीड द ग्रोथ ऑफ इम्पीड द ग्रोथ ऑफ द ग्रोथ ऑफ अष्टवर्गा अष्टवर्गा Eight medicinal plants. Clear. Now this, these are invasive plants in India. That's your Parthenium, Lantana, and water hyacinth, blue pine. So these are all invasive plants in India. Clear. Already in examination, they have asked you about what? They have asked you about Julie flora. Clear. They have asked you about uh, invasive plant which is called as Julie flora. and julie flora was brought uh, by the british in rajasthan clear and the purpose of bringing this plant to rajasthan was to check desertification in rajasthan but now we can see that this is responsible for what julie flora this is responsible for degradation in rajasthan julie flora is much in news i know that but we now all those eight plants you have, don't have to remember remember only ashtavarga because uh, Javitri is there. Some thing I can remember, but all 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 those eight plants you don't have to remember. Now, Julie flora is news. Definitely, it is news. But already a question has been asked in uh, on Julie flora in your preliminary examination, so they won't be repeating it. So that's why I am taking the these plants and also discuss Kappa ficus. Clear. Also discussed Kappa ficus. Ha ha. Kajri bhi hai. Fine. So all these things now. next thing that you have to know we have to return back to biosphere again <laughs> and we have discussed that biotic components are plants animals and microorganism biotic components are plants animals and microorganism plants they perform photosynthesis photosynthesis is performed by algae also and all different types of algae we have discussed and uh, a photosynthesis is performed by bacteria also but an agency can be autotroph not only on the basis of photosynthesis koi bhi agency autotroph swaposhi matra prakash sansleshan ke aadhar par hi nahi ho sakta hai wo ho sakta hai rasayan sansleshan ke aadhar par bhi a agency can be autotroph not only on the basis of photosynthesis but also on the basis of what also on the basis of chemosynthesis so let's see so and i'll come to again i'll come to invasive species endemic ka matlab hai ki endemic sirf wahi par paaye jate hain to usko kehte hain endemic clear ha khejri pad sakte hain discussed yes now <coughs> now see when we are talking about an agency can be autotroph not only on the basis of photosynthesis but also on the basis of chemosynthesis look suppose this is the ocean that we are talking about clear and inside the ocean we know that remember two or three things here in context of oceans this is suppose the oceanic floor but co2 absorption in ocean is only to a level of 300 meters of the upper part isi mein co2 absorption hota hai clear co2 absorbed is in the upper part of the ocean so upper part of the ocean only absorbs co2 and why we are saying upper part of the oceans on, only absorb co2 why because this part of the ocean is in contact with atmosphere clear so this part of the ocean is in contact with atmosphere to iska matlab kya hai iska matlab hai bachcho phytoplanktons algae all those agencies 
which are responsible for performing photosynthesis, all zooxanthellae, diatoms, etc., etc., that they would be confined to the upper part of the ocean only. Clear? Not below that. So, food chain also would be present in the upper part of the ocean only. But in 1976, Second, uh, another species that we will discuss also is Indian star tortoise, it can be asked as question. So, let us discuss some other species also, but at the end, let us first of all cover up the topics. Because I wish that I want to cover up. Zux enthele kya hai? Zux enthele is nothing but a type of algae which is in a symbiotic relationship with coral. Ye ek seval hai jo corals ke saath, pravalon ke saath sahjeevi sambandh mein rehta hai. Clear? Now see, for phytoplankton and algae would be com, uh, confined to upper part of the ocean only. Wait. And we can see the food chain would be constituted here only. But if we go to the depth of the ocean, we can find a food chain here is also present. So how can a food chain be present in the depth of the ocean where there is no uh, penetration of sunlight? So photosynthesis definitely cannot be performed. And where there is where there is no penetration of sunlight and we can see uh, yes khejri is the state tree of rajasthan theek hai theek hai ab usi mein nahi rehna hai bachon ab bahar bhi nikalna hai let's let's come out we have to cover a lot now see we are saying that that upper part of the ocean co2 is present in 300 meters because this part is in contact with atmosphere and phytoplankton's algae are present here. They are performing photosynthesis. A food chain would be present in the upper part. But the obstruction of solar radiation takes place by the water body. And CO2 is not present in the lower part. So, in 1976, there was a, a experiment which was called as deep horizon experiment. Or deep horizon experiment mein ye paya gaya ki a food chain is present in the lower part of the ocean also. Clear? A food chain is present in the lower part of the ocean also. And how come a food chain would be present in the lower part where there cannot be any penetration of sunlight? When there is no CO2 is present, how can photosynthesis? But the meaning here is not photosynthesis. The basis here is not photosynthetic. We know that, that an autotrop can be... Uh, the basis of being an autotrop is not only photosynthesis. The basis of being an autotrop is also another process which is called as chemosynthesis. So what happens from the oceanic floor, seepage of chemical takes place like methane. Seepage of chemical takes place like hydrogen sulfide. And bacteria which are present over here, bacteria which are present over here near the oceanic floor and particularly those bacteria which are present near a pool here, see in the oceanic floor, agar oceanic floor ko dekho, there are depressions here in which the water is filled. Now these pools are called as what? These pools are called as brine pools. So the bacteria which are present here would be utilizing these chemicals, these chemicals ko utilize karenge, to synthesize natural organic matter natural organic matter. Now, this process is called as what? It is called as chemosynthesis. Clear? This process would be called as what? It would be called as chemosynthesis. Fine. So, if we are saying in the upper part what is happening? If CO2 is utilized, sunlight is utilized to synthesize natural organic matter, then the process is called as photosynthesis. But if chemicals are utilized to synthesize natural organic matter by bacteria present near the brine pools, this process would be called as what? This process would be called as Yes, we will discuss all the questions. Look, what did I do? I have serially arranged the question. One topic will discuss, then we will set a question. So, it will take about 2 hours to talk about one topic. After that, we will come again to the questions. Fine. Now, see, this process will be called as chemosynthesis. Now, here, this bacteria, which is performing 
Hodgkin's chemosynthesis is behaving as what? It is behaving as an autotroph. ये बैक्टीरिया तो ऑटोट्रॉप है ना यहाँ पर यहाँ पर ऑटोट्रॉप होने का बेसिस क्या है कीमोसिंथेसिस यहाँ पर ऑटोट्रॉप होने का बेसिस क्या है फोटोसिंथेसिस सो हियर वी आर सेइंग बैक्टीरियाज आर बिहेविंग एज ऑटोट्रॉप एंड दे आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल दे आर प्राइमरी प्रोड्यूसर्स ऑफ द फूड चेन सो दे आर प्राइमरी प्रोड्यूसर ऑफ द फूड चेन अ फूड चेन वुड बी कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड हियर ऑल्सो सो यू कैन सी दैट टू टाइप्स ऑफ फूड चेन विच आर प्रेजेंट इन द ओशन वन in the upper part the basis of which is photosynthesis and second in the lower part the basis of which is chemosynthesis is that clear clear fine yes himanshu many questions came from the note this year also i hope so that the questions would be from the notes itself fine so the basis would be from the basis of here the food chain basis here would be chemosynthesis the basis of food chain in the upper part would be photosynthesis let's move ab dekho oceanic floor ko humne discuss kar rahe hain bachcho so we have discussed near the oceanic floor many things but oceanic floor is also known for what it is also known for gas hydrates so let's look into that what are gas hydrates clear छोटी छोटी बातें हैं करते चलो ऑल दीज आर क्वेश्चन कैन कम एनी टाइम इन योर एग्जामिनेशन सो लेट्स पिक अप ऑल दीज क्वेश्चन वन बाई वन एक तो ये हो गया सेकेंड न सपोज वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट अगेन ओशियनिक फ्लोर अगेन वी आर गोइंग टू दियनिक फ्लोर न हियर वी से दैट Oceanic floor is also site of what? It is also site of gas hydrates. So, what are gas hydrates as such? See, water has a unique characteristic. Water would be responsible for forming a cage-like structure. Cage-like structure, in which gas-like methane. We know that from the oceanic floor, gases like methane is seeping. so water can form a cage like structure in which gas like methane gets stored this would be called as what it would be called as gas hydrates see as far as the characteristic of water is concerned water at low temperature and high pressure what is this area this area is of low temperature because absence of solar radiation high pressure because of the volume of water so water at low temperature and high pressure would be forming a cage like structure clear nimn tapman mein aur adhik dabav mein jal jo hai wo kya karegi ek pinjade numa sanrachna banayegi and this is in which gases like methane would be getting stored जिसमें गैस मीथेन जाकर संचित हो जाएगी एंड दिस वुड बी कॉल्ड एज व्हाट दिस वुड बी कॉल्ड एज गैस हाइड्रेट्स व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू डू इज दैट वी वुड बी एक्सट्रैक्टिंग दीज हाइड्रेट्स गैस हाइड्रेट्स डिसोसिएटिंग देम ब्रेकिंग देम क्लियर ब्रेकिंग देम एंड व्हेन वी आर ब्रेकिंग देम यस दे आर मिथेन बेड्स नाउ एंड व्हेन दे आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर ब्रेकिंग देम देन वी कैन एक्सट्रैक्ट दी नेचुरल गैस मिथेन फ्रॉम इट so if we are responsible for extracting these hydrates we are responsible also for breaking them and we would be getting natural gas methane from them so this is called as what this is called as gas hydrates is that clear this is referred to as gas hydrates india's gas hydrate reserves include the krishna godavari basin so all these are india's gas hydrate reserves the krishna godavari basin godavari basin the kerala konkan basin kerala konkan basin mahanadi basin mahanadi basin so all these are india's gas hydrates reserve but do remember that yes these are methane beds only and also do remember that coal bed gas is also methane gas hydrate is also methane shale gas is also methane clear all these are natural gases shale gas is also methane so these are called as gas hydrates but formation of gas hydrates won't be only near the oceanic floor formation of gas hydrates also would be taking place where also would be taking place in the permafrost region so we say that water has a unique characteristic at low temperature and high pressure that's one 
condition for formation of gas hydrates, but also at extremely low temperature because permafrost region is a region of extremely low temperature. Water would be responsible for forming a cage like structure in which gases like methane gets stored and this would be called as what? This would be referred to as gas hydrates. So, gas hydrates won't be present in only and only near the oceanic floor. Gas hydrate also would be present near the permafrost region. Clear? So, gas hydrate would be also present near the permafrost region. Permafrost region is what? Per permafrost is permafrost is a region which is covered with ice. Now, this is a layman definition. Clear? Unpad admi se bulega, covered with ice. Permafrost, there are two specific definitions of permafrost. One is that this is a region where even the summer solar radiation is unable to thaw, unable to melt the frozen soil. Then it is called as permafrost. And if suppose the temperature of an area does not enhance beyond the freezing point for two consecutive years, then that area would be called as permafrost. Clear? So, formation of gas hydrates would be taking place where? It would be taking place near the oceanic floor and also near the permafrost region. Clear? Also near the permafrost region. And as far as permafrost region is concerned, the formation of permafrost region would be taking place at greater altitude that is mountain glaciers or it would be taking place at greater latitude means the polar areas. So, in that area only the permafrost region would be witnessed. So, we can see that in permafrost region also gas hydrates are present. Clear? In permafrost region also gas hydrates are present. Yes, yes, all of you, hello, fine. In also permafrost region gas hydrates are present. Yashi, Maitri, all these. <coughs> permafrost region is present, but we are not talking about extracting gas hydrates from the permafrost region because permafrost region is responsible for regulating the temperature of earth, clear, regulating the temperature of earth. Yes, uh, definitely, so permafrost region also includes the Arctic region or the Antarctic region. Now, this the, the third thing that we have studied about the oceanic floor, but near the oceanic floor, that's another type of question also which can be framed from this area near the oceanic floor. We can see that small sized rock like structures are littered near the oceanic floor. We can see small sized rock like structures are littered. Chote chote rock jese, shallow jese, sun rachna hai par fele hue hai. Small sized rock like structures are littered, and these small rock like structures which are littered, now these would be called as what? These are called as polymetallic nodules. Recently, we saw that that lithium was discovered in Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, this uh, time to celebrate. But if these uh, permafrost, it would call global warming, we will come to that. Prabhakar will come to that global warming that it would be further responsible for enhancing global warming. That is included in today's topic also, <laughs> clear. But these are called as what? These are called as polymetallic nodules. And polymetallic nodules consist of, we know that lithium is used for batteries of smartphones and laptops. But lithium ion batteries are there. But as far as uh, the polymetallic nodules are concerned, polymetallic nodules are also used for batteries of laptops and smartphones. And it consists of what? It consists of iron. It consists of nickel. It consists of cobalt. It consists of manganese. So, these are four things which are present in polymetallic nodules. Clear polymetallic nodules, four things which are present in polymetallic nodules. And we can see the government of India has launched PMNs, yes. Okay, angry Sondarya, you are positive. Thank you. Iron, nickel, cobalt, there are four things. Dekho. Iron, nickel, cobalt, manganese. Fine. Iron, Nickel, Cobalt, Magnus. Mr. S. B. Bunasapte, word Vanalo, M. I. C. N. Mikan. 
Sam stands for manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. Fine. So that's the four things which are present in polymetallic nodules. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, extraction of polymetallic nodules, extraction of polymetallic nodules would be done, and uh, it would be done under a mission of India, and that mission of India is called as what it is referred to as deep ocean mission. Abhi se samjho. The Ministry of Earth Sciences of India. I have been saying that the Ministry of Earth Sciences of India, Sciences of India, in the year 2018, in the year 2018, with an allocation of 8,000 crore rupees, was responsible for launching, was responsible for launching deep ocean mission, deep ocean mission. Clear. And this deep ocean mission is having two or three main objectives. One first objective is to develop, to develop a submersible vehicle. Develop a submersible vehicle. Now this submersible vehicle would be carrying three persons inside. So one, two, three persons inside. And this would be going to a depth of six thousand meter inside the ocean for extraction of what polymetallic nodules. Clear to develop a submersible vehicle which can be used for extraction of polymetallic nodules. And second is what? Second is to develop to develop a desalination plant. Desalination plant. Plant. With the help of what? With the help of tidal energy, to develop a desalination plant with the help of tidal energy. Clear? And tidal energy why? Because when you are responsible for some cities of India, particularly the coastal cities of India like Chennai, they suffer from what? They suffer from economic water scarcity. Economic water scarcity means that they have abundance of water on one side, that is the ocean, but either water happens to be saline or contaminated in nature. So, in order to get fresh water, there would be a very high incurrence of cost. So, this kind of water scarcity would be called as what? This kind of water scarcity would be called as economic water scarcity. And we can see that desalination and why? Because the cost of desalination plant is very high. So we would be using tidal energy to reduce the cost. Clear? Because desalination is an energy-intensive process. You evaporate water a number of times to make it pure. So why not use tidal energy for that purpose and reduce the cost? Clear? Okay. After these nodules would be found along with the hydrates. Yes, yes, yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Present in your class. Thank you so much, Savik. Fine. Now see, these <coughs> this would be responsible. The, the second component of uh, the deep ocean mission first is to develop a submersible vehicle. Second is to establish a desalination plant with the help of tidal energy as such. Tidal energy as such clear. Now this for this purpose, India has been allocated. The Ministry of Earth Sciences has been allocated an area of what? An area of seventy-five thousand square meter kilometer, not square meter, square kilometer in the in in the Central Indian Ocean Basin, Central Indian Ocean Basin. That has been offered, and this has been allocated by the International Seabed Authority. It has been allocated by the International Seabed Authority, which is based on what? Which is based on UNCLOS, that is UN Convention on Law of Seas. Clear. Thank you so much about my SN. Okay, you loved it. Thank you so much. Very good. Now this is called as what deep ocean mission. So what we have covered up up till now, we have started with biosphere. 
and we are simply making biosphere an excuse to discuss a number of contemporary issues. We have discussed in that what invasive plants also, we have discussed in that kappa ficus also, we have discussed in that chemosynthesis also, we have discussed in that gas hydrates also, we have discussed in that deep ocean mission also and extraction of polymetallic nodules. Clear extraction of polymetallic nodules. Let us return back again. Let us again return back to uh, biosphere and discuss animals and microorganisms. Clear? So, when we talk about we have not discussed animals, only we discuss plant and those agencies which are responsible for performing photosynthesis. But when you talk about animals and microorganisms, animals and microorganisms microorganisms can be of different types, can be of different types. For example, they can be saprophytes and when we are talking about saprophytes, they can be also just let us me enumerate all these parasites, they can be scavengers, scavengers. Now, when we talk about saprophytes, saprophytes are responsible for what? Saprophytes are responsible for decomposition of, decomposition of dead plants and animals, decomposition of dead plants and animals. For example, bacteria, for example, fungus, they are saprophytes, they are responsible for what? They are responsible for. Yes, vegans are very good. <laughs> now, we will talk about vegans also today because we have to deal with uh, that uh, a thematic area pr uh, proposed by the IP, uh, UNEP report, emission gap <laughs> report and that says that plant based diet should be preferred instead of milk and meat consumption. We will discuss that. Yes, I am in Delhi center only today. This class is from Delhi center, Himansu. Now, <coughs> saprophytes is responsible for decomposition of dead plants and animals, but fungus are saprophytes, bacteria are saprophytes and these saprophytes, when they decompose, the end product of such decomposition is what? The end product of such decomposition is in a molecular stage. Why we are saying end product of such decomposition is in a molecular stage? See, you would have studied in your school days nitrogen cycle. In nitrogen cycle, what you have to study is that nitrogen cycle is a process by which nitrogenous compounds are removed from the soil and they are reverted back to the soil. Clear? The process of removal of nitrogenous compounds from the soil is uh, there are many agencies which are responsible for that. For example, plants are responsible. For example, denitrifying bacteria are responsible. Leaching is the process which takes place and also responsible for removal of nitrogenous compounds from the soil. But the return back of nitrogenous compounds to the soil in the form of nitrates takes place by a process of nitrification and nitrogen fixation clear nitrification and nitrogen fixation. And when we are talking about nitrification and nitrogen fixation, we can see that uh, before nitrification, the decomposition of dead plants and animals should take place. And the decomposition of dead plants and animals, when decomposition of dead plants and animals takes place, uh, the end product of such decomposition is what? End product of such decomposition is ammonia. Ammonia is in a molecular stage. Then it combines with hydrogen ion from the soil, hydrogen ion from the soil to form what is called as ammonium. And then the action of nitride and nitrate bacteria takes place clear, then the action of nitrate and nitrate bacteria takes place. But the end product of decomposition is what? In a molecular stage, clear. So, we say that when saprophytes are responsible for decomposition, the end product of such decomposition is in a molecular stage, molecular stage, clear. When you are talking about parasites, parasites can be all those animals. 
Yes, Himanshu. I'll, I'll try to come to Delhi just before the PT and give you some also. No pressure on in, for environment. Okay. Fine. <coughs> just follow this session. You are, uh, there would be some ease for you. Fine. I request you all to follow this session so that there would be some ease for you. You should not come under pressure for environment before the preliminary examination. Fine. Nasim. Now, when we are talking about decomposition of dead plants and animals, the end product of such decomposition is always in a molecular stage. Parasites are what? Parasites are responsible for what? Deriving their nutrition from the host. Host is what? From where? They are responsible for deriving their nutrition. So, they derive their nutrition from the host and are responsible also for causing disease to them. For example, mosquito. They are deriving uh, their nutrition from our blood. So, we are the host for them and they are uh, responsible for causing disease to us also. Clear? They are responsible for, yes, yes. Uh, they are responsible for giving. Uh, causing disease to us also. But when we are talking about scavengers, scavengers are responsible for cleaning the environment. For example, vultures are scavengers. For example, eagles are scavengers. So, they are responsible for cleaning the environment. And uh, we can see that uh, not only they are responsible for cleaning up the environment, but they are also responsible for decomposition. But the problem is what? That the end product of such decomposition is never in a molecular stage. Never in a molecular stage. It's in a bulk form. Meaning is what? Malu, vultures, agar cattles ko khate hain, to jo ejected matter vultures se likalta hai, that's not in a molecular stage. It means that, that further needs to be decomposed by saprophyte in order to attain the molecular stage and return it back to the soil as such clear, return it back to the soil. But now here we will go again to current affairs and try to uh, uh, solve questions on and try to gather information. First, we will try to gather information. So, we will try to gather information on what? We will try to gather information on vultures. And why we are saying vultures? Because vultures is a type of scavengers. And the population of vultures in India has declined. Population of vultures in India has declined. The most common type of vulture in India is called as what? It is called as gyps vulture. Although there are many types of vulture in India. But the most common type of vulture in India is called as gyps vulture. And uh, we can see the earlier the population of gyps vulture in India was 40 million. But now it has reduced to what? It has reduced to 19,000. Clear 19,000. And we can see the breakup also among the 19,000. 6,000 is of what? 6,000 is of white backed, white backed gyps vulture. 6,000 is of white-backed gyps vulture. 12,000 is of long-billed, jinki choch lambi ho, long-billed gyps vulture. And we can see 1,000 is of, 1,000 is of slender-billed, slender-billed. Gyps vulture. 1000 is of slender built gyps vulture. So, if they ask you question, which gyps vulture is clear? Which gyps vulture is rarest among the three? So, rarest among the three kinds of gyps vulture is slender built gyps vulture. Clear slender built gyps vulture. In India, we can see there are Griffon Himalayan vultures also. Griffon Himalayan vultures also, which is present in the Himalayas, Tibet, Jammu and Kashmir, all these areas. And they feed on what? They feed on yaks. They are responsible for feeding on yaks. But the concern is what? The concern in India is diminishing number of vultures. 
کلیئر اینڈ دیز آر تھری ٹائپس آف ولچرس دیز آر تھری ٹائپس آف ولچرس جپس ولچرس دیٹ یو ہیو ٹو ریمبر فرسٹ آف آل ناؤ سی دا سیکنڈ کنسرن از واٹ دیٹ وائی دا ڈیمنیشنگ نمبرس کین بی سین دا ڈیمنیشنگ نمبر آف ولچرس کین بی سین آن اکاؤنٹ آف مینی کنسیڈریشن بٹ دا مین کنسیڈریشن از واٹ دا مین کنسیڈریشن از ڈائکلوفینک so you can see the main reason behind their diminishing number is what the main reason behind their diminishing number is a drug which is called as diclofenac see diclofenac is what it is an anti inflammatory drug anti inflammatory drug inflammatory drug which is used in cattle it is used in humans also when we feel the pain we are responsible for taking uh when we feel the pain we are responsible when we are responsible for feeling the uh, pain we take diclofenac also so it's permissible for use in humans also now but diclofenac is used in cattle also anti inflammatory drug which is used in cattle so when vultures are responsible for feeding the cattle i'm saying that when vultures are responsible for feeding the cattle what happens the diclofenac passes into the food chain now see if any substance which is may be toxic which may be chemical it enters the food chain that process is called as bioaccumulation but if any chemical or substance reaches the higher strata of food chain trophic levels of food chain then it's called as biomagnification so the entering of uh, diclofenac in the body of vultures is nothing but an example of what nothing but an example of critically endangered i um, vultures are now <laughs> we can see that nothing but an example of what the biomagnification as such so we can see that bioaccumulation is what bioaccumulation is a process through which the chemicals enter the food chain but biomagnification is a process through which it reaches the upper strata of the food chain so diclofenac reaching the upper strata of food chain is nothing but a process of biomagnification and diclofenac is responsible for what it's responsible for renal failure we can say or kidney failure among vultures clear kidney failure among vultures because of which the vultures death can be seen but the same drug diclofenac in the same manner is also responsible for diminishing number of eagles in india also clear the same drug in the same manner is also responsible for diminishing number of eagles in india also as far as diclofenac is concerned diclofenac has been banned for use in animals in india use in animals the question is that when it is responsible for renal failure or kidney failure in vulture why it is not responsible for such damage in humans see the immune system of different organism happens to be different in nature our immune system are well developed against diclofenac which is not in the case of vultures which is not in the case of vultures but this is not only the reason the reason for the diminishing number of vulture this is the main reason diclofenac but the reason behind the diminishing number of vultures also include what also includes electrocution clear the reason behind their diminishing number also includes electrocution the reason behind their diminishing number also includes loss of habitat for example there was a cyclone called nisarga and this nisarga cyclone was responsible for destroying the habitat of what habitat of vultures in maharashtra so loss of habitat is another reason electrocution is another reason and we can see sometimes use of pesticides use of pesticides in caracases in caracases of animals can be another reason for diminishing number of vultures for example i say
transmission line is also one reason that's why I have said electrocution I am not confused in vulture or eagles I am definitely sure about vulture but I have said that the eagles also have diminished in the same manner because of the same reason clear fine okay Now, Griffon does not come under the count of 19,000. Fine. Now, let us proceed. Let us cover up this because the time is less. So, use of pesticide in caracases of animals, in caracases of cattle also was responsible for one of the reasons behind the diminishing number of vultures. Now, why we are saying use of pesticides in caracases? See, vultures are always in a stiff competition with feral dogs, wild dogs to feed up the dead cattle. So, they happen to be in a stiff competition with feral dogs to feed up the dead cattle, in wild dogs to feed up the dead cattle. So, it means that if the number of vultures decline, the number of feral dogs would be enhancing. Clear? If the number of vultures decline, the number of feral dogs would be enhancing. The number of wild dogs would be enhancing. So, these giddh hote hain, wo jangli kutno ke saath pratispardha mein rehte hain mavishiyon ko khane ke liye. To agar maan lo giddhon ki sankhya ghatti hai, to jangli kutno ki sankhya mein ho jayegi vrithi. Clear? And in Kamrup district, what happened was, Kamrup district is in Assam. In Kamrup district, the stray dogs were growing in large numbers. In order to control the stray dogs, what the municipal corporation of Kamrup did was, it sprinkled pesticides in the carcasses of cattle so that the stray dogs would be consuming it and they would be dying. Okay, I am looking like uh, Assam CM. Very good. All these are... See, now your concentration should be on environment only, not that I look like Assam CM, clear, not that I, my voice is like Sasi Tharoor, clear, please, <laughs> your concentration should be on environment right now, Maitri, Rishu, Punji, Ahastha, all Sanskriti, Sushobhit, please concentrate on environment. Let us revise all these things today. Fine. <coughs> Use of pesticide in caracases of animals. So, they used pesticide in the animals, the cattle, so that if suppose the uh, wild dogs or the feral dogs or the stray dogs, they consume it, they would be dying. But they were not consumed by them. They were consumed by whom? They were consumed by vultures and vultures died. Clear? So, when we are talking about the reasons behind their diminishing number, the reasons behind their diminishing number include what? It includes mainly diclofenac, then also electrocution, that is transmission lines in your words, then <laughs> loss of habitat, nisarga cyclone we have discussed, use of pesticides in gardens, but the main reason is diclofenac. Clear? Diclofenac has been banned for use in animals in India. But we can see that substitute for them was used also. For example, in order, in substituting diclofenac, we used another drug for cattle, which was called as eclenophenac. Eclenophenac. Second was called as nemesulide. Third was called as ketoprofen. And all these drugs, ketoprofen, all these alternate drugs also prove to be detrimental for, all these drugs also prove to be detrimental for vultures. Clear? They prove to be detrimental for vultures. Because eclenophenic and nemesulite gets converted into diclofenic within hours of its administration. Jitne der mein dehenge, kuch din ke baad wo kya hote hai? Vultures ke body mein diclofenic mein convert ho jate hai. Pehle do, eclenophenic and nemesulite. And ketoprofen is responsible for what? It is responsible for enhancing 
what in enhancing the toxic level in vultures so that's why we are saying that that these proved also detrimental for vultures clear detrimental for vultures but there are three trends noticed if we are saying that the number of vultures decline the number of wild dogs would enhance and if you are saying that the number of leopards enhance the number of vultures decline and if you are saying the number of tigers enhance then we can see the number of vultures would be enhancing now what is these three trends that we are talking about now vultures are in a stiff competition with wild dogs to feed up the dead cattle vultures are always in a stiff competition with wild dogs to fine vultures are always in a stiff competition with feral dogs to feed up the dead cattle so if suppose the number of vultures decline the number of wild dogs would be enhancing leopards you can see that leopards are never responsible for eating big animals they would be always consuming small prey as such and they do not consume it at one go what they do is that they are responsible for not consuming it at one go so they eat a part of it and they are responsible for hiding the remaining part of the animal on the trees which is beyond the visibility of vultures so if suppose the number of leopards enhance the number of vultures in that area would be reducing number of leopards enhance the number of vultures in that area would be reducing and tigers are always responsible for consuming big animals big animals so you can see that if and it consume big animals they eat a part of it leave it in the open so this would be enhancing the food reservoir of vultures we can see that number of tigers if they enhance the number of vultures too would be enhancing number of vultures too would be enhancing so that's the trend that you have to notice clear now there was an initiative taken an initiative was taken by the bombay natural history society natural history society so the bombay natural history society bnhs is the oldest ngo functioning in india for the conservation of nature oldest ngo functioning in india for the conservation of nature and it has its logo as what it has its logo as hornbill just remember it has its logo as hornbill yes meloxi can can be used rather than eclenofenac fine <clears throat> so we can see that uh, this is the oldest ngo functioning in india for the conservation of nature it has hornbill at its as its logo so bombay natural history society of india along with the moefcc that is ministry of environment uh, environment forest and climate change were responsible for launching an initiative and that initiative was to establish vulture conservation and breeding centers vcbcs vulture conservation and breeding centers these vulture conservation and breeding centers are called as what they are referred to as jatayu and these these centers have been established where it has been established at nine places in india so it has been established at nine places in india and these nine places in india include what it includes pinjar pinjar in haryana it also includes raja bhatkawa raja bhatkawa raja bhatkawa is present where it is present in west bengal in alidwar district of west bengal it also includes rani rani is from assam it also includes kerwa kerwa is in bhopal bhopal and then also we can see that it also includes what it also includes junagadh junagadh it is in gujarat 
इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स नॉट ओनली जूनागढ़ बट इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स हैदराबाद हैदराबाद इज इन तेलंगाना इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स नंदन कानन नंदन कानन एंड दैट्स इन उड़ीसा इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स मोटा मोटा इज नियर रांची एंड इट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स बैरीबासी बैरीबासी इज वेर इट इज प्रजेंट इन गोरखपुर फॉर ए डिविजन सो ऑल दीज आर नाइन वर्चर कंजर्वेशन एंड ब्रीडिंग सेंटर्स क्लियर now this this is not ramayan wala jata you please 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 <laughs> fine so so these are nine vulture conservation and breeding centers which have been established in india clear fine and we can see recently a trend was noticed that in the Val valmiki uh, tiger reserve and valmiki tiger reserve is in bihar uh, the number of vultures have enhanced clear number of vultures have enhanced now there are some also terminology which we have to know for example there is a term which is called as ecosystem ecosystem now we know that biosphere has what biosphere has three components that is biotic abiotic and the energy component but as far as ecosystem is concerned ecosystem is a fundamental unit of biosphere and it would be also having three similar components biotic abiotic and energy component clear so ecosystem is a fundamental unit of biosphere which would be having three similar components biotic abiotic and energy component clear and uh, ecosystem can be large for example terrestrial ecosystem is large ecosystem or coastal ecosystem is a large ecosystem but ecosystem can be constituted by also uh, can be on a small scale also and can be constituted by bacterial cells itself clear for example suppose if a question is asked which cell in human body is in largest number so the cells which are present in largest number is called as what it is called as bacterial cells and they are functional unit definitely they are functional unit of nature so ecosystem but if uh, if suppose we are talking about ecosystem in ecosystem we say that a biotic comp component is present biotic component is present and energy component is present now if we take only biotic component and we are responsible for making a subdivision of biotic component now this subdivision of biotic component is referred to as community if we are taking ecosystem is what ecosystem is the fundamental unit of biosphere it is the fundamental unit of biosphere and uh, if we are taking only and there there are three components of ecosystem also biotic abiotic and energy component so if we are taking only biotic component and making a subdivision of that component that would be referred to as community within an ecosystem within an ecosystem we can see there would be different levels of community suppose if we are taking a forest ecosystem forest ecosystem there would be a community of animals which would be present on the surface for example lion tigers leopards would be forming a community of their own there would be a community which would be present in the uh, at the canopy of trees clear now there would be a community which would be present in the water bodies and a specific community of a certain area would be referred to as population also but when we are talking about community the members of the community would be performing certain functions and these functions which the member of community perform is referred to as what it is referred to as niche these uh, functions which the members of the community perform 
so the mem members of committee are performing certain functions so these functions which are for their own maintenance so the functions which the members of the com community perform for their own maintenance would be called as nish any functions can be many thing it can be suppose the function is food accumulation you would have seen that birds connecting small small grains from one for feeding their infants so this kind of function is food accumulation so this would be called as what this would be called as trophic nish so if the function is food accumulation this would be called as trophic nish if suppose the function is procreation procreation means generation of new ones then it would be called as what it would be referred to as reproductive nish reproductive nish and if suppose the function is maintenance of dwelling place then we can see that if the function is maintenance of dwelling place then it is called as what it is referred to as habitat nish so we can see that nish can be of three types it can be what it can be trophic nish if the function is food accumulation it can be habitat nish if the function is maintenance of dwelling place and it can be also reproductive nish if the function is what if the function is procreation that is reproduction as such so reproductive nish so it would be the function is procreation so there are three types of nish but there is a principle also which is called as compulsory exclusion principle and compulsory exclusion principle means that no two members of the community when we are talking about compulsory exclusion principle it means that no two members of the community no two members of the community would be sharing the same nish no two members of the community would be sharing the same nish have the same nish okay fine fine okay now let's uh, move ahead now there are some principles of ecology on the basis of which upsc is responsible for framing questions one principle of ecology on the basis of which upsc frames question is called as what is called as homeostatic principle that you have to know homeostatic principle and associated with this is what associated with this is resilience characteristic homeostatic principle and associated with this is resilience characteristic now what does it mean what does it mean see ecopene is what ecopene is nothing but the ecological sphere of a habitat clear and ecotype stands for what when we are talking about ecofin is nothing but ecological sphere for example when you are talking about biosphere or ecological sphere so a definite ecology would be having a sphere of its own which is called as ecofin clear yes ecotone will discuss just now see just 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 now just now i am coming to ecotone if suppose if you are saying that this is suppose one ecosystem if suppose we are saying on one side is one ecosystem this is ecosystem 1 a and this is ecosystem b now when we are talking about ecotone please put the right word only then we can answer now when we are talking about ecotone ecotone is called as what it is called as the demarcation zone between two ecosystem clear ecotone would be called as now when you are talking about ecotone ecotone means that it is the demarcation zone between
Now, when you are talking about ecotone, we are saying that ecotone is a demarcation zone between two ecosystems. So, first thing about ecotone is what? That it is a demarcation zone between two ecosystems. Clear? For example, suppose mangrove area is an ecotone because it's a demarcation zone between the terrestrial ecosystem and the marine ecosystem. So, that would be called as ecotone. Second thing is what? It's not only a demarcation zone, but we can see also that this area, that is ecotone, would be also called as transitional zone. And why transitional zone? Because the characteristic of one ecosystem in this area would be enhancing, but that of the other would be reducing. So, that's called as transitional zone. Clear? Ecotone would be referred to as also transitional zone. For example, suppose in mangrove vegetation area, you can see the soil is saline in nature. Soil is saline in nature. So, you can see the characteristic of one ecosystem is reducing and that of the other would be enhancing. Now, the third characteristic is what? As far as ecotone is concerned. Now, this would be a zone of competition. And why zone of competition? Because the members of two ecosystems would be struggling hard for their survival, would be fighting with each other for their survival. So, it would be a zone of competition. And also we can see that as far as ecotone is concerned, this area registers high ecological productivity. This area registers high ecological productivity. High ecological productivity ka matlab hai kya? Ki the rate at which photosynthesis is performed. Jis dar se prakash sensation hota hai. So, that would be called as high ecological productivity. So, this area registers this area registers a very high ecological productivity and uh, not only this, this area is also famous for biodiversity. But then, if we are talking about one ecosystem, this is the one ecosystem and suppose this is the another ecosystem. So, the margin of two ecosystem is overlapping in ecotone. So, when the margin of two ecosystem overlaps in ecotone, what happens the localized condition in this area is favorable for development of a large number of species. Now, if it is favorable for development of large number of species, then this phenomena is called as what? This phenomena is called as edge effect. So, we are saying that that the margin of two ecosystem overlap in this area and as such we can see the localized condition in this area is favorable for development of a large number of species. So, this phenomena is called as what? This phenomena is called as edge effect. Clear? So, high population would be there definitely. So, this phenomena would be called as edge effect as such. But to relate edge effect which edge species would be wrong. We cannot say that that the species which are present in these areas would be called as edge species. Clear? So, to relate edge effect with edge species would be wrong because some of the books what they have written uh, erroneously that the species which are present in this area are edge species wrong. When we are talking about edge species, edge species stand for what it stands for evolutionary distinct distinct and globally endangered and globally endangered. So, when we are saying that evolutionary distinct and globally endangered are edge species, it means that they are the only surviving member of their genus on the planet Earth. Clear? So, they happen to be the only surviving member of their genus on the planet Earth. For example, elephant is an edge species because the members of its family are no more. Mammoth is no more. So, it would be called as edge species. But to say that edge species is present in the areas where edge effect is reflected is 100% false. Clear? So, edge species is a different type of species. But in environment, we have to know some other types of species also before beginning with homeostatic principle, ecological productivity, etc. Fine. So, <coughs> We can see that there are some types of species also. For example, there is a type of species we know that this, this is an edge species, that's evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. So, it is the only surviving member of their genus on the planet Earth. But there is another type of species which is called as keystone species. Now, keystone species means 
that these species are responsible for maintaining the structure of the ecosystem. Clear? Eutrophication. <laughs> Let me come to eutrophication. Eutrophication is a process through which deposition of sediment takes place in the water bodies, which is not only responsible for aging of water bodies, but also responsible for enhancing its nutrient content. We will come to eutrophication. Do not worry about it. Chansekar. Fine. So, we can see that uh, another type of species is called as keystone species. Now, keystone species are those species which are responsible for maintaining the structure of ecosystem. Structure of ecosystem. They maintain the structure of ecosystem. And uh, as far as keystone species is concerned, not only the structure of the ecosystem is maintained, but also we can see that uh, Keystone species can be both animals and plants. And when we are saying structure of the ecosystem is maintained, it means that if you remove these species from this area, the structure of the ecosystem would be getting disrupted. So, if you species from the ecosystem, the structure of the ecosystem will be disrupted. So, that is called as keystone species. There are many examples. Like in Madagascar, there are lemurs. Lemurs are just like monkeys which are present in large numbers in Madagascar. They are just like monkeys. They are present in large numbers in Madagascar. But the seeds of some vegetation in Madagascar has to pass through the digestive tract of lemur in order to germinate. The seeds of some vegetation in Madagascar has to pass through the digestive tract of lemur in order to germinate. In order to germinate. Now, it means that if you remove lemurs from Madagascar, what will happen? If you are responsible for removing lemurs from Madagascar, the See, please, uh, eutrophication will come when we will discuss dead water zones. Let us come to dead water zone. Fine. If you mingle all these things, then sometimes, now here if you say eutrophication, another will talk about air pollution now. So, let us go or, or in a sequence as such. I will come to flagship and umbrella species. Just wait. Now, when we are talking about uh, keystone species, it can be both animals and plants. Now, animals means what? That we have cited the example of lemurs in Madagascar. That some of the seeds of vegetation which is present in Madagascar has to pass through the digestive tract of lemur in order to germinate has to pass through the digestive tract of lemur in order to germinate. It means that if you are responsible for removing from here, if you are responsible for removing lemurs from Madagascar, the entire ecosystem would be disrupted. Or suppose we take the example of a plant. In the temperate area, there is a plant which is called as the fig plant. Fig plant. And this fig plant has stony seeds stony, not fruits, seeds, but stony fruits, hard shell fruits. So, during the favorable condition, they won't be responsible for, the monkeys won't be responsible for feeding on these fruits because they are better option for them to eat. But we can see during unfavorable conditions, the monkeys would be feeding on these fruits for their survival. So, ensuring the survival of monkeys in adverse condition is a fig plant. Maintaining the structure of the ecosystem is a fig plant. Henceforth, it would be called as what? It would be called as keystone species. So, keystone species are responsible for maintaining the structure of ecosystem. There can be both animals and plants. And also we can see that if you remove these species from the ecosystem, the ecosystem is going to get disrupted. The ecosystem is going to get disrupted. So, they are called as keystone species. Now, there is a term which is called as umbrella species. If suppose I am responsible for taking conservation initiative for one species. Now, in protecting or in taking the conservation initiative for one species, I am responsible for protecting the habitat of that species. Clear. So, the, if the habitat of one species is protected, 
what happens automatically is the habitat of other species also would be protected getting protected in turn so the main species here would be referred to as umbrella species i repeat once more that if suppose i am taking a conservation initiative for protecting one species as such but in protecting the habitat of one species the habitat of other species are also getting protected in turn then the main species here would be referred to as what it would be referred to as umbrella species because under the ambit of this umbrella species the other species also got protected in turn for example tiger can be an umbrella species lion can be an umbrella species but if we are using the symbol of one species for conservation initiative while the purpose is to symbol of one species for conservation initiative while the purpose is the objective is to protect other species as well then it would be called as what it would be called as flagship species which species whose symbol is being used clear so if suppose we are responsible for using the symbol of one species for conservation initiative but our intention is to protect other species as well then the species whose symbol is used would be called as what it would be referred to as flagship species clear flagship species when there are some species yes ram ram <coughs> now there are some species also which is called as what which is referred to as indicator species indicator species ka matlab kya hai that they would be helping us to either to identify an ecosystem इससे इकोसिस्टम की पहचान होगी एंड ऑल्सो इट वुड बी हेल्पिंग अस टू नो अबाउट द कंडीशन क्लियर सो नॉट ओनली आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ एन इकोसिस्टम वुड बी डन बट ऑल्सो वी कैन नो अबाउट द कंडीशन ऑफ द इकोसिस्टम ऑल्सो क्लियर इकोसिस्टम ऑल्सो थ्रू इंडिकेटर स्पीशीज फॉर एग्जाम्पल सपोज इन ओल्ड हैबिटाट स्पॉटेड आवल कैन बी सीन सो वेन वी सी स्पॉटेड आवल वी कम टू द कंक्लूजन दैट दिस इज ओल्ड हैबिटाट but the problem in this is what that oh, uh, sometimes spotted owl can be present in some other habitat also frequently they are present in old habitat but sometimes they can be present in other habitat also so we can see that as far as use of indicator species is concerned we cannot conclude only on the basis of indicator species there should be some other benchmarks there should be some other parameters also used for this purpose the conclusion cannot be drawn on the basis of indicator species only clear the conclusion cannot be drawn on the basis of indicator species only is that clear fine so let's know about that also now next type of species and also it uh, indicator species are known used for the purpose of knowing about the condition of the ecosystem for example suppose if you uh, see gangetic dolphins gangetic dolphins always would be moving in the mid of the river why because the contaminated water in the mid of the river is less it never moves in the banks so the movement of gangetic dolphins would be reflective of what it would be reflective of the condition of the ecosystem as such so there are few species that you have to know one is edge species which is evolutionary distinct and globally endangered which are the only surviving members of their genus on the planet earth second is what second is what second is umbrella species keystone species keystone species are those species which are responsible for uh, maintaining the structure of the ecosystem they can be both plants and animals so they are called as keystone species they would be referred to as keystone species they can be both plants and animals and third is called as what third is called as uh, the umbrella species if suppose we are responsible for taking conservation initiative for one species and in protecting the habitat of other species the habitat of other species also protected gets uh, in turn so in protecting the habitat of that species the habitat of other species also gets protected in turn the main species here would be called as umbrella and then we have discussed what is called as what now see गंगा डॉल्फिन आई हैव मैंशन वाई गंगा डॉल्फिन आई हैव मैंशन कि गंगा के डॉल्फिन को देखेंगे जिसे हिंद स्थानीय भाषा में कहते हैं सॉस नाउ गैंजेटिक डॉल्फिन ऑलवेज मूव इन द मिड ऑफ द रिवर 
so they are reflecting what they are reflecting the condition of water in the middle of the river because gangetic dolphins would be always and always seen in those areas where water is less contaminated clear where water is less contaminated yes patna and there is a conservation initiative also taken for protection of gangetic dolphins as such and i have discussed that that indicator species can be used for knowing about the condition of the ecosystem and also identifying an ecosystem and then i have discussed edge species but in upsc you can see that sometimes देखो यूपीएससी में क्या है कि कभी कभी वो क्वेश्चंस आपको पूछते हैं इकोलॉजिकल प्रिंसिपल्स पर भी तीन इकोलॉजिकल प्रिंसिपल्स आपको जानने हैं दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट वन इज कॉल्ड एज व्हाट वन इज कॉल्ड एज होम्योस्टैटिक प्रिंसिपल दूसरे को कहते हैं क्या इकोलॉजिकल प्रोडक्टिविटी और तीसरे को कहते हैं क्या द थर्ड इज कॉल्ड एज प्लांट सक्सेशन सो वी हैव टू कवर अप दीज थ्री प्रिंसिपल्स ऑल्सो एज सुन एज पॉसिबल एंड जस्ट आई बी बायलिंग ठीक है मैं हिंदी में भी बोलूँगा ठीक है कहीं कहीं पर हिंदी में भी बोलते हूँ और आप उसे समझिए जस्ट रिमेंबर दोज थिंग्स सो आई ट्राई टू बी बाय लैंग ऑल्सो फाइन आई स्टार्ट and just one second just one second that we start the principles of ecology one second
now let's continue maitri if you wish to quit you can quit why you are attending the class when you have attended my original classes clear so please don't waste your time and if you want to quit you can quit and please don't disturb the class here because all these type of unnecessary comments that you are responsible for making here who kya likhaye the wahi aaj bhi padha rahe hain what i should do or not do why you are unnecessary attending the class please don't waste your time and energy find the um, iucn status of dolphins is what it is endangered now there are three principles of ecology that you have to study because obviously environment won't be changing some current events would be coming in between but it's not that the entire syllabus would change for you and a new in on based on a new syllabus new questions would be coming in preliminary examination please and do not unnecessary join this is not meant for you also if you have attended the class so why to chat like this that what i should do or not do clear please quit because if you are attended the class and you are trying to disturb the entire aura over here please go back fine please do not do that now see now there are three principles of ecology which you have to cover up and you have to know briefly because we have to cover up entire syllabus today so there are three principles of ecology that you have to cover up and i'll give you a break uh, at 4:00 uh, uh, no 3:30 exactly after one hour i'll give you a break don't worry about that fine please please maitri no if you have come, done this i told you initially also that this is a nothing but a revision class revision class does not mean that what you have studied in earlier in your class would be exempted expunged clear if you don't wish to no point in uh, creating a disturbance over here now see uh, there are three principles of ecology that you have to know and uh, one principle is called as what one principle is called as homeostatic principle and uh, along with it is a characteristic which is called as resilience characteristic clear along with it is a characteristic which is called as resilience characteristic now homeostatic principle means what homeostatic just understand because this is a mains question so in preliminary examination only the concept can be asked homeostatic principle or resilience characteristic is what each and every ecosystem would be having a self regulatory mechanism of its own clear each and every ecosystem would be having a self regulatory mechanism of its own and uh, and there would be an inbuilt self regulatory mechanism in the ecosystem by virtue of which it is able to maintain its internal condition despite external disturbances clear so if suppose any external changes takes place the internal conditions within the ecosystem would be maintained and uh, this characteristic of the ecosystem this principle under which this is maintained i'm saying that each and every ecosystem would be having a self regulatory mechanism of its own and the internal conditions within the ecosystem would be maintained despite external changes now this characteristic of the ecosystem through which it adjusts 
it is responsible for adapting to maintain the internal condition would be called as what it would be called as nothing but the resilience characteristic and the principle under which it is determined would be called as homeostatic principle. So the principle is called as homeostatic principle and the characteristic would be called as resilience characteristic. But we can see that the resilience characteristic of an ecosystem can be exhibited to a certain level only. Clear resilience characteristic of an ecosystem can be exhibited to a certain level only. And that level is called as what? It is called as resilience limit. It's referred to as resilience limit. So, if suppose the nature of external change, if suppose the nature of external change or the magnitude of external change, we are saying that if the nature of external change or the magnitude of external change is such that the resilience limit of the ecosystem is surpassed, then it is at that juncture that environmental degradation takes place. Look, Hindi mein bhi mein hu. Sabhi ecosystem jo hai would be having a self-regulatory mechanism. Unme ye uh, characteristic hai ki jo antrik vyavasthah hai usko barkara rakhenge. Suppose if external changes also take place, they maintain the internal condition. Clear? Agar external change bhi ho raha hai, tab bhi wo internal condition ko maintain karenge. So, this characteristic of the ecosystem is called as what? It is called as homeostatic principle. The principle is called as homeostatic principle and the characteristic of ecosystem for this purpose would be called as resilience characteristic. Jaise maan lo, when winter comes, jaise e winter aata hai, on the skin of animals, hairs would be growing in large numbers. So, on the skin of animals, hairs would be growing in large numbers. Now, this, this hair is acting as what? It is acting as an insulator. And why insulator? Because the external condition is what? The external condi condition is that uh, the temperature has reduced. Temperature has reduced. So, this would be acting as an insulator for the external condition that temperature has reduced. So, this characteristic of ecosystem would be called as resilience characteristic. This adjustment that the ecosystem does is called as resilience characteristic. But if suppose the magnitude of external change, magnitude of external change or the nature of external change is such that the resilience limit of the ecosystem is surpassed magnitude ko dekho, external change ko ya fir uske nature ko dekho, such that the resilience limit of the ecosystem is surpassed it is at that juncture that environmental degradation takes place it is at that juncture that environmental degradation would be taking place Yes, hibernation and estivation are also homeostatic principle or just some short term adjustments and that's for the purpose of maintaining the internal conditions within the ecosystem. Fine, that's for the purpose of maintaining internal conditions within the ecosystem. So, that's called as homeostatic principle and it is called as resilience characteristic. Now, what we can see is that uh, as far as the second principle of ecology is concerned, the second principle of ecology is called as what? It is called as plant succession. When you talk about succession, succession is the process through which, when you are talking about succession, succession is the process through which, uh, which includes all ecological changes through which species are getting established in an area. Succession is a process which includes all ecological changes by virtue of which species get established in an area. But when we are talking about uh, establishment of animal species, so that would be called as animal succession, establishment of vegetation, so that would be called as plant succession. So when we define plant succession, we can say that plant succession is a process which includes all ecological changes by virtue of which vegetation would be getting established in an area. So if suppose plant succession takes place. There are two types of plant succession that you have to know. First type of plant succession is called as what? It is called as primary plant succession. Primary plant succession. And second would be called as secondary plant succession. 
secondary plant succession. So, first is primary plant succession and second would be called as secondary plant succession. Now, when we are talking about primary plant succession, it means what? It means that, that if suppose there is no vegetation in that area from the very beginning, the establishment of vegetation in that area would be called as what? It would be called as primary plant succession. And the type of vegetation which is established in that area would be called as what? It would be called as primary vegetation. So, the type of vegetation would be called as primary vegetation and the type of succession would be called as what? It would be called as primary plant succession. Primary. If there was no vegetation in that area, then the establishment of vegetation would be called as primary plant succession. But if suppose the vegetation was present but has been lost temporarily, so there is temporary loss of vegetation in that area which can be due to wildfires, which can be due to droughts. So, establishment of vegetation in that area, establishment of vegetation in that area would be called as what? It would be called as secondary plant succession, clear? So, we are talking about that if there is temporary loss of vegetation, then, then establishment of vegetation takes place in that area, it would be called as secondary plant succession. But establishment of vegetation does not take place instantaneously, clear? Establishment of vegetation in an area would not take place instantaneously, it would be taking place in a sequential manner. So, the sequential manner through which, sequential manner through which vegetation is get, getting established in an area is referred to as what it is referred to as serre. The sequence in which vegetation is getting established in an area is referred to as what? It is referred to as serre. And we can see that there are three stages in serre. The first stage is called as what? It is called as stage of pioneer plants. So, see here they have asked you question in UPSC. So, the first stage is called as stage of pioneer plants. Now, here we can see that there are large boulders present and in these large boulders, in the fissures of rocks, small vegetation would be creeping. Ye jo hai na, large rocks, boulders, is small vegetation over karayenge. Now, all these vegetation, these kind of small vegetation would be responsible for what? It would be responsible for broadening the fissures it would be responsible for broadening the fissures. It would be not only responsible for broadening the fissure, it would be also initiating soil formation. It is responsible for broadening the fissures. It is also responsible for initiating soil formation. Yes, those who do not control their body temperature by their own undergo hibernation and uh, estivation to sustain their, to sustain from unfavorable condition. That's true. Now, now we can see soil formation. Now, there are two examples of it and the examples include lichens and mosses. So, there are two examples of it. One is called as lichens and second is called as mosses. When you talk about lichens, lichens is a combination of what? It is a combination of fungus with photosynthetic partner. Fungus with photosynthetic partner. And this photosynthetic partner is what? This photosynthetic partner is generally an algae generally an algae, but sometimes can be bacteria also because some bacteria also perform photosynthesis. So, we can see that lichens is a combination of fungus and they have asked you this question in examination that lichens is a combination of what? So, lichens is a combination of fungus with photosynthetic partner which is generally Lichens is a combination of uh, mosses and lichens, anyone? Lichens 
Lichens is a combination of fungus with photosynthetic partner, which is generally an algae, but sometimes is bacteria also. And they have asked you in UPSC that lichens is a combination of what? And they have put forward both the options. So, in this kind of question, when both the options are put forward, you would be selecting that which is frequently present. But when you talk about mosses, mosses are flowerless plant, flowerless plant which belong to the class of what which belong to the class of bryophyta so they are flowerless plant belong to the class of bryophyta clear so that's your first stage of cere which is called as stage of pioneer plants now the second stage is called as what the second stage is called as stage of opportunist plant opportunist plant and why we are saying stage of opportunist plant? Because in this phase, we can see, in this phase, after the formation of soil, small vegetation in this area would be thriving. For example, grasses, for example, herbs. Now, these vegetation would be continuing to live for one or two years. Ek ya do sal tak ye survive karenge. Grasses ya herbs. But during this period, they would be responsible for generating enormous amount of seeds. Like in this period, me kya karenge wo? Bhoot saare beech banayenge. So if they are responsible for generating enormous amount of seeds, they are ensuring, they are ensuring the survival of their future generation. They are ensuring the survival of their future generation. So we can see, that they are acting for themselves only and that's why they would be called as what selfish in nature so they are opportunist plant so they are acting for themselves only and they are called as what they are called as opportunist plant fine so we can see that grasses herbs or shrubs would be called as opportunist plant then the third we can see the third is called as what? The third is called as stage of climax plant. Stage of climax plants or stage of climax plants means what? That in this period, in this period, we can see tall trees would be growing. In this period, tall trees grow. And these tall trees, the leaves of these trees, are responsible for what? The leaves of these trees are responsible for obstructing solar radiation. So it obstructs the solar radiation. Because of which lower vegetation in this area would be very scarce. So its ki jo patte hain, wo kya karenge? Obstruct karenge solar radiation ko. To usse lower vegetation jo hai, wo bahut kam rahega. And that is what why it is called as climax plant. The numerous examples of climax plant. For example, pine. For example, devdar is an example of climax plant. For example, oak is an example of climax plant. So all these are examples of pine, devdar, oak. All these are example of spruce. All these are nothing but examples of pioneer plants. Clear? Pioneer plants. So there are three stages in Sere. First is called as stage of uh, pioneer plants, second is called as stage of opportunist plant and third is called as stage of climax plant. Stage of pioneer plants examples include what? It, examples include lichens and mosses. Lichens are a combination of fungus with photosynthetic partner which is generally an algae but sometimes can be bacteria and mosses means flowerless plant belonging to the class of bryophyta. Then we can see second is what? Second we can see that the second stage is stage of opportunist plant which includes what? Which includes uh, grasses, herbs and these uh, plants would be uh, staying for. No, Moses is not. Moses is flowerless plant. Without flower they are. Belong to the class of bryophyta. Deco. Lichens, you know, lichens, two things are combination. One is fungus, and the is photosynthetic partner. Which means generally, what is photosynthetic partner? Algae hoga. Sometimes bacteria. Mosses are what? Mosses are flowerless plant. Without flower, they are. They belong to the class of bryophyta. They are not fungus, uh, fungus as such. 
yes similar characteristic of trees are found in the tropical evergreen forest also clear now to teen cheez aapko yaad rakhne hain first is what first is pioneer plants jiske do example maine bataye lichens or mosses second is opportunist plant which two examples i have taught and this grasses and what herbs and third is what third is climax plants pine spruce devdar all these are examples clear all these are examples now see the third principle of ecology that you have to know is called as what it is called as ecological productivity ecological productivity now see in ecological productivity what happens in the option algae and bacteria then you have to select algae because more frequently algae is present clear nasi the third is called as ecological productivity ecological productivity ka matlab kya hai see when photosynthesis is performed natural organic matter is generated or suppose chemosynthesis is also performed natural organic matter is generated so natural organic matter is in the form of polysaccharides or cellulose but we say that and what is performed is mainly photosynthesis chemosynthesis is very rarely performed so we are saying that that uh, the rate at which the speed at which natural organic matter is generated would be called as what it would be called as ecological productivity so we are saying that the speed at which the speed at which natural organic matter natural organic matter is generated would be called as what it would be called as ecological productivity ecological productivity rate at which natural organic matter is generated would be called as ecological productivity clear and uh, as far as ecological productivity is concerned man lo if you are talking about ecological productivity to natural organic matter kis rate se generate ho raha hai there are two factors which are responsible one is the amount of solar radiation so first factor is what first factor is the amount of solar radiation amount of solar radiation and second factor is what the ability of plants through which it converts solar energy into chemical energy clear which can be used obviously in photosynthesis so first is what first is the amount of solar radiation so suppose the amount of solar radiation is more productivity is more and second is what second is the ability of plants through which it is converting solar energy into what solar energy into chemical energy so that it can be utilized for photosynthesis yes these are found in every succession as such and uh, we can see the best example just one th- one minute here one thing i missed the best example of sere is what the best example of sere is himalayas why you can see in greater himalayas snow capped mountains are there but where the snow capped mountains are not there you would you would be finding lichens and mosses in large numbers mosses in large numbers clear then we can see that in the middle himalayas uh, the grasses herbs are present in the middle and the outer himalayas pine forest is also present so all the three stages of sere would be reflected here we are saying that all the three stages of sere would be reflected here clear in himalayas and why because himalayas are uh, the newest mountain range of the world and st- it is still in the process of its formation so himalayas happen to be the newest mountain range of the world and it is still in the process of its formation okay so in maharashtra we do not find big plants which obstruct sunlight or glow 
और टू ग्रो अनदर प्लांट सर इन महाराष्ट्र वी डू वी डू नॉट फाउंड बिग प्लांट विच ऑब्स्ट्रक्ट सन लाइट टू ग्रो ऑन अनदर दैट नॉट दिस महाराष्ट्र स्पेसिफिकेश बट इन हिमालय इट कैन बी सीन दैट वेर द पाइन फॉरेस्ट इज प्रजेंट द लोअर वेजिटेशन वुड बी वेरी स्कर्स द लोअर वेजिटेशन वुड बी वेरी स्कर्स so this is called as ecological productivity and we can see that uh, ecological productivity would be depending on these two main factors one is the amount of solar radiation and second is the ability of plant through which it converts solar energy into chemical energy but if at all they ask you the ecological productivity of wetlands you know very well that wetlands are what wetlands are temporary or permanent accumulation of water temporary or permanent accumulation of water accumulation of water and why they are, they behave also as a separate ecosystem so they are called as wetland they are behaving as a separate ecosystem and they are temporary or permanent accumulation of water but as far as wetland is concerned there are four types of wetlands although very famous is the ramsar list 1971 which includes wetlands of international importance you can see a number of wetlands have been added into that list 75 wetlands from india are present in the ramsar list of international importance but any wetland would be called as wetlands of international importance provided it is has the ability to attract at least 20000 water birds then only it can be called as wetlands of international importance if suppose it has the ability to attract at least 20000 water birds clear see as far as uh, the remembering of species is concerned please remember the uh, new wetlands which has been added from india into the ramsar list at least 2025 wetlands have been added which are recent so go through the, uh, the names of those wetlands and in which state they are present sometimes they can ask you a question on match that these are the new wetlands added in the ramsar list from india clear so that can be asked and don't have to mug up each and every for example suppose the biggest wetland in india is what the biggest wetland in india is the sundarbans the first wetland which was added into the ramsar list was the ghana the smallest wetland from india is what renuka so and add to that some of the new wetlands which have been added so go through that list of 2025 odd wetlands and you can answer the questions otherwise they are not going to ask you all the wetlands clear but this is a 1971 ramsar list we discussed that it includes west of wetlands of international importance but if we have to classify wetlands into types we can classify wetlands into four types one is called as what one is called as mangrove swamps mangrove swamps now mangrove swamps are wetland which are present in the coastal areas it is followed by what it is followed by uh and this has high ecological productivity maximum ecological productivity would be in mangrove swamps the second highest ecological productivity would be where it would be present in the marshes marshes are wetlands which are present in near the rivers or the lakes then we can see that the productivity would be for what it would be for fens fens are wetlands which have been formed and this these kind of wetlands have been formed how these kind of wetlands have been formed due to surface water accumulation surface water accumulation water accumulation or underground water accumulation or underground water accumulation so and then the productivity would be least for a type of wetland which is called as peat bogs so peat bogs is a wetland which is formed due to melting of snow melting of snow or is formed due to rain water harvesting 
और रेन वाटर एक्यूमुलेशन नॉट हार्वेस्टिंग रेन वाटर एक्यूमुलेशन एंड दीज आर प्योरेस्ट फॉर्म ऑफ वाटर सो दे वुड बी लैकिंग न्यूट्रिएंट्स सो वी कैन सी मैंग्रोव स्वैम्प व्हिच इज प्रेजेंट इन द कोस्टल एरिया इज अ टाइप ऑफ वेटलैंड व्हिच वुड बी हैविंग हाई इकोलॉजिकल प्रोडक्टिविटी फॉलोड बाय व्हाट फॉलोड बाय मार्शेस व्हिच इज प्रेजेंट नियर द रिवर्स और द लेक्स फॉलोड बाय फेंस व्हिच इज which is uh, formed due to rain, the surface water or underground water accumulation formed by peat bogs which is formed due to melting of snow or rain water accumulation so that's uh, the sequence how the ecological productivity is arranged sometimes we can see that uh, they ask you objective type questions on ecological productivity remember one more thing and then we'll solve these questions that as far as ecological productivity is concerned ecological productivity on earth is maximum for tropical rainforest it's maximum for tropical rainforest i am coming to that i am coming to that which has just 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 let me explain and then all these queries that you have written would be clear fine now when we are talking about ecological productivity we can see ecological productivity is maximum on earth for tropical rainforest that's one fact that you have to remember but ecological productivity of oceans is low and why low because the solar radiation is obstructed by the water body first and there is lack of nutrients in saline water if suppose nutrients is more the concentration of phytoplankton would be more if nutrient is more the concentration of phytoplankton would be more but lack of nutrients can be seen in saline water the coastal area of oceans only constitute 0.2% of the entire ocean but that is responsible for 30% of the ecological productivity of ocean how clear how we can see suppose this is the ocean in the oceans in general we have said that oceans have low ecological productivity but that part of the ocean which is near the coast and where corals are present suppose the main agency for deposition of sediment in ocean is the rivers so rivers carry agricultural waste and this would be deposited here because of the deposition of sediment the nutrient content of this area would be enhancing and since the nutrient content of this area enhances the concentration of phytoplankton and algae in this area would be more when compared to mids of ocean the concentration of algae and phytoplankton in this area would be more when compared to mids of ocean and that's why we can see the coastal area would be registering very high ecological productivity but in the coastal area near the continental shelf corals are also present this would be also responsible for enhancing productivity so we can see oceans in general would be having low ecological productivity but that part of the ocean just one second but that part of the ocean which is near the coast this that part of the ocean which is near the coast where corals are present where algal bed is present where phytoplankton and algae are present in large numbers this area would be registering a very high ecological productivity and this area would be called as what it would be called as tropical rainforest of oceans tropical rainforest of oceans and why so because in this area the concentration of phytoplankton and algae is more in this area the corals are present corals are present clear so in this area we can see this area would be called as tropical rainforest of the ocean and corals why we are saying because corals are near symbiotic relationship with an algae which is called as zooks anthellae so this area would be called as tropical rainforest of oceans
clear tropical rainforest of oceans clear now see the questions that they have asked you if you talk about individual eco uh, ecological productivity some figures that you can remember for example mangrove areas mangrove areas would be having ecological productivity of 2500 gram per centimeter square per year that's how it is represented and suppose we are talking about the algal bed in the coastal areas algal bed in the coastal areas would be having ecological productivity of 2000 gram per centimeter square per year coral bed would be having ecological productivity of 2000 gram per centimeter square per year and also we can see the estuaries that is the place where the rivers are responsible for meeting the oceans in the estuaries we can see ecological productivity would be 1800 1800 gram per centimeter per square so all these are the areas of high ecological productivity now in the examination they have asked you a question and they have asked you to arrange these in order of decreasing ecological productivity and they have given you the options lakes grasslands lakes grasslands oceans and mangrove swamps lakes grassland oceans and mangrove swamps now in this question it would be maximum for which tell me no peat bog has nothing to do with peat coal you know sir this area supports more than fauna and flora than tropical rainforest yes that's why it's called as tropical now tell me lakes grassland oceans mangrove swamps which area would be having high ecological productivity now yes maximum it would be for mangrove then followed by followed by grassland or lakes it would be followed by what it would be followed by grasslands so no 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 just wait see mangrove area would be having high ecological productivity followed by grassland look at the surface area which is responsible for performing photosynthesis then by lakes and then by then by oceans because not mention which part of the ocean so then by oceans so this would be the order clear this would be the order fine this is how the ecological productivity can be arranged now uh, we are deviating a bit from here and we are trying to discuss a question and these days cbg happens to be much in news that is uh, compressed biogas so expect a question on compressed biogas anytime in your examination clear cbg is much in the news and uh, expect a question on compressed biogas anytime in your examination so if suppose a question is asked like this that consider the following statements consider the following statements and obviously select the code clear consider the following statements and obviously select the code correct code we can see that uh, cng and first statement is what compressed natural gas and compressed biogas is same is chemically same is chemically same and second statement is what both have same calorific value both have same calorific value and third statement is h2s is a part of part of biogas and the course include what 1 2 3 2 3 only 
only 2. So, what can be the correct answer for this? What can be the correct answer? Consider the following statements CNG and CVG are chemically same. Both have what? Both have same calorific value. H2S is a part of biogas. So, is the statement correct? All the three. B. So, answer is B. Second is one only. Only one. One only, only two. The correct answer is all the three. The correct answer is all the three. Now, see how. Let us see how. And for discussing this, we have to discuss what? We have to discuss purification of water. That how purification of water takes place. Clear? Purification of water takes place. Now, you can see that uh, purification of water takes place how? When you are talking about purification of water, in purification of water, there is a treatment which is called as what? It is called as primary treatment. The first phase is called as what? It is called as primary treatment. And the second phase of yeast would be called as secondary treatment. But in primary treatment, this water, which is the grey water, is passed through what? It is passed through a bar screen. Bar screen means, grey water means what? There are different kinds of water also. Grey water is a type of water which is contaminated. So, the water which is coming out of your house drains is called as grey water or the water which is coming out after the industrial use would be called as grey water. So, grey water is what? It is contaminated water. Fine. Blue water is water which is present in your rivers or the lakes. Then we can see there is also water which is called as fossil water. Fossil water is a water which is present in your undisturbed space. Clear? It is present in your undisturbed space. And uh, also we can see another water is called as what? It is called as green water. Green water is that amount of rainfall, which is that fraction of rainfall, which is trapped in the soil and used for cultivation of crops. But when we are talking about grey water, so primary treatment starts when grey water is passed through what? It is passed through a bar screen. So, suppose this is a bar screen. And here what happens that the larger debris, debris would be getting accumulated here. Now, these debris would be separated and separated how? This would be separated mechanically. Then we can see that it would be again, this water would be passed through another chamber. And this chamber through which the water is passed is called as what? It is called as grit chamber. Grit ka matlab hai kichad. So, this is called as what? It is called as grit chamber. And when the water is passed through it, we are responsible for reducing the velocity of flow. So, the velocity of flow, velocity of flow is reduced. Because of which what will happen? The grit, that is kichad, would be settling down. Now, this grit would be removed mechanically. Clear? So, this is called as grit chamber. Then again, we can see the water is passed through another chamber. And this chamber is called as what? It is called as primary clarifier. So, this is called as what? It is called as primary clarifier. Clarifier. And here we can see that in 
the earlier grid chamber we were responsible for what we were responsible for making water motionless but uh, velocity of flow was reduced but in this case we are responsible for making water in this case we are responsible for making water motionless so when we make water motionless the oil which is present in the water would be suspended so this oil would be suspended and the larger organic matter so we can see large not small large organic matter could get settled now these two things oil plus large organic matter organic matter would be separated and they would be combined to form what is called as raw sludge in dono ko kya karte hain nikal lete hain aur mix karke rakhte hain isko kehte hain raw sludge and this raw sludge would be treated separately why grassland before lakes because grassland has the grasses have a large surface area although deposition of sediment would also take place in the lakes what would be the order if coral bed not belt bed it should be would have been mentioned instead of oceans then the coral bed if suppose it would have been mentioned then it would be uh, coming before the grasslands after mangroves it will come yes definitely uh, sir thirdly algae be algal bed has more ecological productivity or coral bed see both have similar ecological productivity 2000 is gram per centimeter square is per year is the ecological productivity of algal bed 2000 gram per centimeter square per year is the ecological productivity of algal bed clear which among the two both would be having first time i am attending your class how happily you are teaching it's great to learn from you oh, thank you thank you anjali ja primary producer means those we are are responsible for performing photosynthesis is more in grassland yes definitely clear now see this is how uh, the raw sludge would be gathered and here the primary treatment ends but second is called as what second phase is called as what it's called as secondary treatment secondary treatment and in this phase what happens in this phase what is happening that uh, the water which is coming from the primary treatment suppose this is the water which is coming from the primary treatment would be passed through what would be passed through another system which is called as what it is called as trickling filter system another system which is called as what it is called as trickling filter system and in which there are small size rocks with spaces for aeration air and also in these the microorganisms are present microorganisms are present so this is called as what this is called as trickling filter system filter system and the water would be passed through it and what will happen in these gaps the aerobic decomposition of organic waste would take place we will say that aerobic decomposition in presence of air because it's meant for aeration also decomposition of organic waste would take place because the larger organic matter you have separated earlier through primary clarifier what is left is smaller organic matter so aerobic decomposition of organic waste would take place and then we can see that the water which is coming out from here is now pure water and this would be treated with chlorine so you get the pure water so that is how water purification takes place but what about the raw sludge so we are responsible for treating raw sludge in a separate chamber and this chamber is called as what it is called as dry digester dry digester so here we are responsible for immersing the raw sludge raw sludge is immersed and anaerobic decomposition takes place anaerobic decomposition means without the use of air 
anaerobic decomposition takes place. So, when anaerobic decomposition of raw sludge would be taking place because you have to treat it separately, then we can see that two products would be obtained. One is what? One is biogas and that is why we have connected it to purification of water and second is what? Second is biosolids. First is biogas and second is what? Second is biosolids. So, we can see two products would be obtained. One is called as biogas and second is called as biosolid. Clear? Second is called as biosolid. And uh, if we talk about biogas, we can see biogas consists of what? Biogas consists of methane and methane is 55 to 60 percent CO2 that is from 40 to 45 percent and also H2S. It is present in biogas in traces. So, what do we do? We CO2 ko hata denge. and this would be hat, isse hata a process se, jisse kehte hai, what? this is called as amine scrubbing process. We will discuss amine scrubbing process also. So, this would be removed by amine scrubbing process. H2S also would be removed with the help of activated carbon. Activated carbon. Clear? And the remaining is what? Methane. So, if suppose we are responsible for generating biogas, we can remove CO2 from it, we can remove H2S from it. Clear? H2S from it. And the second part is what? Second part is called as biosolid. Biosolid ko hum log, we are using it as a maneuver in the field. We are using it as a maneuver in the field. Now, India has launched a program. And this program is called as what? It is called as SATART. SATART means Sustainable Alternatives Towards Affordable Transportation. So, India has launched a program which is called as SATART, which is called, the meaning full form is Sustainable Alternatives Towards Affordable Transportation. And what is the meaning of SATART? See, the problem in India is that we are incurring a very high cost we incur a very high cost in importing CNG from other countries. We import CNG from UAE, Saudi Arabia, etc. So, we incur a very high cost. But on the other hand, we can see, on the other hand, we have abundance of organic waste in India. We have a large number of cattle, cow dung, municipal waste also includes organic waste. So, why not convert this organic waste into biogas? For So, under the SATART program that is Sustainable Alternative Towards Affordable Transportation, we are going to establish 5000 plants in India, in different parts of India and these 5000 plants would be based on dry digester technique to develop biogas. Dry digester te technique to develop biogas. Clear? And the biogas which is developed by dry digester technology, uh, Gobardhan, clear, would be from it we would be responsible for what? We would be responsible for removing CO2 by amine scrubbing process and also H2S would be removed by activated carbon. What is remaining is methane which would be compressed and this would be called as what? And this would be stored in cylinder which would be called as compressed biogas. So, CNG is what? CNG is nothing but methane. CBG is what? CBG is nothing but methane. So, CNG and CBG are exactly the same. And since the chemically they are exactly the same, they have same calorific value. So, they are responsible for having the same calorific value. So, CNG, CBG are exactly the same. They have same calorific value. Clear? And as far as CNG and CBG is concerned, they are having same calorific value. We can see that 
same calorific value and H2S is a part of biogas also that you know very well. But this program is called as SATART and the other advantage of it would be what? That not only you are obtaining methane as compressed biogas and using it in transport vehicles, you are also getting biosolids which is used as manure in the field. So 20 to 30 percent of agricultural production would enhance with the help of biosolids. And biosolid also consists of silica. This would be disallowing the intake of contaminants from soil and preventing the plants also from diseases as such. Clear? Preventing the plant from diseases as such. Now that is about CNG, CBG. So CNG, CBG are same. They have same calorific value and also you can see H2S is present in biogas. Let's take a break of 20 minutes here. Have your food and then we continue.
discussing the principles of ecology and also discussed what is CBG because CBG is more in the news today. So, we discussed CBG also, but let us start now and uh, first three thing, uh, first thing that we would be responsible for discussing now is called as what it is called as biosphere reserves. So, we know that uh, everybody knows that that 18 biosphere reserves are there in India and these biosphere reserves are 18 biosphere reserve out of which 12 biosphere reserves have included into UNESCO's world network of biosphere reserves clear out of which 12 biosphere reserves have been included and as far as the other protected areas are concerned we can see other protected areas include what it includes national parks it also includes wildlife sanctuaries so more than once uh, more than 100 national parks are present in there in India and also more than 560 wildlife sanctuaries are present in India. But as far as biosphere reserves are concerned, 18 biosphere reserves are present in India. But when we talk about biosphere reserves, we can see that biosphere reserves are, are areas of what? They are areas of terrestrial or coastal ecosystem. So, they happen to be what? They happen to be areas of terrestrial or coastal ecosystem which have been recognized as reserves under the Man and Biosphere Program of UNESCO. So, we are saying that biosphere reserves are areas of terrestrial and coastal ecosystem and they have been recognized as reserve under the Man and Biosphere Program of UNESCO. Clear? Man, man and Biosphere Program of UNESCO. So, you can see 1971 is the year when not only the Ramsar Convention was signed, but 1971 is the year when also uh, the Man and Biosphere Program was launched. So, they have been recognized under Man and Biosphere Program of UNESCO. Now, they are not only meant for protection of biological diversity, but they are also meant for protection of what? They are also meant for protection of cultural diversity. Now, biodiversity, you understand its fauna and flora constitutes the biodiversity. But when we talk about cultural diversity, we can see that cultural diversity means what? What is the implication of cultural diversity? Now, humans have survived in nature for centuries. They have lived in nature for centuries and uh, their customs, traditions, beliefs, uh, also religious beliefs and also profession are all linked with nature. So, we are saying that their customs, traditions, beliefs, profession, etc. are all linked with nature, linked with nature. Now, this constitutes the cultural diversity. And it's difficult to separate the cultural landscape from the natural landscape as such. And it's not only includes this, but also includes what? It includes traditional land use pattern or traditional land use practices, which happen to be commensurate with nature, which are commensurate with, are suitable with nature. So that's called as what? That's called as cultural diversity. So when we are talking about cultural diversity, Cultural diversity means that humans have survived in nature for centuries. Their customs, their traditions, their religious belief, their occupation, etc. are all connected with nature. They are all connected with nature. And uh, the traditional land use patterns which happen to be suitable with nature. For example, suppose we are using cow dung as manure in the field. That's not going to hamper the environment in any way. Or suppose we are responsible for not only using cow dung as manure in the field, but also we are responsible for using rotational crops in the field. That's in fact responsible for enhancing the fertility of the soil. So all these would be called as what? All these traditional land use pattern would be called as cultural diversity, which would be commensurate with nature, which would be suitable with nature, clear, suitable with nature. Now, so it's not only meant for protection of biological diversity, but also cultural diversity. We can see also biosphere reserves are used for what? It is used for fostering economic growth. So you can see that it was established under Man and Biosphere Program of UNESCO. Biosphere program of UNESCO. It was started in 1971 and it is meant for protection of what? It is meant for protection of 
not only biodiversity but also cultural diversity and cultural diversity i have just explained that what is the meaning of cultural diversity but it's also used for fostering it is also used for fostering economic growth economic growth but the development should be what the development should be sustainable in nature it is also meant for fostering economic growth but the development should be sustainable in nature when we talk about comparing biosphere reserve we know that 18 biosphere reserves are present in india and we know that more than 560 wildlife sanctuaries are present in india and we know that more than 100 national parks are present in india but when we compare biosphere reserves with national park and wildlife sanctuaries we can see that the difference between the three is what first basis of difference is what first basis of difference is that biosphere reserves are declared under man and biosphere program of unesco clear biosphere reserves are declared under man and biosphere program of unesco but when you talk about national park and wildlife sanctuaries national park and wildlife sanctuaries are declared by the state government clear to sabse pehle kya hai ki wo state government declare karti hai aur ise man and biosphere program of unesco mein declare kiya jata hai the second basis is what of difference the second basis of difference is what comprehensiveness ki sabse bada comprehensive kaun hai now we can see <coughs> that most comprehensive is what biosphere reserve because within one biosphere reserve more than one national park or more than one wildlife sanctuaries can be present so that is the second difference the third difference is what when you talk about the third difference between biosphere reserve national park and wildlife sanctuary third difference is how human activities are regulated kis tarah se human activities ko regulate kiya jata hai we can see in biosphere reserves uh human activity would be reg regulated in more flexible manner but more stringently it is regulated where more strictly it is regulated in national parks sabse zyada agar strictly regulate ho raha hai kahan to it is regulated in national parks and we can see no hunting no grazing no harvesting is allowed in national park fine but in wildlife sanctuaries we are responsible for allowing hunting uh, not hunting grazing would be allowed also harvesting cultivation of crops would be allowed but no hunting is allowed there also hunting is a big term it can land you in trouble and you have seen the cases which are there due to hunting so it can land a person in trouble so that's uh, biosphere reserve so in we can see as far as regulation of activities is concerned agar maan lo regulation of activities ko dekhte ho to human activities are strictly regulated where human activities are strictly regulated in national parks sabse zyada strictly agar regulate ho rahe hain to kaha it is regulated in national parks and in national parks you are not allowing hunting grazing cultivation harvesting so for what purpose it is utilized it is utilized only for recreational activities like tourism lekin dekho tourism also won't be allowed in the core areas of national park because supreme court has banned tourism in the core areas of national park clear so it won't be allowed in the core areas of national park because supreme court has banned tourism in the core areas of national park but on the other hand we can see that as far as activities is concerned we can see that in wildlife sanctuary harvesting cultivation of crops is allowed and in biosphere reserve in different zones different activities are allowed let's see what kind of activities are allowed in these areas as such clear but the fourth basis of difference between see biosphere reserves are declared under man and biosphere program of unesco but biosphere reserves are also recognized by moefcc yes tribal people now the fourth basis of difference is what that for what purpose it is oriented when we are talking about biosphere reserves biosphere reserves are ecosystem oriented they are meant for protection of ecosystem wildlife sanctuaries are species oriented and when we talk about national park national park is oriented for protection of mainly one animal you can see that the emphasis in national park is for protection of one animal so every time we can see national park would be dedicated for one animal fine
when you are talking about national park it would be dedicated for one animal so it can be a tiger reserve it can be a lion reserve it can be an elephant reserve so it would be dedicated for protection of one animal each and every national park clear it does not mean that other animals would be allowed to die but the emphasis would be on the protection of main one main animal some species i'll discuss definitely in between i'll discuss some species but i'm discussing those species through questions clear so after this we start the test one by one and uh, then again discuss ozone layer then again test on ozone layer then again discuss global warming then again test on global warming then again discuss pollution then test on pollution as such in this we we would be moving forward clear fine so let's cover up that and then we'll have a exclusive test on convention on biodiversity because it has been recently concluded then we will have a exclusive test on cop 27 because it also last year was concluded then we will have a exclusive test on plastic pollution and then we'll have a exclusive test on protected areas so we'll start the protected area test right now after completing this clear fine i think that would be sufficient for you and uh, that was your testing session fine so let's continue and let's do as much as we can as such now we can see that uh, biosphere reserves are ecosystem oriented wildlife sanctuaries are species oriented and when we talk about national park national park is oriented for the protection of mainly one animal the emphasis is laid on protection of one animal that's why each and every national park would be dedicated to one animal but in 1983 we can see un ep and uh, unesco was responsible for conducting a conference at minsk where four areas of four zones of biosphere reserve were demarcated now when we talk about the first zone now first zone is called as what this zone is referred to as what it is referred to as the core zone here and in core zone we can see that human activities would be what human activities would be minimal naganya minimal sabse kam human activities but what what kind of human activities now see in uh, the conferences cop i'll discuss in the class clear those is so wide to cover but at least i'll discuss all those things which would be sufficient for you to meet the challenge of preliminary examination now human activities would be minimal fine and i tried i'll try whatever i can discuss uh, i'll wake up till midnight so we'll from good night to good morning we'll be together <laughs> fine so let's uh, cover up as much as we can now human activities would be minimal in this area and we can see that the human activities would be, which would be allowed in this area would be what it would be research it would be training it would be education so you can see education research and training would be allowed clear education research and training would be allowed in this area and in this area human activities which are allowed would be managed by what it would be managed by three acts so the activities human activities which are allowed would be managed by three acts teen acts se manage kiya jayega forest act 1927 then also wildlife protection act wildlife protection act 1972 and then forest conservation act forest conservation act 1980 so we can see three activities responsible for managing human activities in the core areas of national park that is forest act 1927 let's see let's see what to what extent we can cover up will i'll try my best to cover up maximum clear 
So we can see that in this area, Forest Act 1927, Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and Forest Conservation Act 1980. So there are three acts which is responsible for uh, governing or regulating human activities in this area. Now that's core zone. Core zones are also present in national park. Core zones are also present in wildlife centuries. But in national parks, tourism has been banned in the core zone of national parks. Clear? So, it has been banned in the core zone of national parks. But when you talk about buffer zone, this area, buffer zone. Now, we can see in buffer zone, if we have said that in uh, core zone, human intervention would be minimal. Then in buffer zone, we can see that human intervention on a low scale would be allowed. Clear? So, we are saying that in buffer zone, human intervention on a low scale would be allowed. And uh, activities like what? Activities like uh, hunting, fishing, grazing, timber collection would be allowed. Now see, hunting is a big term. How can you allow hunting? Now, hunting is not allowed for me and you. Hunting is allowed only for tribals, for forest dwellers, and that is to gather their foodstuffs. So, for them, hunting would be allowed, not for me and you. Because me and you, if you, uh, we hunt, it would be landing you in trouble. Clear? So, hunting won't be allowed for me and you. Then also we can see that grazing would be not allowed without restrictions. Overgrazing is always responsible for desertification. Timber collection, we say that timber collection is also allowed. Timber collection does not mean deforestation. And fishing is allowed. So, we can see that activities which are allowed in uh, buffer zone include hunting, timber collection, fishing, hunting, timber collection, fishing. So, these activities are allowed. But then remember that these activities, as far as these activities are concerned, they would be highly regulated in nature clear. So, hunting would be allowed in buffer zone only for the tribals or only for the forest dwellers and the purpose is to gather their foodstuffs. Clear? And where IFO's offices are posted? IFO's offices are posted in buffer zone in these zones. See, list that tiger can hunt, there, when you talk about IUCN list, we can see IUCN list includes what? It includes some species are called as vulnerable. Beyond that, if the vulnerability enhances, they would be called as endangered. An endangered species would be of two kinds, critically endangered also, endangered also. But critically endangered species would become sometimes extinct in the wild and then sometimes completely extinct. So, there are different categories. But there is a category of IUCN which is called as species of least concern. They are not vulnerable. So, the hunting would be taking place of those species which are species of least concern. Clear? Hunting would be taking place of those species which are species of least concern. So, that kind of hunting would be taking place, fine, of least concern. So, now, we can see also that uh, the activities in buffer zone would be managed by another act and that act is called as what? Environment Protection Act of, Environment Protection Act of 1986. So, activities in buffer zone would be managed by <coughs> Environment Protection Act of 1986 clear. Now, the third area is called as what? It is called as restoration zone. Now, why it is called as restoration zone? Because in this area, what has happened? That due to anthropogenic activity, say restoration zone kehte kyun hai? Why it is called as restoration zone? Hindi mein usse kehte hai punasthapan setra. Clear. But isse kyun kehenge? Why? Because in this area, human activities were responsible for degradation on a large scale. So, this area needs to be restored to its original form. Clear. 
this area needs to be restored to its original form and that's why it is called as restoration zone or it's also called as reclamation zone ise kahenge restoration zone bhi aur ise kahenge reclamation zone bhi reclamation zone and in this area what would be done uh, we can see that reforestation would be taking place now upsc preparation sorry sir please continue doubts we can take later on yes we can take doubts later on and i have attended more or less all the doubts one or two may be missed otherwise all have been attended let's continue at a speed so that we can cover up all these things now in this area reforestation would be conducted on a large scale now we are saying reforestation would be conducted on a large scale we haven't said that अफॉरेस्टेशन भी कंडक्टेड ऑन लार्ज स्केल बिकॉज दिस एरिया हैड वॉट दिस एरिया अर्लियर हैड वेजिटेशन दिस एरिया अर्लियर हैड फॉरेस्ट सो इट कैनॉट बी सेट टू बी अफॉरेस्टेशन बट ओनली रिफॉरेस्टेशन इट कैन बी सेट क्लियर नाउ the last zone is called as what the last zone is called as stable cultural zone which reflects what it reflects the cultural diversity of biosphere reserve it reflects what the cultural diversity of biosphere reserve and you know that what is cultural diversity we have discussed that what comes under cultural diversity see eco sensitive zone we are just discussing just wait for a minute uh in some material no human activities no minimal human activities are allowed for example education research and training and in buffer zone you can see that uh, activities like uh, timber collection grazing etc would be allowed but all these would be highly restricted in nature all these would be highly regulated in nature yes i'll put some light on the scs vertex just now I, after uh, after coming to eco sensitive zone i'll put that now that's about your biosphere reserve now as far as the factuals of biosphere reserve are concerned factuals of biosphere reserve are concerned we can see that 18 biosphere reserves are present in india all together the first biosphere reserve was what the first biosphere reserve was nilgiris which was declared in 1986 but remember that if they ask you an examination where is the avalanche valley situated so avalanche valley is situated where avalanche valley is situated in the lingiris only avalanche valley is situated where it is situated in the nilgiris only because nilgiris is also prone to landslides so you can see that avalanche valley would be situated in the nilgiris and as far as <coughs> avalanche valley is situated in the nilgiris and uh, we can see the 17th biosphere reserve was sesachalam declared and sesachalam is in andhra pradesh andhra pradesh and this is very famous for what is called as red sanders red sanders means red sandalwood the export and import of which has been completely banned in india and red sandalwood is very famous of andhra pradesh the sesachalam hills so sesachalam biosphere reserve is very important then we can see 18th biosphere reserve which was the last biosphere reserve declared was called as panna panna is from madhya pradesh madhya pradesh but out of the 18 12 biosphere reserves have been included in unesco's world network of biosphere reserves clear out of 18 12 biosphere reserves have been included in where it has been included in unesco's world network of biosphere reserve 
network of biosphere reserves and when you talk about unesco's world network of biosphere reserve it is for greater cooperation among nations greater exchange of experience between the nations it's also for the exchange of personals so all these are there when you are talking about uh, the biosphere reserves but out of the 18 12 which have been included in that and that you have to remember and that is what one is nilgiris nilgiris and it stretches out in three states tamil nadu kerala and karnataka then second is what second is nokrek nokrek is where nokrek is in meghale meghale Nokrek is in Meghale. Third is what? Third is Nanda Devi. Nanda Devi is in Uttarakhand. Fourth is what? Fourth is Great Nicobar. That's an Andaman in Nicobar Island. No need to mention. Fifth is what? Fifth is Simlipal. Simlipal is in Odisha. Then sixth is where? Sixth is Sundarbans. Sundarbans is in West Bengal. Then seventh is what? Seventh is Panna. Eighth, Panchmari. A very famous hill station. And ninth, Amarkantak. Amarkantak. And all these are from Madhya Pradesh. So, maximum from Madhya Pradesh, three from Madhya Pradesh in UNESCO's World Network of Biosphere Reserve. Then we can see that August Malaya is present. Agasthi Malaya. And Agasthi Malaya stretches out in three, two states, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Then also we can see Gulf of Manar is present. It's between India and Sri Lanka. And the last one, but the reserve which was added uh, recently in 2020 was Panna. Although we have mentioned there Kanchenjunga. And Kanchenjunga is in Sikkim. As far as Kanchenjunga is concerned, it has been declared as what? It has been declared as uh, a mixed heritage site by UNESCO. Because not only it is known for cultural significance, but also for natural significance. So, it has been declared as mixed heritage site by UNESCO. Now, Kanchenjunga is the highest biosphere reserve of India because it includes the Kanchenjunga peak also at 586 meters. And it has 420 medicinal plants in it. Then also it is home to musk deer, snow leopard, red panda, all these things. Clear? So it has been declared as mixed heritage site by UNESCO because not only known for natural significance but also for cultural significance. Clear? Cultural significance. But if suppose we say that... Uh, This is a protected area. This may be a biosphere reserve or a national park or a wildlife century. Beyond the protected area to a stretch of about 5 kilometers, eco-sensitive zones should be established. We are saying that beyond the protected area to a stretch of about 5 kilometers, eco-sensitive zones should be established. And these eco-sensitive zones, when we are talking about eco-sensitive zones should be established, this would be acting as what? It would be acting as an insulator. It would be acting as what? It would be acting as a shock observer. So it would be acting as insulator. It would be acting as shock observer. And it is responsible for disallowing the activities which is taking place here, the anthropogenic activities which is taking place here. The impact of these activities won't fall on protected areas. So that's why we are needing an insulator. See, earlier...
Yes, our contact do we count in MP? Yes, in, in this case it is MP only. Yes. Fine, <coughs> fine, 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 fine. We will relate that. Okay, okay. Now, you can see that earlier this area that is eco sensitive zone was 10 kilometers. But in 2014, it was reduced to 5 kilometers. When the new government came in power, it was reduced to 5 kilometers and continues to be like that. But recently, the Supreme Court has expressed its verdict and that, that this area should be reduced to 1 kilometer. So, not 5 kilometers should, should be reduced to 1 kilometer. When we talk about activities in this area, activities in this area can be divided into three. Clear? When we are talking about activities in this area, it can be divided into three. First is what? First is permissible activity. Permissible activity means day-to-day -day activity like agriculture would be called as permissible. But to say that agriculture is only the permissible activity in this area would be wrong because agriculture would be one among the permissible activity which would be allowed in this area second would be called as what second would be called as regulated activity clear regulated activity so you can see that regulated activity includes what it includes establishment of river embankments bandho ka banana establishment of river embankments, establishment of hotels and resorts, hotels and resorts, then also widening of routes, widening of routes. So, all these kind of activity would be called as regulated activity. Then we can see that some activity would be called as prohibited activity, prohibited activity. That means that, that these activity would be prohibited in these areas completely. No, you cannot say that it is an eco-sensitive zone. <laughs> no, it is not an eco-sensitive zone. Eco-sensitive zone is a natural thing, which is uh, a demarcation zone between two ecosystems. It is not two ecosystems as such we are talking about. See, do we have legislation? Yes. See, the references to eco-sensitive zone has been made at two places. First is your National Wildlife Action Plan 2002-2016. That's the first reference. And second is Environment Protection Act of 1986. So, references can be seen at two places. And third is prohibited activity. Definitely, we are not going to establish industries in these areas. So, that's prohibited activity. And uh, not only industries. As far as uh, even sawmills are concerned, sawmills also won't be established in these areas. So, that would be coming under the ambit of what? That would be coming under the ambit of prohibited activities as such. Clear prohibited activities. So, permissible activity, then we can see. No, eco-sensitive zone starts from where? It is starts from the boundary of restoration zone. In case of biosphere reserve, in case of other, it starts from the boundary of buffer zone. Because in national parks and wildlife sanctuary, you do not have restoration zone or the stable cultural zone. So, it starts from the buffer zone then, then only. Clear? Now, <coughs> that's called, the, these are the three types of activities. But whenever we talk about Whenever we are responsible for talking about eco-sensitive zones, we can see that uh, reference is always made to what? Reference is always made to Western Ghats. Whenever the topic of eco-sensitive zone is discussed, reference is always made to Western Ghats. And when we talk about Western Ghats, we can see Western Ghat is a biodiversity hotspot of India. Western Ghat is called as paradise of biodiversity on earth. So, Himalayas and Western Ghat, both are referred to as what? Both are referred to as paradise of biodiversity on earth. Both Himalayas and Western Ghats are referred to as paradise. And uh, when we are talking about Western Ghats, we can see there are number of factors which are responsible for, a number of factors which are responsible for, uh, 
which proves damaging for the Western Ghats. For example, first factor is what? That a number of power lines are established in Western Ghats. Industrialization on a large scale, urbanization on a large scale, extension of agriculture on a large scale, all these prove to be detrimental for Western Ghats. So, there was a committee established by Government of India for Western Ghats. And this committee was called as what? This committee was called as Madhav Gargil Committee. So, there was a committee established for Western Ghat that was called as Madhav Gargil Committee. And Madhav Gargil Committee was responsible for submitting a report in 2013. Clear? Submitting a report in 2013. And this uh, report said what? This report said that. 2013. And this report said that that out of 1 lakhs, not 2013, Madhav Gargil report is 2011, sorry, sorry. So, Madhav Gargil committee submitted a report in the year 2011 and this report stated that what? That out of Madhav Gargil committee. Now, this reported suggested that, that out of 1 lakh 64,000 square kilometer of Western Ghats, that's the total area of Western Ghats. Out of 1 lakh 64,000 square kilometers of Western Ghats, we can see we can see that 1 lakh 29,000 square kilometers should be declared as what? 1 lakh 29,000 square kilometers should be declared as eco sensitive zone ASZ. Now, this is a big area. Of Western Ghat. So, no uh, government was responsible for accepting this and this committee's recommendation was completely rejected by the government. Clear? And another committee was established. Now, that was called as what? That was called as Kasturi Rangam Committee. So, Kasturi Rangam Committee gave its recommendation in the year 2013 and this recommendation was 59,940 square kilometer western ghats 59940 square kilometer western ghats should be declared as what it should be declared as eco sensitive zone clear it should be declared as eco sensitive zone now this was roughly acceptable to uh, acceptable to the government in its draft recommendation. So, there are two committees. One is called as Madhav Gargil Committee and second is called as Kasturi Rangam Committee that you have to know. And one can see also that the Kerala floods occurred due to non-adherence to Madhav Gargil Committee's recommendation. Because the area which was recommended under Madhav Gargil Committee, bulk of that area was present in Kerala. So, it occurred due to non-acceptance of Madhav Gargil Committee's recommendation clear fine so this is called as eco sensitive zone but there are some other concept which you have to know in conservation biosphere reserves national park wildlife centuries won't do there are some other concept also which we have to cover up now one concept is that of biodiversity hotspot now we can see that the concept of biodiversity hotspot was given by whom it was given by norman mayer norman mayer and he said that, that an area can be declared as hotspot, area can be declared as hotspot, provided it fulfills two conditions. Now, the first condition is what? The first condition is that at least 1500 plant species, at least 1500 plant species or 0.5% of entire plant species of the world. So, in numbers 1500 and in percentage it is 0.5%. So, at least 1500 plant species or 0.5% of entire plant species of the world should be endemic in this area. Should be endemic in this area means should be exclusively found in this area. Clear? So, that is the first thing. And the second thing is what? That means that what kind of biodiversity is present in that area. And second thing is what? That about 70%, about 70% of the 
of primary vegetation about 70% of primary vegetation has been lost 70% of primary vegetation have been lost clear thank you harveer singh and i'll be along with you to complete this segment fine so i am i am much prepared today i'll from good night to good morning will do cover up and try to cover up as well. now this would be easing the burden of your environment portion and at least suppose if we are not able to cover each and every component you can look into that but at least 90% of the syllabus will be revised today that's the purpose of this clear about 70% of the primary vegetation see primary vegetation primary vegetation means that which has been established through primary plant succession so about 70% of the primary vegetation has been lost yes i am coming uh, has been lost due to what due to anthropogenic activities clear about 70% of the primary vegetation has been lost due to anthropogenic activities yes about 70% of the primary vegetation now primary vegetation is that vegetation which is uh, established through primary plant succession remember that uh, primary vegetation is that vegetation which is established through primary plant succession and as far as primary plant succession is concerned primary vegetation is concerned there are two concepts of environment based on this the first concept of environment which is based on this is the concept of what is called as frontier forest frontier forest means that this is the original forest of the planet earth clear and this consists of what this consists of primary vegetation and second is what second is biodiversity hotspot biodiversity hotspot because you can see that in biodiversity hotspots primary vegetation has been mentioned the original vegetation has been mentioned so you can see that two factors which are responsible for determining whether an area is a hotspot or not first is what at least 1500 pl uh, plant species or 0.5% of entire plant species of the world should be endemic in this area first and second uh, and second about 70% of the primary vegetation has been lost due to due to the uh, human activities or anthropogenic activities clear anthropogenic activities and as far as hotspot thank you so much saurav i'm i'll try to boost up your memories also don't worry about it. now uh, there are 35 such hotspots in the world but in india we can see that there are four hotspots present in india so the first hotspot which is present in india is himalayas clear second hotspot which is present in india is the western ghats third hotspot which is present in india is the hilly areas of hilly areas of india myanmar border india myanmar border and this is apart from himalayas and fourth hotspot which is present in india is andaman and nicobar island andaman and nicobar island and this is a part of what this is a part of sunda land so sunda land is a hotspot so andaman and nicobar island which is a part of what which is a part of sunda land and you can see extent now sunda land exists where it exists in indonesia in malaysia now the extension of that hotspots comes to Andaman and Nicobar Island. That's why we are saying that Andaman and Nicobar Island, which is a part of Sunda land. Now, out of these four hotspots, we can see the first two are the most threatened, and we say that these are paradise of biodiversity on Earth. But due to anthropogenic activities, they happen to be paradise lost. So we are saying that due to anthropogenic activities, they happen to be paradise lost. 
So, and this is said by whom? This is said by M.S. Swaminathan that they are the paradise of biodiversity on earth. Now, if suppose we have discussed the vulnerability of Western heart. If vulnerability of Himalayas is asked, vulnerability of Himalayas would be due to landslides because 30 percent of global landslides takes place in Himalaya region and all. Vulnerability of uh, Himalayas would be because of cloud busting because Himalayas are prone to cloud busting. Vulnerability of Himalayas is due to also earthquakes because we can see that Himalayas are prone to earthquakes also. Vulnerability of Himalayas is also anthropogenic factors which are responsible for vulnerability of Himalayas include what establishment of biomedical industries, establishment of tourist centers, establishment of not only biomedical uh, tourist centers also, biomedical industry, dams and reservoirs also, which is responsible for enhancing the vulnerability of Himalayas. Himalayas is called as what it is called as the third pole of the world. Third pole of the world, why? Because it is the biggest source of fresh water after Arctic and Antarctic region. Clear? After Arctic and Antarctic region. It is also called as what? It is also called as not only the third pole of the world, but it is also referred to as the water tower of the world and what water tower of the world why we are saying so because it is the highest source of fresh water in the world so if we are saying that uh, the due to global warming the himalayan glaciers melt it would be disturbing the sustainability of life of 1 billion people who depend upon the water originating from the perennial rivers of himalayas and we can see also that uh, not only this it would be also hampering power generation because a number of hydroelectric projects are established on these rivers. A number of hydroelectric projects are established on these rivers. But there is also another term that you have to know. It is better to know um, uh, hot spot and mega hot spot than hope spots. Clear? Hope spots are there where we think that biodiversity would be established more and more. But when we are talking about mega hot spots, the concept of biodiversity mega hotspots, the concept of biodiversity mega hotspot, mega hotspot was given by whom? It was, give, uh, it was given by international organization called Conservation International. Conservation International international organization conservation international which is working for the conservation of nature and uh, as far as this organization is concerned it says that that these are areas of immense biodiversity clear these are areas of in immense biodiversity and it does not mention that these are areas of immense biodiversity. It does not mention fauna and flora. Why? Because if you look at Mayer's definition, Mayer's definition is only based on what? Only based on flora. No reference has been made to fauna. But in case of Conservation International, it says that these are areas of immense biodiversity. They are threatened due to human intervention. Clear? They happen to be threatened due to human intervention and they lie. They are responsible for lying at the confluence of, at the meeting point of more than two countries. That's why they are mega. So, they are areas of immense biodiversity threatened due to human intervention and they lie at the confluence of more than two countries. That's why they are mega. So, we can see that 12 such hotspots in the world, mega hotspots in the world out of which one is present in India, one is present in India and that one hotspot which is present in India is called as what it is called as Namdhapa National Park, Namdhapa National Park which is present in Arunachal Pradesh, which is present in Arunachal Pradesh. Namdhapa National Park which is present in Arunachal Pradesh and uh, we can see that it is at the confluence of what? Confluence of India, Myanmar and China and this is a mega hotspot of only mega hotspot in India. There are 12 such hotspots, mega hotspots in the world, one of which is present in India. Clear? This is only the mega hotspot which is present in India. And this is at the confluence of India, China and also Myanmar. Clear?
and also we can see that not only this that more than 50% of biodiversity of earth is concentrated only and only in 17 countries these 17 countries are called as what these 17 countries are referred to as mega biodiverse countries of the world India is one among the 17 countries which are mega biodiverse countries of the world clear let's solve some questions now let's have some questions on these topics whatever we have discussed Now, these questions would be helpful to you. See, look at the first question. Which is the only species of red deer to be found in India? Can you answer that? Which is only species of red deer to be found in India? Now, the options are Indian glazel. Then Sambar, Hangul, and Chao Singha. Chao Singha. Yes. Yes. C is the right answer. Not Sambar, it's Hangul. Clear. And Hangul is also called as what? It is called as Kashmiri stag. Now, generally, when you are talking about red deer, red deer are found where? It is found in Europe also. It is found in Antelouia, Antelouian region, as Turkey, Iran. And only one species is found in India and that's also in Jammu and Kashmir, which is called as Hangu. And this is found in Dachigram National Park, which is only 22 kilometers away from Srinagar. Srinagar. So that's your first question. Now see the second question. Consider the following statements related to Great Himalayan National Park and select the correct code. It is the largest protected area in Jammu and Kashmir. It consists of rich coniferous forest. It includes the Sanj and the Tirthan valleys. Can you tell me which is the correct answer? 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3 and only 2. So tell me the second option. I am enlarging it for you. Fine. Tell me the second answer. Yes, some are correct, some are wrong also. Now, the answer is what? Answer is the first option is incorrect. Clear? Because Great Himalayan National Park is not present in Jammu and Kashmir, it's present in Himachal Pradesh. It consists of rich coniferous forest, that's true. It includes the Sanj and the Tirthan Valley, that's true. So, 2 and 3 would be the correct answer. Clear? 2 and 3 would be the correct answer. So, that's your C. Fine. Because this is present in Himachal Pradesh. Now, next question. Which are the following national, which of the following national park has highest density of tigers in India? Highest density of tigers in India. Uh, now the, yes, right, sort of, it's in Himachal Pradesh. Now, which has the highest tiger density in India? Now, the highest tiger density in India is present where? It is present in Corbett National Park. Clear? So, the first answer is correct. 
3 a very good. Now next question which one the following national park is noted for its population of rare golden langur can you tell me where is rare golden langur found exclusively found fine the question number 4 question number 4 where is the rare golden langur found Now, rare golden langur is found where it is formed in not diagram, it is found in Manas Tiger Reserve. That's in Assam. The correct answer is what? The correct answer is Manas Tiger Reserve, which is present in Assam. Clear Manas. So, just correct those question uh, options now. Next, which one of the following statement is incorrect? Kanha National Park is located in Mandala district of Madhya Pradesh. That is correct. And next is what? Tell me which is the incorrect. First, I have read for you. That is correct. And B, C, D, you have to say which is incorrect. The Surupan River meanders through Kanha's central grassland. That is also correct. The Surupan river meanders through Kanha's, Kanha's Nash, uh, central grassland. That is also correct. But the first ever scientific study of tiger was undertaken by eminent zoologist George Slater in this park. That is also correct. What is wrong is it was in Kanha that prestigious project tiger was launched in 1973. It was launched where? It was launched in Jim Corbett. It was launched in Jim Corbett, not in Kanha as such. Clear? It was launched in Jim Corbett, not in Kanha. Now, India's floating national park, Kebul Lamjaro National Park, which is situated in uh, Bishnupur district of Manipur, is in which one is a part of which one of the following lakes? The correct answer is what? The correct answer is 6 is A, that is Loktek. Loktek Lake. Fine, 6 A, Loktek Lake. And uh, the next question. Annamalai century lying adjacent to Mudumalai. Uh, has which one of the following species, not species, that has been top typed wrongly? Species that are exclusive to it. Now we can see that both Nilgiri's langur and lion tailed macaw both are exclusive to it. Both are exclusive to it means that both are found in these. Uh, this century only. Which one of the following areas are meant for protection of cultural diversity that you know very well? And then you can tick and that's called as what? That's called as biosphere reserves. Biosphere reserves. Clear? So, you can see for this, the correct answer would be both A and B. Because Nilgiri's langur and lion tailed macaw is both found in Annamalai. And which one of the following areas are meant for protection of cultural diversity? That's your biosphere reserves. Clear? Very good. Now let's solve another test also. One more test on what we have studied. See the first question. 
Consider the following statements and select the correct code. Biosphere reserves are the most comprehensive protected areas. Is that correct? Biosphere reserves are the most comprehensive protected areas. Now that is correct. Because within a biosphere reserve, more than one national park or more than one wildlife sanctuary can be present. So they are the most protected comprehensive areas. Consider the following. And second is what? Hotels and resorts can be established in eco-sensitive zone under regulation. Definitely. Why? Because they are a regulated activity. We have discussed that there are three types of activities in eco-sensitive zones. So that is a regulated activity. And uh, as far as core zones are present in biosphere reserve only, wrong. Because core zones are present in other protected areas also like national parks. So, we can see 1 and 2 is the correct answer. So, correct option is B. Fine. Sapna Rathor. Sashi. All right. B. Clear. Saurav. Very good. B. Now, second is what? Consider the following statements and select the correct code. The essential component of lichen is what? It is algae. Now, that's wrong. Because the essential component of lichen would be fungus. See, the photosynthetic partner would vary, would vary. But uh, the essential component fungus won't be varying, so it would be fungus. And uh, as far as the second statement is concerned, the second statement is what? See, this is incorrect. We have said that fungus is the correct essential component. Sere is a process through which vegetation is established in an area. That is also wrong. Why? Because Sere is the sequential manner through which vegetation is established. Sequential manner through which vegetation gets established. Pine is an example of opportunist plant. That is also wrong. Because pine is an example of what? It is an example of climax vegetation. Climax vegetation. So, this is an example of climax vegetation, not an opportunist plant. Clear? So, you can see none of the above would be the correct answer. Very good. Very good. Kaleem Khan. Fine, Maitri. So, all these, <coughs> Sanjana, all correct answer. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? Now, tell me which statement is incorrect for question number 3. You are having the question number 3 before you. Sorry, of you got wrong. Okay. Next time you will get correct. Yes, B is correct. Why? Identification of an ecosystem cannot be based on indicator species because sometimes it would be wrong. Sometimes definitely it would be wrong. So, it cannot be based on indicator species only. Clear? And umbrella species can be flagship species definitely. All these are correct. But B is incorrect answer. Which one of the following? Now, tell me this one. Question fourth. Which one of the following is the correct order of decreasing ecological productivity? And you know very well because we have discussed, I have written on the board also all these things. Swamps, coral reefs, river, oceans, estuaries. Tell me what should be the answer for question number four. Now see. For the question number 4, 4 is A, A, yes, Nandini, correct, A, definitely, definitely all, all are correct, yes, because that has been written on the board also, we have discussed that 2500 for swamps, 2000 for coral reefs, 1800 for estuaries and oceans, very less, 125 only. Clear. So, that is the correct. A is the correct. Now, as far as the question fifth is concerned, I have not taught you, but these two are the correct definitions of ecological productivity. That is, 
question number ecological footprint not ecological footprint is the measure of amount of biological productivity land and water needed to supply a population with renewable sources and we can see renewable sources and to absorb or dispose of water from such resource use that's correct water footprint of an individual community or business is believed to be the total volume of fresh water used to produce goods and services consumed by the individual or community or produced by the business that's also true clear that's also true so both are correct options now next question consider the following statements and select the correct code mutual interaction between biotic and abiotic component is responsible for determining genetic and species diversity now see mutual interaction will be responsible for determining both that what kind of species would be present in that area and what can be the variation genetic variation between them but the second statement is wrong that viruses fungus bacteria and algae are responsible for decomposition viruses are not responsible algae are not responsible it's bacteria and fungus which would be responsible so only one would be the correct answer now tell me next question which one of the following statement related to ecotone is incorrect tell me the answer of seventh one mark seventh and say Which one is the correct answer? Viruses are not responsible. Yes. Now, in this case, in the case of seventh one, which one of the following statement related to ecotone is incorrect? Now, incorrect is what? Mangrove can be considered as ecotone, but estuary cannot be. Estuary is an ecotone. Why? Because estuary is demarcating river ecosystem. A river ecosystem. from marine ecosystem so that's a demarcation zone between river ecosystem and marine ecosystem so that's called as what that's estuary so c would be correct now which one of the following statement related to chemosynthesis is incorrect now incorrect is what in 8 question number 8 tell me yes estuary is the ecotone of fresh water and saline water definitely that's correct c good which one of the following statement related to chemosynthesis is incorrect now incorrect is what in case of 8 incorrect is definitely c why because this process can be performed by algae is not at all it can be performed only and only by bacteria clear it can be performed only and only by bacteria now that's your test two tests now let's move forward and discuss some other issues and then again we'll conduct it we'll have test so we'll continue like this continue like this fine now before discussing before discussing yes correct was that because it would be bacteria it won't be algae as such yes sort of malti matri also right sashi all all correct answer see and see that's not correct c is the correct option now yes chemosynthesis bacteria are the first to produce them i have explained to you what uh, the definition which has been given there is nothing but <coughs> the definition which i have given see what is the definition amount of land see what is the definition first ecological footprint is the measure of amount of biological productive land and water needed to supply a population with renewable sources it uses now ecological footprint means what amount of land and what amount of water you would be using so that it can be maintained for future generation also clear 
water footprint of an individual or community or is believed to be the total volume of fresh water used to produce goods and services consumed by individual or community or produced by their business so its water footprint is that what amount of water that you use for producing all goods and services that you got you are indulging in but this would be only and only fresh water not saline water as such see organic production would be taking place where organic production would be taking organic matter would be produced in photosynthesis or chemosynthesis in organic matter is not produced in photosynthesis or chemosynthesis can you please start biotechnology as next topic so that we can do it in a better way and not in a hurry see we can start but the thing is that we haven't completed now what is carbon footprint carbon footprint means that suppose you are coming to the office in office you are using air conditioner you are coming through your own vehicles now a certain and also in home you are using air conditioner electricity so a certain amount of emission would be attributed to you that you are responsible for this now this amount of emission which you are responsible would be called as what it would be referred to as carbon footprint of yours so carbon footprint is per capita emission carbon footprint is per person emission of a person of or individual or industrial unit also is called as per person emission clear now we have we have been given a guideline first of all to complete all these and then only we'll start with biotechnology that's why i told you that we would be reaching midnight today clear because biotechnology also needs to be done in the same manner fine and uh, water pot footprint is that only that we have discussed to produce goods and whatever goods and services you produce so amount of fresh water which is required for that would be called as water footprint that can be of an individual also of a community also or of a business organization also that's <coughs> next thing that you have to know is there are two processes one is called as what one is called as phytoremediation and second is called as what second is called as bioremediation phytoremediation and second is called as bioremediation clear bioremediation and uh, the thing is that the carbon footprint of india is very low when compared to that of the developed nation 15 to 16 times low when compared to that of the developed nation as such now phytoremediation is a process through which plants or trees are used for absorbing pollutants they derive nutrition from them and they are responsible for discharging waste products which do not uh damage the environment in any way i am saying that plants are used for absorbing pollutants vegetation is used for absorbing pollutants so they are absorbing the pollutants they are deriving nutrition from them and they are discharging waste products which do not hamper the environment in any way so this kind of process is called as what it's called as phytoremediation see phyto means what phyto means plant remediation means restoring balance so if plants are used for restoring balance of an area then would be called as phytoremediation these kind of plants would be called as what it would be called as hyper accumulators so the process is called as what it's called as phytoremediation but these kind of plants are referred to as hyper accumulator and their tendency their characteristic of absorbing the pollutant their characteristic of absorbing the pollutant is called as what it is referred to as hyper tolerance so their their tendency of absorbing the pollutant is called as what is called as hyper tolerance so three terms phytoremediation then we can see that hyper accumulators and hyper tolerance and it's also performed by microorganisms some of the microorganism have the ability to absorb contaminants and when they absorb contaminants they also discharge waste products which do not hamper the environment in any way but this would be called as what 
this would be called as bioremediation clear this is referred to as what it is referred to as bioremediation so if microorganism are used it is called as bioremediation if phytoplanktons are used it is called as what if sorry if vegetation are used then it is called as phytoremediation clear first but on these things they have asked you question for example they have asked you that um, in namami gange project also phytoremediation was used for clearing uh, the contaminants from river ganga so in namami gange project phytoremediation has been used and also we can see that phyto uh, not phyto bioremediation has been used in namami gange project and bioremediation is also used for clearing oil spills dekho bioremediation is also used for clearing oil spill it has been used in the chitra oil spill in the year 2010 there was chitra oil spill near mumbai now chitra oil spill was cleared by the process of bioremediation only in which a technology was used which was called as oil zapper technology oil zapper technology but then we can see that <coughs> also not in this case but in case of namami gange project also namami gange project also bioremediation has been used bioremediation has been used clear so we can use uh, bacteria also for removing oil spill and that would be also process of bioremediation and that would be called as that bacteria is called as what it's called as pseudomonas so in upsc they have asked you about which kind of bacteria would be used for removing oil spill so that's called as pseudomonas clear that's called as pseudomonas now from here we'll start another topic and that topic is ozone layer and ozone layer depletion clear this is called as ozone layer and ozone layer depletion so let's start a topic from here fine just wait for one or two minutes and then i start the topic
let's start with ozone layer and ozone layer depletion we know that ozone layer is present where ozone layer is present in stratosphere clear and it is present in stratosphere from the stretch is what the stretch is from 15 to 50 kilometers that's the stretch where o3 layer ozone layer is present in stratosphere and uh, we can know that uh, we also know that uh, ozone is uh, not uh, naturally present in stratosphere but it's formed and how it is formed it is formed due to the action of sunlight on oxygen molecules see what happens when sunlight falls on oxygen molecules this oxygen molecule would be splitting to form oxygen atom clear this oxygen molecule would be splitting to form oxygen atom and the splitting of oxygen molecule into oxygen atom is called as what it is referred to as photolysis the splitting of oxygen molecule into oxygen atom would be called as photolysis and this oxygen molecule would be combining with oxygen atom to form o3 so this oxygen ozone cycle is referred to as what it is called as chapman cycle so it's called as what it's referred to as chapman cycle so that's how ozone formation takes place in stratosphere but the first question is that uh, oxygen is also present in troposphere and uh, sunlight is also present in troposphere so why then ozone is not formed in troposphere and only formed in stratosphere when we talk about uh, making of ozone manufacturing of ozone in the lab in the lab ozone is made how by giving an electric spark by giving an electric spark through an induction coil by giving an electric spark through an induction coil to oxygen oxygen so when the electric spark is given then ozone would be manufactured in the lab then ozone would be developed in the lab clear but when we talk about ozone ozone is also purifying agent for air ozone is also sterilizing agent for water you can see the new uh, ro's that you purchase in those ROs, we can see that ozone is used as a sterilizing agent for water. Not only as a sterilizing agent for water, but also we can see that ozone is used as a purification, a, a purifying agent for air also. So these are benefits of ozone. But if the question is asked like this, that why ozone layer is confined to stratosphere and not present in troposphere there are many reasons for that now one reason is what that why it is confined to stratosphere first reason is that when we move upward in stratosphere temperature also enhances but if we move upward in troposphere temperature reduces so first is temperature enhances if we move upward in stratosphere but in case of troposphere we can see temperature reduces when we move upward now in that case what will happen in troposphere there would be mixing of air in troposphere there would be mixing of air in troposphere there would be not only mixing of air but convectional currents so if suppose ozone layer is formed in the troposphere it won't be stable it would be moving upward and downward because of mixing of air and because of convectional currents but there's no convectional current and no mixing of air in stratosphere that's why the ozone layer in stratosphere is more permanent the second reason is that the intensity of solar radiation intensity of solar radiation for photolysis for photolysis is very less in case of for photolysis is very less in case of troposphere when compared to stratosphere clear sterilizing agent means that it is used for making the water germ free now <clears throat> intensity of solar radiation for photolysis is less in case of uh, troposphere when compared to stratosphere 
and as far as the third reason is concerned we can see the third reason is that stratosphere is a dry region so we can say that stratosphere is a dry region and troposphere is a region where moisture is present the troposphere is a region where moisture is present and ozone happens to be unstable for moisture so we can find three reasons why ozone layer is confined to stratosphere and not present in troposphere clear but if a question is asked like this that ozone on account of its location is both beneficial and harmful for mankind we can see yes because ozone when it is present in stratosphere it is ozone when it is present in stratosphere it is what it is beneficial for us why because it is responsible for what it is responsible for filtering the harmful uv radiation filtering the harmful uv radiation and uh, when you are talking about uv radiation we can see uv radiation is of three types when we are talking about uv radiation we can see uv radiation is of three types first is what first is uva so this is uva now we can see uva is not at all hindered by the ozone layer we are saying that uva is not at all hindered by the ozone layer and why we are saying uva is not at all hindered by the ozone layer because uva radiation strikes the surface of the earth naturally so it is striking the surface of earth naturally it is not at all obstructed by the ozone layer clear not at all obstructed by the ozone layer and uh, if you look at the wavelength of this radiation the wavelength of this radiation is from 320 to 400 nanometers and def definitely it is coming to the surface of the earth it would be responsible for some adverse impact it is responsible for aging aging means that when it falls on the skin the elasticity of the skin would be getting reduced so it is responsible for aging process clear it is responsible for aging process but on the other hand when we are talking about the second kind of uv radiation see uva won't be a matter of concern for us and why it won't be a matter of concern for us because it is coming to the surface of the earth naturally falling on the skin naturally so it's not a matter of concern but the adverse impact certainly is aging and aging is an adverse impact and it is why because the elasticity of the skin is getting reduced but when you talk about uvb radiation uvb radiation reaches the surface of the earth in negligible amount in negligible negligible amount clear and we can see that uh, it's a matter of concern because if ozone layer gets depleted then more and more of uv radiation would be coming to the surface of the earth and uh, the wavelength of this radiation is from 290 to 320 nanometers and uh, this radiation would be responsible for damaging impact why because it is responsible for cataract it is responsible for skin cancer so these kind of damaging impact can be seen due to uv b radiation but the third kind of radiation is called as uv c radiation and uv c radiation does not reach the surface of the earth now it's not reaching the surface of the earth and uh, completely hindered by the ozone layer it can only reach the surface of the earth when there is no ozone layer and this cannot happen because if sunlight is present in oxygen is present uv radiation uh, ozone would be formed ozone would be formed the thing is that ozone is continuously being formed only but the rate of formation of ozone is less than the rate of its depletion clear the rate of formation of ozone is less so how can you stay away from uv a radiation because that's reaching the surface of the earth naturally now we can see that if the ozone would be formed also 
but the rate of formation of ozone is less than the rate of its depletion. That's why we can see that ozone layer depletion is reported, ozone hole is reported. There is no hole as such, only the thickness of the ozone layer reduced is called as ozone hole and the lambda of this radiation is what? 100 to 200 to 90 nanometers. But if suppose only if this strikes the surface of the earth, anyhow if it strikes, although it won't be striking, if it strikes the surface of the earth, it would be doomsday for mankind. Damage. Why? Greater damage. Why? Because this would be responsible for tissue damage to humans. To that for humans would be taking place. Clear? No, these are not alpha, and gamma and beta radiation because alpha, gamma and beta radiation are emitted from radioactive substances. Clear? Now, this is now, suppose if a question is asked to you, which UV, B radi UV radiation is a matter of concern in limelight of depleting ozone layer, it would be what? It would be UVB. And if a question is asked that which UV radiation is reaching the naturally the surface of the earth, it would be UVA as such. And also suppose the question comes like this, that energy is inversely proportional to wavelength if we see. see energy wavelength is decreasing but more damaging is the impact clear wavelength is decreasing but more damaging is the impact so we can say energy is inversely proportional to wavelength so wavelength is decreasing more energetic is the impact as such now now we say that when ozone layer is present in stratosphere it is beneficial for us and why it is beneficial for us because it is responsible for filtering the harmful uv radiation clear it is responsible for filtering the harmful uv radiation that's why we say that this is beneficial for us clear but when we are saying that ozone on account its location can be both beneficial and harmful for mankind remember that if ozone is present in troposphere it would be harmful for us. And why it would be harmful for us? Because tropospheric ozone is nothing but a type of pollutant. Clear? When we are talking about tropospheric ozone, tropospheric ozone is nothing but a type of pollutant. Pollutant. Why? Because if you talk about O3, ozone has been included as one of the indicators in the national air quality index of india that's one thing second is ozone is not only a pollutant in the national air quality index of india but we can see that ozone is also part of what it is also part of photochemical smog photochemical smog is what photochemical smog is secondary air pollutant so it happens to be a part of photochemical smog and third is what that when you talk about tropospheric ozone is dangerous for us tropospheric ozone is dangerous from uh, for us from where do we get tropospheric ozone we get tropospheric ozone from where the sources of tropospheric ozone includes what it includes first oxidation of methane so, when you are talking about that tropospheric ozone is dangerous. Why dangerous? Because it is acting as what? It is acting as a pollutant and has been included in the National Air Quality Index. Tropospheric ozone is dangerous. Why? Because it is a part of, part of photochemical smog also. That is the secondary air pollutant. And tropospheric ozone is dangerous also. Why? Because it is formed how? It is formed due to oxidation of methane. Formed by oxidation of methane. So, if oxidation of methane takes place, then tropospheric ozone would be formed. It is also formed how? It is also formed due to oxidation of benzene. Oxidation of benzene. So, oxidation of methane, oxidation of benzene is responsible for formation of what? It is responsible for formation of tropospheric ozone. Clear? Responsible for formation of tropospheric ozone. Then 
ट्रोपोस्फेरिक ओजोन ऑल्सो कैन बी फॉर्म फ्रॉम वेर इट कैन बी फॉर्म फ्रॉम डस्टॉम्स डस्टॉम्स इन द नॉर्दर्न पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया कम फ्रॉम द अरेबियन पेनसुला कम फ्रॉम द थर्ड इजट एंड दे आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर वॉट दे आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर Alex, Alex, mean, Alex, mean, just now. Don't worry. See, there is no hole as such. The thickness of ozone layer is measured in a unit which is called as Dobson unit. UVC radiation does not strike the surface of the Earth because it can strike the surface of the Earth if no ozone layer is present. That cannot happen. And before that happens, we are going to die, because. ओजोन वुड बी फॉर्म ऑलवेज इफ ऑक्सीजन एंड ओ थ्री ओजोन वुड बी फॉर्म ऑलवेज इफ ऑक्सीजन एंड सनलाइट इज प्रेजेंट क्लियर एंड विदाउट एनी वन ऑफ देम वी आर गोइंग टू डाई फाइन सो ओजोन वुड बी ऑलवेज फॉर्म एंड दिस वाई वी से दैट यू वी सी रेडिएशन वुड बी रीचिंग दे बिकॉज इट कैन रीच द सर्फेस ऑफ द अर्थ इफ देर इज नो ओजोन लेयर विच इज नॉट एट ऑल पॉसिबल एज सच सो वी कैनॉट से सो that uh, this would be coming to the surface of the earth when there is no ozone layer and as far as yes yes photochemical smog i'll explain photochemical smog in brief the storms are also responsible for enhancing the tropospheric ozone the storms also enhance the uh, level of 2. Point, uh, pm 2.5 pm 10 so these are the sources of what sources of tropospheric ozone which hardly has been mentioned in the books also now see photochemical smog means what that if suppose industrial emission takes place industrial emission takes place and vehicular emission takes place on a large scale and particularly in some parts of the metropolitan cities vehicular or industrial emission would be very high vehicular or industrial emission would be very high see how ch4 is formed ch4 has many sources CH4 is formed from coal mines CH4 is from from gas hydrates it's present in shale gas it's emitted from paddy fields there are many sources it's emitted from water reservoirs is an uh, ozone formed by methane oxidation can we say global warming has effect in tropospheric ozone but not ozone hole yes you can say that and we'll lastly we'll relate that to it also so if suppose we are talking about industrial emission or vehicle emission which is in some part of the city more and some part of the city more because of traffic congestion also it can be and it can be so industrial and vehicle emission is more and more due to industrial and vehicle emission what is pumped into atmosphere is nox that is oxide of nitrogen plus hydrocarbons so when sunlight acts on nox that is oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbon we can see three things would be generated one is what one is nitrogen dioxide second is o3 and third is peroxy peroxy acetyl acetyl nitrate that's called as pan peroxy acetyl nitrate or pan in a combined form they would be called as what they would be referred to as photochemical smog so we are saying that in a combined form they are referred to as what they are referred to as photochemical smog so this is photochemical smog if the intensity of solar radiation is higher then photochemical smog is called as what it is called as brown air if the intensity of solar radiation is uh, low then it is referred to as what it is referred to as gray air so there are two names of photochemical smog based on intensity of solar radiation and photochemical smog has o3 present in it we can see that the o3 which is present in photochemical smog oxidant which is present in photochemical smog certainly this oxidant which is present in photochemical smog uh is acting as a part of secondary air pollutant and ozone itself is a 
primary air pollutant also so all these things that you have to know so ozone on account of its location can be both beneficial if it is present in suppose stratosphere it is beneficial for us and if it is present in troposphere it is harmful for us and we can see the sources of tropospheric ozone include many clear sources of tropospheric ozone includes many theek hai fine let's see the question ozone formed by methane oxidation can we say global warming has an effect yes it can be said now let's move in 1985 for the first time ozone depletion was reported for the first time over antarctica antarctica ozone depletion was reported for the first time over antarctica the 19 no uh, shubh yadav study kya uh, क्या इतनी इकोलॉजी एंड इन्वायरमेंट यू के प्री के लिए काफ़ी है अभी मैंने कंप्लीट नहीं किया है बेटे मुझे कंप्लीट करने दो अभी मात्र ट्वेंटी थर्टी परसेंट हुआ है इतनी मत कहो इसे अभी मैंने ये नहीं कहा है कि इतनी है ये बिकॉज दिस वुड बी सर्टनली गोइंग ऑन अभी ये पूरा नहीं हुआ है अभी तो मैं एक ही चैप्टर शुरू किया हूँ जो फेमस टॉपिक्स में है ओजोन लेयर यूपीएससी पढ़ाई खोजती है बच्चे हम लोग ट्राई कर रहे हैं कि मैक्सिमम आपको कवरेज दे दें कंटेम्प्रेरी का भी और ये भी क्लियर तो ये पढ़ाई खोजती है और आज देखो मैं कितना तुम्हें कर सकता हूँ सी बोथ इट इज प्राइमरी ऑल्सो एंड सेकेंडरी देखो प्राइमरी इसलिए होगा ना क्योंकि वो नेशनल एयर क्वालिटी इंडेक्स का एक इंडिकेटर है और सेकेंडरी इसलिए होगा कि वो फोटो केमिकल स्मोक का पार्ट है क्लियर इतना नहीं अभी तो मैंने शुरू ही किया है शुभ यादव अभी आप जस्ट स्टार्टेड प्लीज थोड़ा सा अभी लेट्स लेट्स कंटिन्यू ये इतना नहीं है आई एम नॉट कंप्लीटिंग अभी ये चलेगा बारह बजे रात तक उसके बाद फिर बायोटेक्नोलॉजी चलेगा बच्चों मैं आया हूं तो आपके कष्ट के निवारण के लिए <laughs> so, आप आप ये बस सोचिए कि बस इतना ही आएगा अभी तो ये स्टार्ट ही हुआ है क्लियर सी इन 1985 वी कैन सी ओजोन डिप्रेशन वाज रिपोर्टेड फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम ओवर अंटार्कटिका एंड इफ यू टॉक अबाउट द थिकनेस ऑफ ओजोन लेवर ओजोन लेयर ओवर अंटार्कटिका इन 1950s it was from 280 to 3 dobson to 320 dobson unit which in 1985 reduced to 136 dobson unit so that was a drastic reduction drastic reduction and this was reported for the first time ozone depletion was reported for the first time was reported for the first time now as far as this depletion is concerned ozone layer depletion is concerned now we can say that <coughs> 1950s 280 to 320 dobson unit to 136 dobson unit so it was reported for the first time मूवी लंबी अभी यस मूवी लंबी है बच्चों प्लीज थोड़ा शेयर करो आज और आराम से पढ़ो इसे ठीक है ठीक है जस्ट इसको अभी थोड़ा सा अभी एक्सपैंड करो इसमें बहुत सारी चीज है ठीक है तो थोड़ा से कवर करने दो इसे सो इट रिड्यूस टू वन थर्टी सिक्स टॉप सिनेट अब ये कहते हैं कि वॉट आर दी ओजॉन डिप्रिटिंग सब्सटेंसेस so when we talk about the ozone depleting substances jisko hum log kehte hain kya odss ozone depleting substances includes many cfcs chlorofluorocarbon nitrous oxide methane methane then also hcfcs 
So all these are what? All these are ozone depleting substances. Clear? All these are ozone depleting substances and these are present for ozone depletion. When you are talking about CFC, chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs are never directly responsible for ozone layer damage. See, CFCs are never directly responsible for ozone layer damage, but they emit chlorine which is responsible for doing so. And this chlorine would be combining with O3 to form ClO plus O2. So, you can see this ClO is responsible for the damage. <coughs> this ClO is responsible for the damage. Clear? And uh, in this reaction, we can see ClO would be again form, uh, forming, combining with O3 to form Cl plus 2O2. So, Cl is again formed also. Clear? Cl is again formed also. So, they are ne never directly responsible for ozone layer damage. They are never directly responsible for ozone layer damage. Fine. But they emit chlorine which is responsible for doing so. Fine. Now, see. Chlorine which is responsible for doing so. Now, the thing is what? that maximum damage to ozone layer is not done by them. Maximum damage to ozone layer is done by four free radical catalyst. And the four free radical catalyst include what? It includes chlorine, it includes bromine, it includes hydroxyl, it includes nitric oxide. These four free radical catalyst, these four free radical catalyst, hai. free radical catalyst, which is responsible for maximum damage to ozone layer, which is responsible for maximum damage to ozone layer. Yes, ground, uh, carbon monoxide for ground level ozone. Fine. Let's continue. Now, uh, in all these four free radical catalysts that we have discussed, maximum damage would be done by whom? Maximum damage is done by bromine. In charo mein, sabse other damage kon karta hai? Bromine. But the problem is what? That bromine is never found in free state in atmosphere. So, the problem is what? That bromine is never found in free state in atmosphere as it is highly soluble in water. Clear. So, we can extract brominated compounds. Brominated ke compounds, which are bromine, ke, wo ek hi se extract kar sakte. Kahan se? Brine pool. A brine pool ka matlab nahi ki ocean ke andar jaake isse extract kiya jayega. Brine pool inland bhi hote hai. Jaise Sambar Lake is a brine pool in Jaipur. So, it can be extracted from their Sambar Lake. So, it can be extracted from there. So, it can be extracted from brine pools. Clear. It can be extracted from brine pools. But is it used karenge? Where is brominated compounds used? Now bro, brominated compounds, bromine ke jo compound hai, brominated compounds are used for what? It is used as a fire retardants. See, there is one term which is called as fire extinguisher. So fire extinguisher means that they are responsible for extinguishing the fire. But when we are saying fire retardants, now that means that they are responsible for what? They are responsible for retarding the fire, suppressing the fire. So when brominated compounds are used as fire retardants, they are called as what? They are called as BFRs. That is brominated, brominated fire retardants. But in UPSC, we can see that they have asked you what? They have asked you that what are the adverse impact of BFR? So, the adverse impact of BFR include what? The adverse impact of BFR include that they are bioaccumulative in nature. So, they are bioaccumulative in nature. So, they enter the food chain and they are also what? They are also endocrine disruptors. 
endocrine disruptors. So, they are bioaccumulative in nature and also act as endocrine disruptors. One compound of bromine was used as what? Used as a pesticide in agriculture also. For example, that compound was what? That compound was methyl bromide, was used as a pesticide in agriculture. But it was responsible for damaging the uh, ozone layer also. So, WHO took a note of it and WHO was responsible for banning the use of methyl bromide in agriculture. So, it has been banned and we can see that methyl bromide was, uh, is uh, present as a class 1 ODS. Class 1 ODS means that it would be damaging the ozone layer to a greater extent. So, it is present as a class 1 ODS in the Montreal Protocol and should be phased out immediately. Clear? So, methyl bromide is what? Methyl bromide is a type of what? <coughs> Brominated compound which was used as a pesticide in garden, in agriculture as such. Clear? It has been banned. So, they have asked you about the adverse impact of uh, brominated fire retardant. See, BFR is present where? BFR is present in the electronic devices that you use, laptops, mobiles. BFR is present in the furniture. BFR is present in the smart boards. BFR is present in the plastic components. So, all these would be having BFR in large numbers. Clear? All these are having BFRs in large numbers. Now, we know that damage to ozone layer is more in Antarctica. See, if we suppose we consider that in tropical areas, industrialization, tropical areas of northern Europe, of northern hemisphere, not northern Europe, of northern hemisphere, industrialization is maximum. But damage to ozone layer takes place where? Damage to ozone layer takes place mainly in Antarctica mainly in Antarctica. So, what are the factors which are responsible for that? If we are saying that here the industrialization is maximum, but damage to ozone layer takes place mainly here Antarctica. So, what are the factors which are responsible? The factors which are responsible for this include shape of the earth shape of earth. The factors which are responsible for it include what? It also includes the rotation of earth, the rotation of earth and factor which is responsible for it also includes the lowest temperature of, low temperature of Antarctica, low temperature of Antarctica. So, here what happens that uh, uh, when the industrial emission rises in the tropical areas of northern hemisphere. Here suppose the industrial emission is rising in the tropical areas of northern hemisphere. What is happening? They are combining with the cold stratospheric air. See, the hot tropospheric air we say why and cold stratospheric air we say why. Hot tropospheric air, it is said why? Because it is responsible for absorbing the infrared radiation. Clear? And uh, shape of earth, rotation of earth and lowest temperature. And we can see, yes. Now, we can see that uh, temperature of stratosphere is low. Why? Because the infrared radiation is more absorbed in troposphere due to emission of more and more of greenhouse gases. And it is less present in the infra scape of infrared radiation is less in what it is less in stratosphere. That's why stratosphere becomes cooler. So we are saying that when the hot tropospheric air in the tropical areas of northern hemisphere mingles with mixes mixes with the cold stratospheric air, just like a, a convectional current, a circulation is generated, which is called as what? Which is called as Dobson Brewer circulation. Dobson Brewer circulation. Just like a convectional current. A circulation is generated which is called as Dobson Brewer circulation. Now, this circulation would be responsible for carrying the emission towards the pools. 
this circulation is responsible for carrying the emissions towards the poles. So, we can see the industrial emission which has, uh, which is carried by the hot tropospheric air has mingled with the cold stratospheric air and just like a circulation, a uh, convectional current, dobson beer circulation is generated which is responsible for pushing the emission towards the poles, clear. The emissions are getting accumulated near the poles, they are getting accumulated near the poles and the reason for this is what? The reason for this is the nearer center of gravity, suppose we take the equator here and here is the center of gravity. Suppose this is a circle inside and here is the center of gravity. So, we can see the shape of the earth is what? It is geoid. The shape of the earth is what? It is oblate spheroid. So, it is due to nearer center of gravity what is happening that the industrial emission is getting accumulated near the poles. Clear? Industrial emission is getting accumulated near the poles and as the earth rotates, formation of vortex wind takes place here. So, when the industrial emission has got accumulated near the poles, it is now rotating along with the vortex wind and industrial emission consists of what? It consists of ODSs, it consists of what? It consists of ozone depleting substances. So, as the earth rotates, this vortex, uh, the wind, wind which is formed, now, industrial emission which has been trapped here would be now rotating along with the vortex. And what happens that this vortex wind would be condensing when winter comes to form highly reactionary clouds. Now, these highly reactionary clouds would be called as what? It is called as polar stratospheric clouds. So, we are saying that, that first of all, industrial emission got accumulated here and they are industrial emission has got accumulated here. So, they are now rotating along with the vortex wind and when the winter falls, when the winter comes, the vortex wind would be condensing to form a highly reactionary cloud and this highly reactionary cloud is called as what? This is referred to as what uh, the polar stratospheric clouds. And let us see how, why we are saying that it is highly reactionary in nature. So, this is called as polar stratospheric clouds. Now, nothing will happen during winter. No, nothing will happen during winter. But when the winter gets over and solar radiation again reaches this area, then ozone depletion would take place. Remember two things, that ozone depletion would be taking place if two conditionalities are met. Clear? I am saying that ozone depletion would be taking place if two conditionalities are met. The first conditionality is ozone depletion takes place at low temperature. And the second conditionality is what? That ozone depletion would be taking place only in the presence of sunlight. Because sunlight is responsible for triggering the ozone depletion reaction. The ozone depletion reaction cannot get triggered without the sunlight. So, sunlight is always responsible for triggering the ozone depletion reaction. And in winter, there is no sunlight in the polar areas. Clear? So, when the winter, that is why we are saying that, that no activity would be taking place during winter. But when winter gets over and solar radiation again reaches this area, now, they would be, the solar radiation would be falling on the PSCs and from the PSCs and from the PSCs, we can see that ozone depleting substances would be emitted. So, here we are saying that solar radiation is falling on the PSCs, is falling on the PSCs and from the PSCs, ozone depleting substances are emitted, ODSs are emitted. And ODSs would be emitted from where? ODSs would be emitted from the IZ layers of PSCs. Ye dekho, ye PSCs hai na, to isme IZ ke layers hai. Now, is IZ layers se ozone depleting substances nikalte hai. Now, ek to ozone depleting substance nikal rahe hai is IZ layers se. Clear? Kyunki yahi wo trap the. Second is what? that these IZ layers are acting as what? They are acting as a platform for ozone depletion reaction to occur. Yehi platform hai. 
because this is providing the low temperature the IG layer is providing the low temperature so it is acting as a platform for ozone depletion reaction to occur and the target is also nearby that is ozone layer because this is present where in the stratosphere so the target is also nearby the ozone layer so we can say what we can say that that the source is present there only the target is also present nearby and that's why damage to ozone layer takes place more during this period because the IG layers of PSCs is not acting only as a source of ODS but also they are acting as what they are also acting as a platform for ozone depletion reaction to occur clear ozone depletion reaction to occur so that's why we are saying that ozone damage but then if this be the case then damage to ozone layer should have been in an identical manner in both the arctic region and antarctic region but that does not happen damage to ozone layer takes place more and more when more and more in antarctica and the reason for this is that in winter the temperature of antarctica can dip down to minus 115 degrees centigrade in winter the temperature of arctic region can dip down to what it can dip down to uh, minus 60 minus 70 degrees centigrade clear so the in case of antarctica the ig layers of pscs would stay for a greater period of time and damage to ozone layer in antarctica would have been more when compared to arctic region clear damage to ozone layer in antarctica would be more when compared to arctic region so we can see there are three reasons for, for for depletion of ozone layer in Antarctica. One is the shape of the earth and shape of the earth is why? Because it is the shape of the earth which is responsible for the industrial emission to get accumulated in the polar areas due to nearer center of gravity. Second is what? Second is the rotation of earth. It is the rotation of earth which is responsible for what? It is the rotation of earth which is responsible for uh, formation of vortex wind and third is lowest temperature of Antarctica because it is the lowest temperature of Antarctica which is responsible for what the icy layers of PSCs staying for a greater period of time in Antarctica clear greater period of time in Antarctica clear yes I think that is clear now, Subhi, I have repeated <laughs> these things cannot be repeated again because it will take time. But see, one more two things here needs to be done. In the year 2021, there was a report published by Lancaster University. Lancaster University is in UK. And this report says that global warming is related to ozone layer depletion in more than one way. Clear? Global warming is re related to ozone layer depletion in now Coriolis force is maximum that's yes, but it's re uh, related to ozone layer depletion in more than one way. Now what is the basis of this? The basis of this is what? F they are responsible for drawing few connects. Now the first connect that they have drawn is what? The first connect they are responsible for drawing is what? That when we talk about ozone layer and global warming, ozone layer depletion and global warming. We can see all ODSs are greenhouse gases. Pehle chiz unhoon kya kaha? Ki jitni bhi ozone depleting substances hai, sare ki sare greenhouse gas hai. Aur O3 khud hi a greenhouse gas hai. Ozone itself is a greenhouse gas. Clear? So first connect drawn was this. The second connect is what? When you are talking about ozone layer depletion, the ozone layer depletion ka ek or kya hai adverse impact. Khas karke uh, UVB radiation ka. UVB radiation kya karte? UVB radiation is reaching the surface of earth. Clear? Is reaching the surface of earth. So when UVB radiation is reaching the surface of the earth, it is responsible for what? It is responsible for damaging also phytoplankton. Ye nahi hai ki sirf cataract or skin cancer hote hai. It's also responsible for damaging what? It is also responsible for damaging phytoplankton. Agar maan lo, UVB radiation phytoplankton ko damage karega, what will happen? 
फाइटोप्लैंगटन डैमेज मीन्स दैट दैट द कार्बन सिंक इज गेटिंग रिड्यूस्ड क्योंकि फाइटोप्लैंगटन इज अब्जॉर्बिंग सीओ टू फॉर फोटोसिंथेसिस ओशियंस जो अब्जॉर्व करती है सीओ टू वो तो यूटिलाइज होता है फाइटोप्लैंगटन आलगी में सो इफ फाइटोप्लैंगटन इज गेटिंग डैमेज yes arctic arctic amplification also in news we'll we'll try to cover up we'll try to cover up arctic council will cover up clear now <coughs> when we are talking to <coughs> when we are talking about this that uh, phytoplankton is getting damaged now phytoplankton getting damaged means uh, i'll give you a break at 8:30 <laughs> how much time you want as break clear can i give you a 5 minute break do you want break right now because i i thought that 8:30 would be a suitable time for break okay let's take a 5 minute break let's take a 5 minute break let's have a 5 minute break and then after that we'll have the break at a big break at of half an hour at um, i think that that would be suitable if we take the break at 9 o'clock clear Din dinner break would be at 9 o'clock i am giving you a break of 5 uh, minutes right now but dinner break 5 5 to 10 minutes right now but dinner break would be at 9 o'clock so we'll continue after this fine
let's start now just before going into the break we were responsible for discussing that a uh, report was published in 2021 by lancaster university and that report said that ozone layer depletion is related to global warming in more than one way see filling of ozone layer has already started because ozone depletion is not as uh, today as it was in the year 1985 or 1986 but this report lancaster university report stated that that uh, ozone layer depletion is related to global warming in more than one way and the first connect which was drawn was that that when we talk about ozone layer depletion all ods are greenhouse gases also even i said that o3 is a greenhouse gas then we can see that not only o3 is a greenhouse gas but all ods are greenhouse gases the second connect which was drawn in the report was that that if suppose ozone layer depletion takes place more and more of uv b radiation would be reaching the surface of the earth and if more and more of uv b radiation reaches the surface of the earth then more and more of uv b radiation reaches the surface of the earth then we can see that it would be also responsible for uh destroying the phytoplanktons and phytoplanktons are what phytoplanktons are carbon sinks they are responsible for absorbing co2 from atmosphere because when we say oceans absorb it's the mainly the phytoplankton which is responsible for absorbing or algae which are responsible for absorbing so they are responsible for absorbing co2 from the atmosphere and uh, when <coughs> the carbon sinks would be reduced like phytoplankton is getting damaged carbon sink is reduced it means that that the co2 level in atmosphere would be enhancing that would this would be further aggravating global warming so ozone layer depletion is responsible for further aggravating global warming that's one thing and on the other hand we can see that as far as phytoplanktons are concerned uh, we can see also that the third thing which was responsible that uh, we said that as far as the third connect is what the third connect is that uh, when we are talking about when we are talking about ozone layer depletion that ozone layer depletion takes place global warming takes place global warming is responsible for what global warming is responsible for enhancing the temperature of troposphere but it also reduces the temperature of stratosphere clear why because the scape of infrared radiation in stratosphere would be reduced so it is responsible for enhancing the temperature of troposphere but it also reduces the temperature of stratosphere and we can see that this would be affecting this would be uh, further responsible for what further responsible for ozone layer depletion why because reduction temperature of stratosphere is responsible for ozone depletion in two ways one low temperature is conducive for its depletion that's one thing and second thing is what second thing is that formation of pscs takes place at minus 76 degree centigrade so formation of pscs takes place at minus 76 degree centigrade means what if we are saying that formation of pscs is taking place at minus 76 degree centigrade it means that this condition would be rendered by antarctica more when compared to arctic region clear this condition would be rendered by antarctica more when compared to arctic region so this is how we are saying that that ozone layer depletion is related to global warming in more than one way is that clear ozone layer is related depletion is related to global warming in more than one way but also do remember that when we are talking about <coughs> spring in antarctica if we talk about the spring in antarctica when spring takes place in antarctica from the stratosphere from the antarctica from the polar regions during spring in antarctica from antarctica this area the polar stratospheric air would be moving outward and when the polar stratospheric air move moves outward it has ozone depleted within it so the nearby countries are responsible for issuing what is called as uv alerts 
Why? Because it has ozone depleted within it. So, nearby countries would be responsible for issuing UV alerts. But in Arctic region and Antarctic region, we can see that in Arctic region or even in Antarctic region, we can see that uh, as far as <coughs> ozone layer is concerned, there is a type of forecast also maintained. And this forecast is a daily forecast of UV exposure, which is called as UV index. So, the scheduling programming is done according to this forecast, which is called as what? Which is referred to as UV index. Clear? Which is referred to as UV index. So, this also you have to know. One is called as UV alert and second is called as UV index. Now, if we talk about the adverse impact of ozone layer depletion. The adverse impact of ozone layer depletion includes what? It includes in skin cancer, skin cancer, it includes cataract, it includes skin cancer, cataract, it also includes damage to immune system, damage to immune system, that's also another, it also includes damage to nucleic acid, damage to immune system, damage to nucleic acid. It also reduces photosynthesis performed by phytoplankton. So, all these are, all these are adverse impact of ozone layer depletion. Clear, adverse impact of ozone layer depletion. But when we are talking about ozone layer depletion, we can see that many steps have been taken. In 1985 itself, when ozone depletion was reported for the first time, 1985 itself when ozone depletion was reported for the first time an initiative was taken and that initiative was that Vienna conference was organized. Vienna conference was organized in 1985 itself and the purpose of organizing Vienna conference was to study the impact of anthropogenic activities on ozone layer that how depletion has taken place that what are the impact of anthropogenic activities on ozone layer. So, that was done in 1985. But also we can see that concrete steps were taken in 1987. And these steps were taken in 1987 when Montreal Protocol was organized. Montreal Protocol was organized. And Montreal Protocol was signed by 27 nations. Now, India was not among the 27 nations which signed the Montreal Protocol. So, it was signed by 27 nations. India became a signatory later on. But at that time, India was not a signatory to sign the Montreal Protocol. <coughs> and we can see that as far as Montreal Protocol is concerned, Montreal Protocol is for what purpose? The purpose of Montreal Protocol is to limit the production of ODS, to limit the production of ODS. ODS and second purpose is to phase them out, phase them out. Now for phasing them out we can see there were two time frames suggested, time frames. One was for developed nation, means developed nation they have a shorter time frame to remove the ODSs, to remove the ozone depleting substances. But a longer time frame, a longer time frame was set up for what? A longer time frame was set up for the developing nations. Developing nations. Clear? So, longer time frame was set for developing nations. They were given some time that they should be responsible for <coughs> In 2011 paper, option with global warming as reason for ozone layer depletion was wrong. Now, after this report, do we say that this is correct? Yes, it is correct. Yes, it is correct. Sometimes the UPSC question are wrong also. You can see the question I give you. That earlier, they have asked you the source of CFC in UPSC. And in answer, they have given you tubeless tire as wrong option. Clear. But tubeless tire is a source of CFC. Tubeless tar is nothing but plastic foam. 
and plastic foams are source of they are made up of natural and synthetic polymer which are nothing but plastic foams clear fine so please now the things would be changing because you have all the connects you have all the connects now we can see that <coughs> longer time frame was given for developing nation and a shorter time frame was given for developed nation that they have to remove the odss and plus we can see odss were also classified odss classified means that uh, they were put into different categories odss were classified put into different categories that is class 1 ods class 2 ods for example suppose when you are talking about methyl bromide methyl bromide methyl bromide is what it is a class 1 ods methyl bromide is a class 1 ods clear so it's a class 1 ods fine now uh, you can see that india was not a signatory to montreal protocol earlier because india believes in certain principle india believes in what is called as polluter pays principle polluter pays principle means what polluter pays principle means that um, when you are talking about atmosphere of the earth being polluted it was mainly polluted by developed nation so developed nation under their colonial imperial rule were responsible for polluting the atmosphere of the earth we are not responsible for doing that so they have started the fire and if suppose we are pressurized to take initiative for mitigating the adverse impact of global warming and climate change mitigating the adverse impact of global warming and climate change the funding should come from where the funding should come from developed nation clear so that's called as polluter pays principle because if we direct our fund for mitigation measures then our development process would be impeded the second principle on which to which we adhere is called as what is called as ecological depth ecological depth means that during the uh, colonial imperial rule what happened was that our resources were utilized by whom our resources were utilized by the developed nations so it's now the time for the developed nation to pay it back to us so that's called as ecological depth and the third principle to which india adheres is called as what it is called as cbdr cbdr stands for common but differentiated responsibility so common but differentiated responsibility means what it means that that uh, both industrialized nation and developing nation have the same objective the objective is to reduce the adverse impact of global warming and climate change the objective is to reduce the adverse impact of global warming and climate change but then the responsibility should be more shouldered by the developed nation when compared to developing nation clear so responsibility should be more shouldered by the developed nation when compared to developing nation now as far as montreal protocol is concerned our position was that we believe in polluter pays principle so we were not responsible for signing it earlier but we became a signatory later on but we can see that uh, after this in the year 1990 a un conference was organized and this under this un conference a fund to the to tune of 240 million dollar was constituted and this was constituted to help the developing nations find alternatives for cfc so this was constituted to help the developing nations find alternatives for uh, cfc the alternative for cfc was found in the form of what is called as hfc clear and this was now used in air conditioners hfcs were used in air conditioners now hfcs are less damaging to ozone layer when compared to cfcs when we are talking about hfcs we can see hfcs are less damaging to ozone layer when compared to cfcs but hfcs have a very high heat retention capacity the heat retention capacity of hfcs is 1000 times than that of co2 clear and that's why we can see that it would be responsible for aggravating global warming to a greater extent clear so as far as the heat retention capacity is concerned if suppose they ask you the heat retention capacity of water vapor that is 
we are saying, uh, saying that heat retention capacity of water vapor is twice than that of CO2. Twice than that of CO2, double than that of CO2. But you know that water vapor is short lived in atmosphere. Then we can see the heat uh, retention capacity of methane. CH4 is 25 to 28 times than that of CO2, 25 to 28 times than that of CO2. Then we can see the heat retention capacity of heat retention capacity of HFCs which was used in air conditioner instead of CFCs is 1000 times than that of CO2. So, this is the heat retention capacity, heat retention capacity that we are talking about, that is the heat retention capacity and we can see also that Teflon is produced. Yes, that fund was global environmental facility. <laughs> now, we can see that uh, this uh, heat retention capacity, also we can see that there is a substance called Teflon which is used in nonstick wares and this when it is produced, when industrial manufacturing of Teflon takes place, industrial manufacturing of Teflon takes place. Then as a byproduct, uh, substance is produced which is called as fluoroform. So, this is a byproduct which is produced in the industrial manufacturing of Teflon. So, this byproduct CHF3 it is called. So, if we talk about 1 ton of CHF3, it is equivalent to 11,700 tons of CO2. So, the heat retention capacity of CHF3 is very high, followed by HFCs, followed by methane and followed by water vapor, clear. But these are what? These are short lived in atmosphere, all these three. CO2 when we say, CO2 is long lived in atmosphere because it stays in atmosphere for 120 to 200 years, CO2. And as far as methane is concerned, methane is short lived in atmosphere because it stays in atmosphere for 9 to 12 years. And all these are short lived in atmosphere, but CO2 is long lived in atmosphere. That is the heat retention capacity and that is why HFC was a concern. <coughs> yes. See, remember two time periods. One is of uh, CO2, which is 120 to 200 years. Second is of methane, which is of 9 to 12 years. But as far as HFC is concerned, it is also short lived in atmosphere. It resides in the atmosphere for less than 10 years. Clear? Black carbon is also uh, a short lived in atmosphere because it is residing in atmosphere for less than nine, 7 to 9 years it resides. That is the time period. HFC is for short, short or long, it is for short, clear. And that is why we say that there was an agreement also signed, if you remember in some books you would have read, that is called as what? That is called as Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And what is Climate and Clean Air Coalition? This coalition is, was signed in the year 2012 and the purpose of climate and clean air coalition was to, was to phase out short lived pollutants in atmosphere. The purpose of climate and clean air coalition was to phase out short lived pollutants in atmosphere. And these short lived pollutants in atmosphere include mainly three. And that is why we are saying HFCs, black carbon 
and methane. So these are short-lived pollutants in atmosphere. This agreement was signed by six nations, six nations, which included US, Canada, Mexico, Mexico, Ghana, Sweden, and Bangladesh. So there were six nations which were responsible for signing the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Climate and Clean Air Coalition. See, yes, sulfur hexafluoride is longest and is most adverse. That's why sulfur hexafluoride is uh, recognized as a greenhouse gas under the Kyoto Protocol also. And sulfur hexafluoride is also emitted from where? It is emitted from solar waste. Clear? So, it is emitted from solar waste. It is used, sulfur hexafluoride is also used for electronic com components. So, it is emitted from solar waste. Fine. Now, see, that's called as Climate and Clean Air Coalition. But due to the high heat retention capacity of HFC, it was a grave concern. And it was a grave concern why? Yes, next to see HFC, we are just now discussing. Now, it was a grave concern. Why? Because of its high heat intrusion capacity, because it was responsible for absorbing uh, infrared radiation to a greater extent. So, to phase out HFC, an agreement was signed and this agreement was called as what? This agreement was called as Kigali Agreement. So, Kigali Agreement was signed in the year 2016 and under this agreement 90 percent of HFCs would be phased out by the mid of this century, mid of this century, 90 percent of HFCs would be phased out by the mid of this century and this is also based on CBDR. Why we are saying this is based on CBDR? Because the first step would be taken by developed nation. So, you can see developed nation, nations like US, Japan would start their initiative first of all, clear. Then 100 developing nation would do so from 2024, which includes also China. They would start their phasing out program. And then we can see that India, our dear neighbor, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, all these countries would be starting their phasing out initiative from where all these countries would be starting their phasing out initiative from 2028. So that's why we say that this is based on CBDR, common but differentiated responsibility. And as far as HFC is concerned, we can see the alternative for HFC, you can see here also the air conditioner over here, just above me. Now this air conditioner is showing a gas and that is called as R32. So as a replacement for HFC, we started to use R32, clear R32. R32 is called as what? It is called as difluoromethane difluoromethane and this is now used in air conditioners but the potential is to use other gases also and the other gases which would be used instead of HFCs one can be R32 definitely but the other gases which can be used for HFC for instead of HFC include what it includes R290 this is what this is propane this can be used also in air conditioners R 600 and A. Now, 600 and A is nothing but isobutane. Then we can see R 717 and R 717 is nothing but ammonia. So, these gases also can be used as a replacement for HFCs. Clear? These gases can also be used as a replacement for HFCs. Also, as far as HFC is concerned, <clears throat> remember, as, as far as CFC is concerned, which was replaced by HFC, we can see CFCs was what? It was a 
halogenated hydrocarbon because it's a chlorofluorocarbon. It was non-flammable, non-toxic, organic molecules. And generally how it functions, these air conditioners just running on the top. Now, in this, the gas like CFCs or HFCs, they are what? They are nothing but uh, under normal pressure and temperature, they are gas. But if you give them slightly modest of temperature or modest of pressure also, they liquefy. And they liquefy, this liquefaction process is used for what? This liquefaction process is used for the cooling effect. But then the problem is what? That when they re, uh, when they are responsible for re-evaporating, they would be absorbing heat. And that's why it said that, the reason why it is said that greenhouse gases and ODSs, that ODSs are greenhouse gases also. CFC is a ODS because it re releases chlorine which is responsible for damaging the <coughs> uh, damaging the ozone layer. But it is also greenhouse gas because of its high heat retention capacity because when it evaporates, it would be responsible for absorbing heat also. Clear, it would be responsible for absorbing heat also. And all these are the possibilities of the gas being used. Clear? Now see, as far as Yes, we are emphasizing on solar renewable energy to reduce uh, GHG's impact. But solar waste is still impact environment and more than ever are we in vicious cycle of destruction. Yes, solar waste is a, today a type of <coughs> e-waste <coughs> and we are saying that by the year 2050, India would be responsible for generating 1.8 million tons of solar waste, which is a big concern for India, that 1.8. Solar waste, uh, if we talk about solar waste, in solar waste, uh, glass or aluminium is not a consideration for us. That's not harmful as such. But some solar waste are harmful. And this includes what? This includes chromium, cadmium, sulfur hexafluoride. So, these happens to be harmful for us and sulfur hexafluoride just now we have discussed that it's long lived in atmosphere and has a very adverse impact has been recognized as uh, GHG greenhouse gas under the Kyoto protocol and uh, the source of it is not only solar waste but also uh, electronic devices clear electronic devices some waste will impact yes <clears throat> now let's solve a question paper here See, first question, consider the following statements and select the correct code. In the limelight of depleting ozone layer, UVB is a matter of concern, not UVA or UVC as such. We can say yes, it's a matter of concern because when the ozone layer would be depleting, yes, exact, exactly from human activities, mainly it is coming from electronic component it comes. It's also emitted from solar waste. Now see, first question, consider the following statement and select the correct code. In the limelight of depleting ozone layer, UVB is a matter of concern, not UVA or UVC as such. Is it correct? Second is energy is inversely related to wavelength. Is this correct? Yes, because we can see the UV radiation, their wavelength was decreasing, but they became more and more energetic as such. UVA radiation is not responsible for any damage. They are responsible for damage because aging is a damage. So, this would be wrong. Aging is a damage. So, we can see 1 and 2 would be the correct answer. Now, consider the following statements and select the correct code. 
फर्स्ट स्टेटमेंट सी एफ सीज आर टाइप ऑफ हेलोजिनेटेड हाइड्रोकार्बन विच आर नॉन फ्लेमेबल नॉन टॉक्सिक ऑर्गेनिक मॉलिक्यूल्स सो इज दैट क्लियर फर्स्ट इज करेक्ट और नॉट एंड सेकेंड एट रूम टेम्परेचर सी एफ सीज आर गैसेज अंडर नॉर्मल एटमोस्फेरिक प्रेशर बट दे लिक्विफाई अंडर मॉडेस्ट प्रेशर आई थिंक फर्स्ट इज ऑल्सो करेक्ट एंड सेकेंड इज ऑल्सो करेक्ट क्लियर फर्स्ट इज ऑल्सो करेक्ट एंड सेकेंड इज ऑल्सो करेक्ट बिकॉज सी एफ सीज दे लिक्विफाई अंडर दैट इज यूज इन द कूलिंग प्रोसेस क्लियर सो इन केस ऑफ सेकेंड बोथ द ऑप्शन आर करेक्ट Now consider the third question. Consider the following countries: Chile, New Zealand, Argentina, Colombia. Select the correct code of countries where UV alerts are given. Now tell me. Select the correct code of countries where UV alerts are given. Which is the correct answer? All B, C, or D? Come on, tell me. For answer three, answer three would be what? It would be one, two, and three because Colombia is nowhere present near the Antarctica. Clear? So, if suppose UV alerts would be given in those countries where the polar stratospheric air would be moving outward, clear? So, it would be giving in if it would be given in those countries. So, here we are saying that. One, two, and three would be correct because Colombia is nowhere near Antarctica, so only Chile, New Zealand, and Chile, New Zealand, and Argentina would be the correct answer. During which period of the year ozone depletion would be maximum on Earth? Now we can see it would be maximum on Earth when. Can you tell me the correct answer for fourth one? What is the correct answer for fourth? the correct answer for fourth would be what the correct answer for fourth would be c because ozone depletion takes place maximum where it takes place maximum in antarctica antarctica would be witnessing winter when when we witness summer so spring in antarctica would be responsible for maximum damage to ozone layer we are saying that spring in antarctica would be responsible for maximum damage to ozone layer and that's why the correct answer would be september october clear when spring in antarctica would take place so that's your september october when spring in antarctica antarctica takes place and that is the correct option fine c would be the correct answer for four yes muradi kumar correct one mean that's correct not d as such but it would be c See next question. Which of the following is correct about UV index? Now, correct about UV index is what? It's a daily. That's D. It's a daily forecast of UV exposure. Ah, uh, one minute. One minute. मुझे देखने दो. December sun sun on Capricorn. See. जब कहते हैं ना कि इन अंटार्टिका इन अंटार्टिका स्प्रिंग वुड बी विटनेस्ड व्हेन व्हेन वी हैव आर ऑटम क्लियर सो इन जून जुलाई दे वुड बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर विटनेसिंग विंटर वी वुड बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर विटनेसिंग समर आफ्टर दैट इन सितंबर, अक्टूबर अगस्त स्प्रिंग वुड बी कमिंग टू अंटार्टिका सो इट इट इज दैट टाइम वेन सोलर रेडिएशन रिटर्न बैक टू अंटार्टिका then only ozone depletion would take place and maximum ozone depletion takes place in antarctica so that's why we have selected it now as far as 5 is concerned definitely correct okay 5 is d it's a daily forecast of uv exposure who among the following were awarded nobel prize in the chemistry in 1995 for studying cfc damage to stratosphere and that was roland and molina that's the first option Consider the following statements and select the correct code. Major damage to ozone layer has taken place near Antarctica. 
That's true. Ozone layer is never directly damaged by CFC. That is also true. Methane is also responsible for ozone layer damage. That's also true. So all the three statements of question 7 are correct. Clear? So, and then we can see last, yes, these questions are tough than UPC. Which one of the following UV radiation is obstructed by ozone layer? Can you tell me which one for it? Can you guess? Now, obstructed by ozone layer would be both UV, B and C. As far as question number 8 is concerned, obstructed would be both. Yes, Munu, that's correct. Murari Kumar, that's correct. So, Aditya Jain, correct. Definitely, SD. Because both would be correct. UVC. UVC is reaching the surface of, not reaching the surface of the earth. UVB is reaching the surface of earth in negligible amount. So, largely it is obstructed. Clear? Largely it is obstructed. Now, this is your ozone layer and ozone layer depletion. Let's pick up. Let's pick up a um, set on, set of question on a recent conducted convention on biodiversity. Clear? Recently, now I'll ask you questions, you will have to tell me the answers. And this is, I haven't, I haven't taught you, but this is open because this is based on the current issues. So let's discuss that first of all and then we'll move forward. See, you can see that the Convention of Biodiversity was recently concluded. Now, <clears throat> you have prepared for preliminary examination, you should be able to solve it. Consider the following, the I am putting before you the first question and enlarging it and putting before you the first question. Consider the following statements and select the correct code. Convention on Biodiversity entered into force in the year 1992. Second is signatories to CBD meet every year. The first conference of parties to this convention was held in Bahamas. Now tell me what is the correct option and I have some liquid for me. What is the correct option? What is the correct option? The correct option is D. D, 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 D. D is not the correct option. D means 1 and 2. C. C. Yes, C is the correct option. Definitely C is the correct option. Fine. Only three would be the correct option. Why? Because Convention on Biodiversity entered into force in the year 1993. Clear? 1992 it was signed at Rio de Janeiro, but it entered into force in 1993. And, and the signatories to CBD meet every year. It meet, They meet every two years. When we say COP to CBD, COP to CBD would be conducted every two years. COP for global warming and climate change is conducted every year. UN, the UNFCCC. The first conference of parties to this convention was held in Bahamas. That's true. So only we can see three is correct. One and two are wrong. Clear? One and two are wrong. Now see, let's try the second one. I am enlarging this question. Second question, which article on Convention on Biodiversity deals with traditional knowledge and benefits sharing? Now tell me, what is the answer? Without looking into the Google. 
which article of convention on biodiversity deals with traditional knowledge and uh, benefit sharing tell me b yes that's correct but what are the others doing d that's incorrect c that's incorrect the correct answer is what the correct answer is 8j that's b <coughs> see when you are talking about convention on biodiversity deals with traditional knowledge and benefit sharing now there was a term also which is called as biopiracy biopiracy means if the traditional indigenous knowledge of a society or a community has been used for economic benefit without taking the consent of that society and without paying them adequate compensation then this is called as what this is called as biopiracy cbd convention on biodiversity is responsible for banning biopiracy of any form so biopiracy of any form would be banned by it now this article deals with convention on biodiversity with traditional knowledge and benefit sharing clear although cbd has said that biopiracy of any form should be banned and why biopiracy of any form should be banned because at stake is the interest of what developing nation the interest of developing nation is hampered clear that's why we are saying so now next question consider the following statements and select the correct code the bonn guidelines were adopted at cop6 to the convention on biodiversity convened at netherlands these guidelines on access to genetic resources and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of their utilization tell me what is the answer for 3 what is the answer for 3 now the answer for 3 is what both 1 and 2 both 1 and 2 are correct answer clear none of the above is not correct answer both 1 and 2 are correct answer now tell me the next one with which one of the following cartagena protocol is associated now this is very simple which with of the following the cartagena protocol is associated to protect biological diversity from genetically modified organism for sustainable use of biodiversity access and benefits sharing principle and access the status of biodiversity for which it is used now the correct answer is a to protect biological so just remember that cartagena protocol is for protecting biodiversity from gmos that is genetically modified organisms so that's a which one of the following statement is incorrect nagoya protocol was adopted at cop 10 to the cbd and then that's the first the second statement is nagoya protocol deals with access to genetic resources and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization at the cop 10 in nagoya countries have agreed to a strategic plan for biodiversity containing seven targets called ihc targets ihc targets and ihc is in the region in which nagoya is located now the correct answer is what the correct answer is see i have said what just 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 is just, just one thing see bond guidelines does not mean that the conference would be conducted at bond sometimes what happens that the country which is holding the presidency of for example suppose if you talk about cop 23 COP 23rd of United Nation Framework for Convention on Climate Change it was convened at which place it was convened at Bonn but it declaration is called as Fiji declaration why because the country which is responsible for holding the pres presidency of UNFCC in that country only in that country only the uh, 
सी ओ पी कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑफ पार्टी एनुअल मीट इज कंडक्टेड बट समटाइम्स वॉट हैपन्स दैट फॉर पोलिटिकल रीजन द वेन्यू कैन बी शिफ्टेड सो फीजी इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री वॉज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर होल्डिंग द प्रेसिडेंसिप ऑफ यू एन एफ सी सी बट द डेक्लेशन वॉज कॉल्ड एज फीजी डेक्लेशन द कॉन्फ्रेंस वॉज कंडक्टेड एट बॉन बिकॉज ऑफ पोलिटिकल रीजन्स दैट्स वाई इट्स नॉट एसेंशियल दैट बॉन डेक्लेशन मीन्स दैट इट इज कन्वीन एट बॉन क्लियर ओके नाउ द incorrect answer in this fifth question is tell me what the incorrect answer is what five pankaj yadav yes c shivam also c karan c all these are yes they have said correct because ih targets include 20 targets ih target contains 20 targets and the rn is what rn is not a single target has been achieved clear now consider the following statements and select the correct code the cop 15 to the cbd was convened in two phases yes one was convened at kuming kuming is in china in 2021 and second was convened at montreal montreal is in canada and that was in 2022 so two phases and that was due to covid that it was conducted in two phases there were goals set to ensure that not only natural ecosystem are maintained enhanced or restored sustainably with an overall increase in the area of natural ecosystem by 2050 so certainly natural ecosystem area would be enhancing by 2050 that's correct another goal is to ensure a 10% reduction in extinction rate of species that's also correct clear first of all the natural ecosystem would be enhanced in 2050 and a 10% reduction in extinction rate of species clear so we can see that uh, all the three statements are correct in this and remember these statements for your examination which one of the following statement is incorrect and let's see the statement also and then we'll find out which is incorrect the global biodiversity framework will replace the ihe targets that's correct there are 23 targets in the global biodiversity framework to be achieved by 2030 which includes 30 into 30 targets yes 30 into 30 targets means bring 30% of geographical area by conservation by the year 2030 and this is india is not a member of 30 into 30 targets high ambition coalition is a group of 113 countries aims at bringing 30% of the geographical area under conservation by 2030 also known as 30 into 30 targets so what is incorrect in it tell me what is incorrect in it yes they only conduct yes 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 they only conduct meeting making conventional loose but nothing is happening the syllabus is enhancing definitely now the incorrect answer is definitely all of you good very good all of you they are saying c and c is correct answer because india is a part of 30 into 30 targets clear india is a part of 30 into 30 targets very good fine so let's now start with another topic and let's start start with the topic global warming and climate change clear global warming and climate change the first of all the basics of global warming and climate change and then uh india to pehle aayega i think yes first very good now let's start <laughs> global warming and climate change now we know that the basic concept we know that the greenhouse gases which are present in the atmosphere are responsible for moderating the temperature of earth because in the absence of greenhouse gases the temperature of earth would be minus 20 degree centigrade we are saying that in the absence of greenhouse gases the temperature of earth would be minus 20 degree centigrade if greenhouse gases are not present 
and how they are responsible for moderating. If suppose these are the greenhouse gases, for example, CO2 is greenhouse gas, methane is a greenhouse gas, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. So if these gases are present in atmosphere, they happen to be transparent to incoming solar radiation of a shorter wavelength. So they are transparent to incoming short solar radiation of a shorter wavelength. So transparent means they allow the incoming solar radiation of a shorter wavelength to penetrate into it. And what is the incoming solar radiation of a shorter wavelength? The incoming solar radiation of a shorter wavelength is from 0.2 to 4 micrometer. 0.2 to 4 micrometer. Clear incoming solar radiation of a shorter wavelength. And they absorb the infrared radiation generated from the surface. They absorb the infrared radiation generated from the surface. Clear? Responsible for absorbing the infrared radiation generated from the surface. Now, this infrared radiation which is generated from the surface is of a larger wavelength. So, larger wavelength is what? Larger wavelength is from 4 to 100 micrometer. That's called as larger wavelength. Clear? From 4 to 100 micrometer. And it's not that they are also only absorbing, but they also revert them back. So, when they are reverted back, clear? When they are reverted back, <coughs> now this reverting back of infrared radiation is called as what? It, it is called as what? It's called as, either you can call it counter radiation forcing, radiation forcing, Or you can call it what? You can call it carbon flux. So we can call it counter radiation forcing or we can say that this is carbon flux. Clear? This is carbon flux, counter radiation forcing or carbon flux. And what happens? That uh, this is a natural phenomena through which the temperature of earth is getting moderated natural phenomena through which the temperature of earth is getting moderated. But the problem is what? The problem is rising industrial emission. We will discuss albedo. Just wait, Cristiano, just wait, we will discuss albedo also. The problem is rising industrial emission. And due to rising industrial emission, what is happening? The level of greenhouse gases are enhancing. So when the level of greenhouse gases enhance, more and more absorption of infrared radiation would be taking place. And if more and more absorption of infrared radiation is taking place, then certainly, uh, there uh, these long wavelength radiation absorbed by high clouds or low lying cloud. I'll just explain, just wait, just wait for a few minutes. After I complete global warming, if there is any question, then ask. Just wait, because serious clouds are there. So just let me explain all these things. And from preliminary point of view, I am explaining this. You will get the questions right also. Clear. Generally, what happens? High, high altitude clouds enhance global warming. Low altitude clouds reduce global warming. We'll discuss that. We'll come to it. Because let's move in a sequential manner so that everything is completed. We revise because that's a revision marathon. So let's <laughs> indulge in this marathon and let's complete. Clear? And uh, now see, we'll come to it. Don't worry about this. Now, this is called as, uh, this is how the temperature of earth is getting regulated because if the greenhouse gases is not present in atmosphere, the temperature of earth would be minus 20 degree centigrade. But the concern is what? The concern is <coughs> rising industrial emission. And rising industrial emission is a concern. It means what? It means that, that uh, yes, serious clouds. Cirrus cloud are high ranging cloud, 15 to 45,000 feet they are and they are consisting of large ice crystals. So, they are responsible for absorbing more and more of infrared radiation ready, uh, and less of albedo phenomena. We will come to it. But there are many things associated with that we have to know because questions have been asked on that. So, let us complete that. First of all, let us complete that then we come to that. 
Now we can see that this is called as counter radiation forcing or carbon flux. So the temperature of earth is getting regulated because of this. Now the uh, with rising industrial emission, the level of greenhouse gases are enhancing and they are absorbing more and more of infrared radiation which is leading to enhancement in temperature of earth which is termed as global warming which is termed as global warming and since temperature is related to a number of geographical phenomena, that's why we say that climate change due to global warming is inevitable climate change due to global warming is bound to take place now that's one thing but this is a basic part of global warming may not be asked in examination let's start from where the questions are coming in your examination suppose this is the sun and we can see that this visible yellow part of the sun is referred to as what it is called as photosphere. The temperature of the photosphere is 5500 degree centigrade to 6000 degree centigrade. That's the average temperature of photosphere. The sun is what? The sun is a gaseous mass. They are saying that, that the sun is a gaseous mass. And that's the temperature of sun, 5500 degree uh, centigrade to 6000 degree centigrade. That's the average temperature of the sun. We can see that uh, as far as temperature of the sun is concerned, on the photosphere of the sun, there are, on the photosphere of the sun, there are certain areas where temperature would be certainly low. Clear? You are saying that on the photosphere of the sun, there are certain areas where the temperature would be low. So, these areas where the temperature are, happen to be low are referred to as what? They are referred to as sunspots. So, the first thing about sunspot is temperature is low. But the second thing about sunspot is what? That these are temporary in nature. They are never permanent. Why? Because they would be getting converted into uh, lit up areas after some time. Clear? They are getting converted into lit up areas after some time. And as far as sunspots are concerned, we can see also that they happen to be localized magnetic fields. Localized magnetic fields. So, they are sunspots, they are localized magnetic fields. Now, that's about sunspot. The, it's also said that, that the area where sunspots are present in large numbers. See, the activity of sun is responsible for, the solar activities are responsible for formation of sunspots. And the, there is a sunspot cycle also. Sometimes what happens that the solar activity enhances. So, enhancement of solar activity takes place every 11th year. Now, this phenomena is called as what? This phenomena is called as solar flare. Clear? Solar flare. And uh, sunspots would be what happening? Some sunspots would be getting converted into lit up areas and some lit up areas would be getting converted into sunspots. But that happens and the solar activities are responsible. The area where sunspots are present in large numbers on the sun's photosphere is called as what it is referred to as benevolent monster. What do you say? Benevolent, volent monster where the sunspots are present. Interesting name. Where sunspots are present in large numbers. But when we talk about the atmosphere of the sun, we can see the atmosphere of the sun is called as what? It is referred to as chromosphere. That's the atmosphere of the sun. And the outermost part of the chromosphere is called as what? It is called as corona. Clear? So, we can see atmosphere of the sun is called as chromosphere and the outermost part is called as what it is called as corona, very famous name today. And from the corona, flames erupt. Now, can you tell me what is the name of these flames? What these flames are called as such. So, from the corona, the flames erupt. And these flames are referred to as? No. Corona. From the corona, that's the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere, the flames erupt. Now, they are not called as solar flares. They are called as prominences. They are referred to as what? They are referred to as 
prominences. Look at Gochi along. They have mentioned that these are often 1000 kilometers in length and they are called as what? They are called as prominences, not solar flares. Now what happens that from the sun's photosphere, uh, from the sun, not only light is directed towards the earth, but from the sun, also we can see charged particles would be directed towards the earth. We are saying that from the sun, charged particles would be directed towards the earth. So these charged particles which are directed towards the earth includes protons, includes electrons, includes alpha particles. So we are saying that these includes protons, these includes electrons, these includes alpha particles. Alpha particles are what? Doubly charged helium atom. Helium atom. These are protons, electrons and alpha particles. Now these are directed from sun towards the earth. Clear? These are directed from sun towards the earth. So when they are directed towards the sun towards the earth, this coming of charged particles from sun towards the earth is called as what? It is called as solar wind. Solar wind. And in technical terms, it would be called as what? It would be called as CME. CME stands for what? It stands for coronal mass ejection. Coronal mass ejection because it's coming from where? It's coming from corona. Clear? Then we can see that if you look at the magnetic field of the earth, the magnetic field of the earth has two imaginary ring-shaped welds. Now, these two imaginary ring-shaped belts of the Earth's magnetic field is referred to as what? It is called as Van Allen belt. That's called as what? It's called as Van Allen belt. So, the charged particles which is coming from the sun towards the Earth would be first of all getting accumulated in the Van Allen belt. That is proton, electron plus alpha particles alpha particles. So, they are getting first of all accumulated in the Van Allen belt and as the earth rotates, as the earth rotates, these charged particles would be pushed towards the poles. So, when these charged particles are pushed towards the poles, they would be responsible for striking, they would be responsible for striking CME's solar storm. They are responsible for striking different kinds of gases which are present in the atmosphere of the earth. So the different kinds of gases, there are two main gases which are present in the atmosphere of the earth. One is oxygen and second is nitrogen. So if suppose they are responsible for striking nitrogen, we can see that if they strike nitrogen, blue and purple color would be generated. And if they strike oxygen, green and red color would be generated. So, when they are striking different kinds of gases present in the atmosphere of the earth, the, we can see that uh, present in the atmosphere of the earth, then colorful streaks of radiation would be generated. Clear? They would be responsible for generating colorful streaks of radiation. So, colorful streaks of radiation appear to be in the form of different frequencies. So, we can see when they are striking the different kinds of radiation, they generate different frequency levels. Now, these frequency levels would be visualized to us in the form of colorful streaks of radiation, which is called as what? Which is called as auroras. Clear? So, at the North Pole, it would be called as what? It would be called as aurora borealis. And at the South Pole, it would be called as what? It is, it is called as Aurora Australis. So, one at the North Pole, Aurora Borealis. And at the South Pole, it is called as Aurora Australis. And remember then, when nitrogen would be striked by these, blue and purple radiation would be developed. When oxygen is striked, green and red radiation would be developing. So, that's called as Aurora colorful streaks of radiation. Clear? Now, what happens as an observation we have seen that every 11th year, 
this solar activities enhances and when solar activities enhances every 11th year this process which takes place on the photosphere of the sun is referred to as what it is called as solar flare so see what is solar flare this process which takes place on the photosphere of the sun no solar wind is another thing solar wind is called as char charge particles which is directed towards the earth solar flare is due to enhancement of solar activities on the photosphere of the sun clear now the, this is called as solar flare now solar flare would be responsible for what it would be responsible for pushing more and more charge particles towards the earth so when more and more charge particles would be pushed towards the earth when more and more of charged particles are pushed towards the earth what will happen the intensity of aurora would be magnifying so when the intensity of aurora magnifies this phenomena is called as what intensity of magnifying of intensity of aurora this phenomena is called as what this phenomena is called as solar tsunami so solar tsunami would be witnessed where solar tsunami would be witnessed in north pole and south pole and in upsc question they have tried to confuse you that enhancement in the intensity of auroras would be responsible for tsunami in the equatorial area certainly not clear certainly not because enhancement of auroras won't be taking place in the equatorial area because of this and solar tsunami is responsible for what the north pole and near the other south pole they are responsible for what they are responsible for failure of electricity grid because these are charged particles they are also responsible for what they are also responsible for communication network failure because these are charged particles and if suppose you are conducting research near the north pole or the south pole your research would be also getting disrupted because these are charged particles clear your research is also getting disrupted because these are charged particles fine so that's called as solar tsunami that's called as solar flare that's called as solar wind cme prominences etc clear but i haven't covered up i have just started my discussions so are you ready for today's revision class bachcho are you ready for today's revision class we'll continue to in midnight 2:30 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock tell me or 6 o'clock in the morning and then we'll go to sleep so what is your program can we do so with all different kinds of test in between the test would be running also just now we have solved the test on cbd after some times we'll solve the test on cop27 also and try to solve as many question as we can fine 6 am who is going to stay <laughs> till 6 am हाँ जब तक आप हो वेरी गुड वेरी गुड जब तक मैं हूँ आप बायोटेक्नोलॉजी भी खत्म करेंगे बायोटेक्नोलॉजी अर्धरात्रि में शुरू करेंगे बच्चों <laughs> और उसे कंप्लीट करके ही छोड़ूंगा मैं फाइन एंड एंड यस 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 ओके चलो आज रिवाइज करो पूरा लेट्स रिवाइज इट वंस मोर वट यू हैव स्टडीड एंड वट आई हैव फ्रॉम माई परस्पेक्टिव लेट्स इंक्लूड दैट इन योर स्टडी क्लियर चलो आज करते हैं Now this is one thing, but the second thing is what that this is suppose the sun and this is the earth, and this is the amount of solar radiation which is directed from the sun towards the earth. Now if this amount of solar radiation which is directed from the sun towards the earth reaches the earth in total, total means in exact manner, जिस तरह से निकल रहा है उसी तरह से पहुँचे. If it reaches the earth in total, the earth won't be a hospitable place to live in. clear the earth won't be a hospitable place to live in and that's why what happens because the earth would be very hot that's why what happens that one third of the solar radiation which is coming towards the earth would be reflected back so the reflecting back of one third of the solar radiation
थैंक यू सो मच पंकज थैंक यू सो मच अभी है बच्चा वो बच्चों अभी वी हैव स्टार्टेड एंड देखो उसमें फिर वी हैव टू कंप्लीट ऑल द टर्म्स फॉर एग्जांपल व्हाट इज क्लाइमेट जस्टिस व्हाट इज कार्बन जस्टिस व्हाट इज रेड प्लस व्हाट इज योर पंचामृत व्हाट इज क्लाइमेट एम्बिशन कोलिशन ऑल दीज टर्म्स अप टिल सी ओ पी ट्वेंटी सेवन वी हैव टू कम्प्लीट सम टर्म्स ऑफ सी ओ पी ट्वेंटी सेवन वी हैव वी वुड बी कम्प्लीटिंग थ्रू टेस्ट एंड सम इन सम इन द क्लास इट सेल्फ क्लियर सो लेट्स कनेक्ट ऑल दोज थिंग्स इंटीग्रेट बट सो जैसे ही तुम सुबह मॉर्निंग में जगोगे यू वुड बी हैविंग द नॉलेज ऑफ अ नंबर ऑफ इन्वायरमेंटल फैक्ट्स बाई मॉर्निंग क्लियर इसलिए करना है बच्चों so one third of the solar radiation is reflected back now the reflecting back of one third of solar radiation is referred to as what it is referred to as albedo phenomena clear we are saying that the reflecting back of one third of solar radiation is referred to as what it is referred to as albedo phenomena thank you so much thank you so much civil simplified okay <coughs> The reflecting back is called as albedo phenomena. In albedo phenomena, we can see sixty percent contribution is made by what? Sixty percent contribution is made by the ice cover. Ice cover means permafrost region. Thirty percent contribution is made by clouds. So we can see the two main agencies which are responsible for conducting albedo phenomena is what? It is the ice cover and it is the clouds. two main agencies which are responsible for conducting uh, albedo phenomena is your ice cover and also the clouds clear 60% now see what you have to study here we know that 30% is performed by clouds now there's a term which is called as cryosphere cryosphere means cryo means ice so cryosphere is that part of biosphere which is covered Yes. 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 Wild prints. Now see, we are talking about what <coughs> that thirty percent of albedo phenomena is performed by clouds. Now the. factors which are responsible for affecting albedo phenomena includes the nature of surface nature of surface whether it is smooth or whether it is coursed which also includes the uh, angle at which angle at which it strikes the radiation strikes it also includes the color of the surface color of the surface so these are factors which are responsible for influencing albedo phenomena but when we talk about cryosphere cryosphere is that part of the biosphere which is covered with ice ab dekho ek question main tumhe de raha hu aur uske baad ye discuss karte hain i am saying that consider the following statements and select the correct code the first statement is melting of polar ice polar ice would further aggravate would further aggravate global warming aggravate global warming clear second is melting of polar ice melting of permafrost let's change the words melting of permafrost would result in would result in absorption of absorption of methane and co2 and third melting of permafrost melting of permafrost permafrost 
melting of permafrost would result in result in mercury contamination of the ocean mercury contamination of oceans yes let me put it like this and i have given you the option 1 2 3 b is 1 2 c is 1 3 clear and 4 is what only 1 tell me what is the answer and then we'll connect all these things with whatever we are going to study प्रोमिनेंसिस का एग्जैक्ट मीनिंग क्या है प्रोमिनेंसिस एग्जैक्ट मीनिंग इज द फ्लेम्स व्हिच इरप्ट फ्रॉम द करोना व्हिच आर 1000 किलोमीटर्स समटाइम्स इन लेंथ सम से इट इज सी सम से इट इज बी ओके all some say it is all no it's not all let's study that <coughs> let's study that and make it very clear that what is a correct answer not at all d clear is the answer is c the answer is c this statement is correct first and this statement is correct so the answer is c two is wrong definitely two is wrong but let's study this that what exactly is the meaning now when we are talking about cryosphere cryosphere is that part of the biosphere which is covered with ice so is that part of the biosphere which is covered with ice so it means the polar ice would be a part of cryosphere the mountain glacier would be a part of cryosphere and cryosphere includes the permafrost region also so permafrost region we say that this region is covered with ice and this is a region where even the summer solar radiation is unable to thaw unable to melt the frozen soil or we can say permafrost region is a region where even the uh, temperature of this area does not enhance beyond the freezing point for two consecutive years two consecutive years now this called as permafrost the formation of permafrost would be taking place where formation of permafrost takes place at high altitude that is polar region and at high uh, mountain glacier and that high altitude that is polar region very good now we are saying that we have studied in a stereotype manner that that when uh, global warming takes place polar ice melts polar ice melts sea level rises sea level rises some of these small islands like maldives can be inundated clear thank you so much samiksha thank you so much kamal fine so we would be acha me mujhe explain kar le to mujhe explain kar do sab bas sari cheez samajh jaoge now we are saying that melting of polar ice is responsible for what it is responsible for rising sea level clear but melting of polar ice also means that the permafrost is getting reduced and if permafrost is getting reduced we can also say that that if permafrost is getting reduced it means that that uh, the albedo phenomena performed by permafrost is also getting reduced and if albedo phenomena performed by permafrost is also getting reduced this is enabling the solar radiation to reach the surface of the earth in greater abundance and would be contributing more and more into global warming that's one connect the second connect is what the second connect is that as far as permafrost region is concerned in permafrost region we have discussed that gas hydrates are present so gas hydrates are present at extremely low temperature like permafrost region or at low temperature in high pressure like oceanic floor clear so formation of gas hydrates so when permafrost region is melting gas hydrates would be disassociating 
and this association of gas hydrates would be responsible for emission of methane and this methane would be emitted into the atmosphere and this would be responsible for what? This would be responsible for enhancing global warming further because it's a greenhouse gas. Remember the Holocene period which you have studied the history or geography. Holocene period is Shale gas, bachon, dusra chija. shale gas is the ga uh, gas which is present in sedimentary rock and that is sedimentary rock and shale is a sedimentary rock. So, we extract shale gas through method which is called as hydraulic, hydraulic fracking. But the second thing is what? The third thing is what? That during the Holocene period, during the Ice Age, large amount of CO2 was absorbed in the formation of cryosphere that is in the formation of permafrost region. So, when it melts, it would be emitted, it would be released and CO2 would be released and this would be further aggravating global warming, clear, further aggravating global warming. And you can see fourth is what, that sometimes you would have seen pictures of animals or vegetation being trapped in permafrost region, which is unveiled due to its melting. So, when it is unveiled due to its melting, it would be uh, undergoing uh, decomposition. If aerobic decomposition takes place, then CO2 would be released. If anaerobic decomposition takes place, then methane would be released. Here, <coughs> then methane would be released. So, in the all the four connects in above, we can see that we can see that global warming is itself responsible for enhancing its impact. So, if global warming is itself responsible for enhancing its impact, this phenomena is called as what? If global warming is itself responsible for enhancing its impact, this phenomena is called as what? It is called as feedback effect. It's called as what? Feedback effect. is referred to as feedback effect. Clear? Fine. And also we can see, now next, next, just, just wait, that the enhanced rate at which CO2 or methane would be released from the permafrost region, the enhanced rate at which CO2 and methane would be released from the permafrost region. Now, this enhanced rate would be called as what? It would be called as carbon bombing or carbon bomb. So, if a question is asked on carbon bombs, do not write that this is a matter of internal security of India as the Al-Qaeda, Jaise, Muhammad, etc. have responsible for developing it but or Pakistan is responsible for developing it, but it is nothing connected to the internal security of India. It is taking place from permafrost region, clear permafrost region. Now, carbon bombing, yes, 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 carbon bombing. <laughs> now, See, increase in water level would lead to greater absorption of CO2, but also we can see increase in water level would result in inundation of the coastal area, first of all. That is a major concern for us. And water level in CO2, uh, if suppose we are talking about absorption of CO2, which is less absorbed when comparison to the inundation that it would be responsible for. Clear? I think that is clear. But see, one thing more, the last part of it. Now, when you talk about mercury contamination, we know that mercury contamination took place in 1952 in Japan and was responsible for contamination of the fishes. People ate those fishes, they fell sick and Minamata disease was reported. In a stereotyped manner, we have learned this from our school days. Clear? Fine. Now, mercury, for long, we believe that mercury is present in ocean as a natural source. The natural source of mercury is nothing but oceans. That, that was a belief that we had earlier. But the perception has changed. Now, today we believe that the mercury which is present in the ocean is not present naturally, but it is the same mercury which was present in the atmosphere, which has been absorbed in the oceans. And how it is coming to the oceans? 
because there is a mercury which is called as legacy mercury legacy mercury means the anthropogenic activities of the past that is when industrialization started so when industrialization started and there were anthropogenic activities earlier now these anthropogenic activities due to this the mercury was present in the atmosphere whatever anthropogenic activities we conducted during that period due to which mercury was present in the atmosphere alex mean again मरकरी वॉज प्रेजेंट इन एटमोसफियर देखो कार्बन बॉम्बिंग का मतलब है क्या चार तरह से हमने बताया है कि कैसे सी ओ टू मीथेन एमिट होता है परमाफ्रोस्ट रीजन से पहले कैसे बताया है फर्स्ट इज दैट होलोसिन पीरियड में सी ओ टू का ऑब्जॉर्बशन हुआ था परमाफ्रोस्ट रीजन में क्राइसफेयर में तो अगर वो मेल्ट करता है तो सी ओ टू निकलेंगे दूसरा मैंने बताया कि गैस हाइड्रेट्स का रीजन है गैस हाइड्रेट मेल्टिंग के कारण टूटेंगे तो मिथेन निकलेगा तीसरा मैंने बताया आपको कि यहाँ पर ऑर्गेनिक मैटर ट्रैप्ड हैं जैसे डेड प्लांट्स एनिमल्स सेंचुरी से इट इट इज अंडर द आइस कवर सो मेल्टिंग वुड बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर व्हाट एक्सपोजिंग ऑफ दिस काइंड ऑफ ऑर्गेनिक मैटर क्लियर एक्सपोजिंग ऑफ दिस काइंड ऑफ ऑर्गेनिक मैटर एंड दिस ऑर्गेनिक मैटर वुड बी एक्सपोज clear this organic matter would be exposed and when organic matter would be exposed it would be decomposed by what it would be decomposed by uh, the if aerobic decomposition takes place co2 would be released if anaerobic decomposition takes place methane would be released so we are saying that the enhanced rate man lo jis dar se jis gati se methane ya co2 permafrost region se nikalta hai ya cryosphere region se nikalta hai उस गति को हम लोग कहते हैं कार्बन बॉम्बिंग क्योंकि निकल क्या रहा है दोनों कार्बन कंपाउंड्स सो दैट इज कॉल्ड एस कार्बन बॉम्बिंग आई होप दैट्स क्लियर बट एज फार एज मरकरी कंटेमिनेशन इज कंसर्न वी कैन सी दैट मरकरी व्हिच इज प्रेजेंट इन द ओशन इज द सेम मरकरी व्हिच वाज प्रेजेंट इन एटमोस्फेयर एंड दिस मरकरी विच वॉज प्रेजेंट इन एटमोस्फेयर वॉज कॉल्ड एज वॉट इट वॉज कॉल्ड एज लीगेसी मरकरी लीगेसी मरकरी इज ड्यू टू द एंथ्रोपोजेनिक एक्टिविटीज ऑफ द पास्ट तो जो जो एटमॉस्फेयर में मरकरी प्रेजेंट है उसको हम लोग कहते हैं लिगेसी मरकरी और वो ड्यू टू द एंथ्रोपोजेनिक एक्टिविटीज ऑफ द पास्ट इसके कारण प्रेजेंट है बट वॉट हैपन वॉज दैट मरकरी फ्रॉम एटमोसफेयर वॉज नॉट ओनली एब्जॉर्ब इन द सॉइल बट मरकरी फ्रॉम एटमोसफेयर वॉज नॉट ओनली एब्जॉर्ब इन द सॉइल बट मरकरी फ्रॉम एटमोसफेयर वॉज ऑल्सो एब्जॉर्ब इन द परमाफ्रॉस्ट रीजन so when it was absorbed in the soil what happened was that the rivers eroded it and made it way to the ocean so the mercury which is present in the ocean is nothing but legacy mercury lekin dekho ek kya hua ki na keval wo soil mein absorb hua tha balki permafrost region mein bhi absorb hua so when it, it has been absorbed in the permafrost region we can see that when polar ice melts mercury would be released and this mercury which is released would be carried by the oceanic currents not oceanic currents perennial rivers from the permafrost region to the ocean now this would be responsible for enhancing the mercury contamination of the ocean clear isse kya hoga mercury contamination ocean ka badh jayega this would be responsible for enhancing the mercury contamination of the ocean and the coastal area of the ocean is only 0.2% of the entire ocean but this would be receiving more than 25% 25 to 30% of mercury deposition that's one fact this coastal area of the ocean you know is an area of enhanced ecological productivity this would be hampered coastal area degradation would take place due to mercury contamination and it's not that that there are also riverine contributors of mercury in the ocean kai rivers hain jo mercury ke contribution ho yes it would be having an effect on corals also now there are riverine contributors of mercury in the ocean there are three big riverine contributors of mercury in the ocean which includes amazon 22% which includes ganga 11% which includes yangtze 4.9% so these are big contributors of mercury in the oceans clear big contributors of mercury in the oceans <clears throat> now this is called as mercury but 
mercury is also present in electronic waste in the computer monitors mercury is present mercury is not only present in the electronic waste mercury is also present where it is present in the waste of coal fired thermal plant and if we talk about the waste of coal fired thermal plant we can see that the mercury present in the waste of coal fired thermal plant is many times more than that present in cfl so what needs to be done is to curtail the mercury content of waste in coal fired thermal plants we can use a gas and that gas is bromine so bromine is damaging to ozone layer but bromine can be used for reducing the mercury content of thermal plant waste now how many questions are there see questions see questions is me all these are nothing but questions fine i hope that's clear i hope that's clear now next thing that you have to cover up is the significance of clouds in global warming significance of clouds in global warming yes we are great culture also <laughs> also worships mercury siblings that's great fine 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 but this is about mercury contempt and you can get questions on this easily fine now let's understand the contribution of uh, clouds in global warming now we know that clouds are responsible for performing 30% of albedo phenomena very good so if they have performed 30% of albedo phenomena it means more of cloud cover more cloud cover cloud cover if it enhances then global warming would be reduced clear that's first conclusion that we can draw but there is a type of cloud which is called as what which is called as cirrus cloud clear and cirrus cloud are what cirrus clouds are high ranging cloud man lo ki high ranging clouds hai cirrus clouds so you can see cirrus clouds are generally uh, present at a height of 14000 to 15000 feet so it's a high ranging clouds in stratosphere there is only one cloud and that is what polar stratospheric clouds which we have studied but below that the high ranging clouds are cirrus clouds now cirrus clouds are responsible for enhancing the adverse impact we say clouds in general reduce the adverse impact of global warming but cirrus clouds are responsible for enhancing the adverse impact of global warming but how we can see that cirrus clouds have large ice crystals bade bade ice crystals is me large and they are responsible for absorbing the infrared radiation which is generated from the surface they absorb it they are also responsible for reverting it back that is carbon flux or we can say what is called as counter radiation forcing so cirrus clouds are responsible for absorbing the infrared radiation generated from the surface <coughs> as they have large ice crystals and they are also responsible for reverting them back clear reverting them back which is called as what which is called as counter radiation forcing counter radiation forcing radiation bank clear and uh, they are responsible for performing less of albedo phenomena this is less and this is more this is more so absorption of infrared radiation is more production of counter radiation forcing is more absorption of uh, uh, albedo phenomena is less so you can see they are responsible for enhancing the adverse impact of global warming on the other hand if we talk about the low lying clouds low lying clouds would be having small ice crystals small ice crystals sense me chote chote ice crystals and small ice crystals they behave differently why because small ice crystals would be responsible for reflecting more that is more of albedo phenomena would be performed see 
if i say that this is the ice cover large ice cover that i have my palm this now this is responsible for performing albedo phenomena but if this breaks into small ice crystals like this the surface area for performing albedo phenomena would be enhancing clear so in this case the surface area is more in this case the surface area is less so you can see this would be performing more of albedo phenomena and it would be absorbing less of infrared radiation it would be producing less of counter radiation forcing so you can see it is absorbing less of counter uh, performing less of counter radiation forcing less of absorption of infrared radiation so as far as this is concerned low lying clouds are concerned low lying clouds are responsible for enhancing the adverse impact of global warming but clouds in general that is clouds in general uh, uh, clouds that is called as cirrus clouds would be responsible for enhancing the adverse impact of global warming which are high ranging clouds is that clear yes broken mirror reflect more light now <clears throat> this is the same thing but now one thing is that in the year 2010 we can see that the former isro chairman mr urav he was responsible for conducting a research and he came to the conclusion the conclusion was what the conclusion was see ice crystals reflect more of insulation that's correct but if this is a ice crystal this stylus this is a big ice crystal this much is the surface area but if you break them into small 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 pieces the surface area would be enhancing so small ice cloud uh, the low lying clouds have smaller ice crystals surface area for albedo is more cirrus clouds have large ice crystals the surface area is less what is in that clear fine now in the year 2010 we can see the former isro chairman mr dr u r rao he was responsible for publishing a study and he came to the conclusion that in the last 150 years of time the solar activities have reduced and since the solar activities have reduced the amount of solar radiation uh, the intensity of solar radiation is less the intensity of solar radiation is less so if the intensity of solar radiation is less it is intensity which is responsible for evaporation of water it is intensity which is responsible for formation of clouds so if we are saying that the intensity is less it means that the cloud cover over the earth have reduced so the observation made by dr u r rao was that in the last 150 years of time the cloud cover over the earth have reduced and this has reduced what this has reduced the intensity of solar radiation because of which we can see because of which we can see that uh, the solar activity uh, the formation of cloud is less and the cloud cover over the earth has reduced now this reduces the albedo phenomena and because of which what happens is that the incoming solar radiation would be striking the surface of the earth in greater abundance and this would be responsible for aggravating the influence of global warming clear aggravating the influence of global warming but also we can see that an agreement was signed in 2017 and this agreement was signed between uh, three countries one is india second is china and third is us and these three countries were signing an agreement for the purpose of what for the purpose of pumping sulfate particles into atmosphere so if you pump sulfate particles into atmosphere what will happen more and more of cloud cover would be seen clear if you are responsible for pumping sulfate particles in atmosphere more and more of cloud cover would be seen and not only this would be seen <coughs> but we can see that if more and more cloud cover would be seen then it would be responsible for reducing the adverse impact of global warming so the three nations signed an agreement for pumping sulfate particles in atmosphere so that the more and more of cloud cover would be seen and this cloud cover would be reducing the adverse impact of global warming clear
reducing the adverse impact of global warming. Also, the agreement said that that they would be developing technology for the purpose of thinning of cirrus clouds. Clear? They would be developing a technology and this technology would be used for the purpose of thinning of cirrus clouds. So they are they were responsible, this agreement was mainly responsible for reducing the adverse impact of global warming. Clear? But there is also a type of cirrus cloud and this cirrus cloud type is called as what? It is called as contrail cirrus. This type of cirrus cloud is called as what? It is called as contrail cirrus. Contrail cirrus means that this cirrus cloud is developed how? When it is developed from the exhaust of aeroplanes. Suppose we are saying contrail cirrus. Contrail cirrus cloud is developed from the exhaust of aeroplanes. exhaust of aeroplanes. So, the exhaust of aeroplanes consists of tiny particles. These tiny particles act as a seed nuclei and these seed nuclei is responsible for what? Cloud seeding and the type of cirrus cloud which is developed due to this is called as what? It is referred to as contrail cirrus. So, this also aggravates the influence of global warming in the same manner that cirrus clouds are responsible for doing. Clear? Fine. I think that yes, mirror effect, good. Idealized crystals will be reflecting more. Yes, yes, got it, sir. Become big after broken. Yes cloud seeding. Now, that is about significance of clouds in global warming. But there are many topics which needs to be covered up, small, small topics and let us condense it to cover it because it cannot be covered in that much uh, time. But whatever, let us have a session for that and let us try to cover up as much topics as we can. Clear? Now, let us have a test first of all and then go forward. Let us have a test. Just wait for a few minutes and then we will have test. We will complete some topic so that all these topics, some topics needs to be covered up to attend these tests. So, first of all, let us cover up one, at least one more topic and then we can attend these tests. Clear? Yes. Let us cover up one more topic and then we will attend this test. Now, the next topic. See, today's session, I will try to complete as much as we can. We cannot have a more longer session than this. But as much as I know, I will speak about all those things. Clear? So, let us have first of all, first of all, let us complete this session. Now, see, the next topic that we are going to, we are going to cover up is called as carbon credit. <coughs> It's called as what? It's called as carbon credit. And also carbon trading. Carbon credit and carbon trading. Clear? We can see that the Kyoto Protocol was signed. Proto Protocol was signed in 1997. Clear? See, I will take a break at uh, 8.30, we will take a break. Clear? 8.30, 8.45, we will take a break after completing this. And uh, then we will again sit, we will take the dinner and then we will again sit. For half an hour, we will have a break.
is I am taking warm water now. This is warm water. And uh, I'll have I'll have something, but I'll just let's complete this topic that is carbon credit and carbon trading, and then we'll have a break of uh, half an hour to have the dinner. Then we continue. Fine. Now, that's called as carbon credit and carbon trading. Now we know that that Kyoto Protocol was signed in 1997. And under the Kyoto Protocol, we can see the developed nations, the developed nations were asked to reduce their carbon emissions, their carbon emissions by 5.2%. So that should be reduced. The carbon emissions by developed nations should be reduced by 5.2%. That was Kyoto Protocol. But from where? From where the carbon emissions should be reduced? So the base year for this purpose was base year, where from where the emissions would be counted, would be the year 1990. So from the year 1990, we would be responsible for reducing carbon emission. <coughs> Clear? So from the year 1990. We would be responsible for reducing carbon emissions. Uh, they would be responsible for from the year 1990, the emissions would be counted and then 5.2 percent needs to be. Now, the Kyoto Protocol came into force in the year 2005. And the first phase of Kyoto Protocol was 2005 to 2012. But if suppose there were two drawbacks of this protocol, the first drawback of this protocol was what? that US, which was the biggest emitter at that time, was not a signatory to this protocol. Clear? US, which was the biggest emitter at that time, was not a signatory to this protocol. And the second problem was what? That developing nations like India, developing nations like India and China, although signed it, they signed it, but they were never asked to reduce their emissions. Because in the process of industrialization, they were considered as late industrializers. Clear? So, they were, never, they were never asked to reduce their emissions because in the process of industrialization, they were considered as late industrializers. Fine. So, this was done. Very good. Now, we can see that this benefit came to India and China. But when we are talking about that, suppose you are from developed nation. And on you, the binding obligation is there to reduce your carbon emission. What you would be responsible for doing? First of all, you would be responsible for, first of all, you would be responsible for establishing carbon reduction project. Clear? You would be responsible for establishing carbon reduction project. And when we are talking about carbon reduction project, carbon reduction projects are those projects which are based on non-conventional sources, renewable energy, solar energy, tidal energy, clear. So these are uh, carbon reduction projects which uh, needs to be established. And uh, if suppose you establish a carbon reduction project, certainly you would be earning, uh, you would be reducing emission. And for reducing emission, a certificate would be allocated to you. Now this certificate which is allocated for reducing emission is called as what? It is called as carbon credit. Clear? Dekho maan lo, ki tumne emissions ko kam kiya. Carbon reduction project laga kar. To jab emissions ko aapne kam kiya carbon reduction project ko laga kar, to this, there would be a certificate given to you. Ek certificate tumhe diya jayega. Now this certificate would be called as what? This certificate would be called as nothing but carbon credit. And certainly, this means that I am doing a little bit, you are doing a little bit, you are getting a little bit, you are getting a little bit, you are getting a little bit. There should be a quantification of this. It should be quantified as such. So the quantification of this is what? That uh, if suppose one metric ton of CO2 is reduced, maan lo, ek metric ton CO2 reduce karte hain, to ek certificate diya jayega. Ek certificate diya jayega. Clear? Credit matlab certificate. Now this certificate would be given by whom? It would be given by UNFCCC. 
that is United Nation Framework for Convention on Climate Change. So, this certificate would be given by UNFCCC and this certificate would be called as what? It is called as carbon credit. Now, this is also referred to as what? It is also referred to as certified emission reductions. Certified emission reduction means certificate for emissions reduction. So, that is what called as carbon credit. Clear? Yes, suppose Delhi Metro. Delhi Metro. Now, when Delhi Metro was established or any other metro was established, now we can see lakhs and lakhs of people commute through Delhi Metro. They are commuting through Delhi Metro. So, if suppose Delhi Metro was not established, they would have commuted through transport vehicles. So, the emissions would have enhanced. So, by establishment of Delhi Metro, the emissions have reduced. So, Delhi Metro would be eligible for carbon credit. Clear? It would be eligible for carbon credit. So, you can see that as far as Kyoto Protocol is concerned, under the Kyoto Protocol, there are <coughs> There are three mechanisms under carbon credit and carbon trading. Now, the first mechanism under carbon credit and carbon trading is called as what? It is referred to as joint implementation. Deekho, pehla mechanism. The first mechanism is called as what? Joint implementation. Implementation. Now, what does that mean? It means that that uh, in this case, suppose on one side is a developed nation. And the developed nation has to establish carbon reduction project. But is unable to do so. Unable to do so. Why? Because there is paucity of space, shortage of space. Ka, or there may be other reasons also. So what this developed nation does, develop, this developed nation is responsible for transferring its carbon reduction project to another developed nation. This developed nation is responsible for transferring the carbon reduction project to another developed nation. The first nation is responsible for maintaining it. The second nation is uh, the first nation is responsible for establishing it. That is, investment is made by the first nation. The second nation is responsible for maintaining it maintaining it. So, both the nations are involved. It is a carbon reduction project. So, carbon credits would be earned for this purpose. But these carbon credits which are earned by this project would be equally shared by both the nations. Clear? So, we are saying that this is a carbon reduction project. So, the credits would be earned. But these credits which are earned would be equally shared by both the nations. Clear? would be equally shared by both the nation. So, this mechanism of establishment of carbon reduction project and equally sharing by both the nation would be called as what? It would be called as joint implementation. Clear? It would be referred to as joint implementation. The second mechanism is called as what? It is called as clean development mechanism. It's called as clean development mechanism. On one side, we have the developed nation. And on the other side, we have developing nation. So, we can see that in this case, the transference of a CRP by its carbon reduction project would be from a developed nation to a developing nation. Clear? The transference of a carbon reduction project would be from a developed nation to a developing nation. The developed nation would be responsible for establishing it. And developing nation is responsible for maintaining it. But then the carbon credits which are earned from the carbon reduction projects would be only going to the developed nation. Clear? And why only going to the developed nation? Because for developing nation, carbon credits are not important. For developed nation, what is important? For developed nation, what is important is money. For developed nation, what is important is technology because it wants to develop. And it's not 
the credits are not important for developing nation because developing nation under the Kyoto Protocol was not under binding obligation to reduce its carbon emissions as such. And since they have not emitted, they had additional carbon credits also. So, surplus carbon credit was present with them, clear. But what is the benefit that they are getting? The benefit that they are getting is, although the credits are going to the developed nation, the developed nation would be responsible for supplying developing nation two things. One is technology and second is money. So, they are supplying developing nations with two things, technology and money, clear. And that's why <coughs> in the case of uh, clean development mechanism, who is getting more benefited? The developing nation is getting more benefited because developing nation is getting better environment. Developing nation is getting not only better environment, but also not only better environment, but also developing nation is getting uh, technology and also money. The threefold benefit goes to the developing nation as such. Clear threefold benefit goes to the developing nation. What is the use of these carbon credits? See, the use of this carbon credits is what? That developing nation can sow it. These carbon credits would be counted under the account of developed nation for reducing the emissions by 5.2 percent. Clear? Clear? Clear, Rishika? Fine. Now, this is the use of carbon credit. And this is now since it is called as clean development mechanism why because the developing nation is getting a clean technology a clean technology for itself that's why it is called as clean development mechanism but see if this was the benchmark which was set earlier this is the benchmark which was set earlier that crossing this benchmark that binding obligation would be imposed on you to reduce your emissions but then we say that the developing nation's emission is here. Clear? Here is developing nation's emission. Now, this difference of the benchmark set and the emissions of developing nation would be called as what? This would be called as surplus carbon credit for developing nation. Clear? Surplus carbon credit for developing nation, which the nation can sell in the international market to fetch money, to earn money, who would be the buyers? The buyers would be the developed nations, clear, developed nation. Now, this mechanism is called as what? This mechanism is called as international, international emission trading. This mechanism is called as international emission trading, international emission trading. Is that clear? Fine. International emission trading. Clear. So, this is called as international emission trading. Now, the thank you so much, Amit Kumar, also. Now, we can see that trading took place at two agencies. One was Chicago Climate Exchange, where trading took place. And second agency where trading took place was European Climate Exchange. European Climate Exchange. And European Climate Exchange is present where? It is present in London. So, we can see Chicago Climate Exchange and also European Climate Exchange which is present in London. Clear? Fine. But we can see recently the prices of carbon credits have declined. And it's not only due to the COVID pandemic that the prices of carbon credits have declined, but the prices of carbon credit, but the prices of carbon credits have declined. Thank you so much, Amit Kumar. 
द प्राइस ऑफ कार्बन क्रेडिट्स हैव डिक्लाइन वाई द प्राइस ऑफ कार्बन क्रेडिट्स हैव डिक्लाइन बिकॉज द वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड इज सफरिंग फ्रॉम इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस एंड द कंपनीज ऑफ द वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड आर नॉट प्रोड्यूसिंग इनाफ टू बी इन रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ मोर एंड मोर ऑफ कार्बन क्रेडिट इफ सपोज दे वुड हैव प्रोड्यूस्ड मोर देन द रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ कार्बन क्रेडिट वुड हैव बिन मोर clear so they are not producing enough to be in a requirement of more and more of carbon credit and since the demand of carbon credit credit is less that's why we say that the prices of carbon credits have declined that's why we say that the prices i'll take a break i'll take a break at exactly 8:45 let's complete this fine i'll take a break as exactly 8:45 then we'll take we'll have a dinner half an hour dinner and then we'll resume clear so that's uh, called as what uh, we can say international emission trading and the prices of carbon credits have declined recently not only because of the covid pandemic because of the western world is suffering from economic crisis so the companies of the western world are not producing enough to be in requirement of more and more of carbon credit if suppose you uh, the requirement of carbon credit would have been more if the requirement of carbon credit would have been more abhishek bacche kitna time lagega aaj thoda sa mehnat kar lo beta kal dekho to kal tumhe bahut cheez difference nazar aayega khud environment mein tumhe preparation ke बस आज थोड़ा मैं अभी नहीं बोलूंगा कितनी देर लगेंगे क्योंकि मैं सेलेक्ट कर रहा हूं टॉपिक इसमें बहुत जगह मैंने छोड़ा है बहुत चीजों को और उसके बाद ये देख रहा हूं कि क्या इंपॉर्टेंट है प्रिमिनरी एग्जामिनेशन के लिए वो सिर्फ सेलेक्ट करके बोलते जा रहा हूं क्लियर क्योंकि ये तो अथाह है आई हैव वन हंड्रेड ईयर्स ऑफ क्लास इन माई हेड Not hundred years, sorry, hundred hours of class in my head. <laughs> sorry, and uh, that if suppose uh, I deliver, then then but but the perspective is also mains examination for PT examination. I am cutting short that those things because that won't be asked in preliminary examination. Fine, but ah 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 ah. Now, some some time more. Now, eight forty five will get break. देखो एट देखो अभी तो इतना टाइम तो हो ही गया एट फोर्टीन जस्ट हाफ एन आवर विल टेक आफ्टर हाफ एन आवर विल टेक ब्रेक ट्वेंटी मिनट्स के बाद ब्रेक ले लेते हैं ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव मिनट्स बस हंड्रेड आवर्स हाँ हंड्रेड आवर्स ऑफ क्लास आई कैन गो ऑन एंड ऑन डोंट वरी अबाउट दैट एंड आई एम नॉट विथ एनी पी डी एफ एक्सेट्रा 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 आई एम नॉट विथ एनी ओनली द थिंग इज योर क्वेश्चन बिफोर मी अदरवाइज हेल्पलेस देर आर सम आर्टिकल्स फॉर ड्रिंकिंग एक्सेट्रा अदरवाइज नथिंग इन फ्रंट ऑफ मी आई कैन गो ऑन एन ऑन नाउ क्लियर ठीक है एक एक ब्रेक लेंगे हम लोग आफ्टर ट्वेंटी मिनट्स ट्वेंटी फाइव मिनट्स विल टेक अ ब्रेक नाउ दिस लेट्स 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 गो लेट्स गो द प्राइसेस ऑफ कार्बन क्रेडिट्स हैव डिक्लाइन व्हाई बिकॉज़ ही सेड दैट नॉट ओनली कोविड पेंडेमिक बट आल्सो द वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड इज सफरिंग फ्रॉम इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस देयर कंपनीज आर नॉट प्रोड्यूसिंग इनफ टू बी इन रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ मोर एंड मोर ऑफ कार्बन क्रेडिट क्लियर देयर इज अ कोरिलेशन बिटवीन योर डेवलपमेंट एंड एमिशंस नाउ दिस कोरिलेशन इफ सपोज योर जीडीपी इज एनहांसिंग your uh, our country's gdp is enhancing our emissions would be also enhancing so this correlation between the gdp and the emission is called as what this is called as carbon intensity of gdp isse kya kehte hain carbon intensity of gdp this correlation between gdp and emission is called as carbon intensity of gdp and we can see that uh, there is a curve in environment which is called as kuznet curve कुजनेट कर्व एनवायरमेंट का मतलब है कि ऑल नेशंस दे स्टार्ट देयर जर्नी एज डर्टी नेशंस ऑल नेशंस दे स्टार्ट देयर जर्नी एज डर्टी नेशन डर्टी नेशन का मतलब है कि व्हेन दे डेवलप दे एमिट मोर क्लियर सो ऑल दे एंड ओनली आफ्टर सम टाइम दे वुड बी हैविंग द फंड्स to take measures to reduce or mitigate the damage Now, that's called as kuznet curve of environment so there's a intensity which is called as carbon intensity of gdp 
yes Ra- russia <laughs> ukraine war demanding weapons so yes carbon emissions will definitely and that would be responsible for long standing impact also we never know that there are some impacts which we we would be visualizing in future because of this war and in the longer run only yes listening to you thank you so much krishnan rendo is just like nirvana acha ab suno ise thoda aur sun lo that's dirty nation and that's called as carbon intensity of gdp but also remember that the connect is what article 6 of the paris declaration deals with article 6 this can be asked in examination article 6 of the paris declaration deals with what deals with the carbon market mechanism deals with the carbon market mechanism clear Article six of the Paris Declaration deals with the carbon market mechanism, and we can see that under this, under the Kyoto Protocol, India's credit worth five thousand crore rupees is unutilized. So India is negotiating for this purpose so that India can utilize these carbon credits. Five thousand crore has is lying unutilized. So India is negotiating for this purpose that these credits can be utilized by India. Clear, fine. This much in carbon, but only one thing which is left here, that Kyoto Protocol was responsible for dividing countries into three categories. One is called as Annex One countries. Second is called as Annex Two countries, and third is called as what? non annex 1 countries annex 1 countries second is called as annex 2 countries and third is called as non annex 1 countries when we talk about annex 1 countries there are 41 in annex 1 countries and these are all developed countries developed countries these are developed countries and on whom binding obligation binding obligation is imposed to reduce their carbon emission so these are called as nx1 countries and the second is called as nx2 countries so that 26 in number and all of them are part of nx1 so part of nx1 means automatically that they are developed nation and they are under binding obligation to reduce their carbon emission but why so different that they should be placed in nx2 categories now they are placed in nx2 categories because <coughs> they are responsible for funding they are responsible for funding carbon reduction project carbon reduction project in developing nations in developing nations so they are responsible for funding carbon reduction project in developing nations so they are called as nx2 and when we talk about non nx1 country non nx1 country are generally developing nations so these are what these are developing nations developing nations and uh, we can see that these developing nations they have no binding obligations no binding obligations clear so nx1 nx2 non nx1 countries they are now we are now ready to solve a test now let's see that whether the test can be solved or not by this information that we have gathered देखो एक एक करके मैं क्वेश्चन सेट कर रहा हूं तुम जवाब देते जाओ सी द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन दस योर टेस्ट थ्री फाइन एंड द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन कंसीडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट्स एंड सेलेक्ट द करेक्ट कोड carbon footprint measures the amount of greenhouse gases produced by an individual or by an industrial unit in our day to day lives it is measured in terms of tons or kgs of co2 equivalent carbon footprint of a british citizen is maximum in the world tell me what is the correct answer now as far as Yes, 
B would be the correct answer. Why? Because carbon footprint definition is correct. It's not only the amount of greenhouse gases produced by individual, but also by industrial unit. Clear industrial unit in our day to day lives. That's called as carbon uh, footprint. It is measured in terms of tons or kgs of CO2 equivalent. That's also true. And carbon footprint of a British, no, American citizen. American citizen is maximum in the world. That's this statement is wrong. Clear. This statement is wrong. US, China, India order. Theek hai, fine. Very good. Now, <clears throat> देखो इंडिया का कार्बन फुटप्रिंट कम है और इंडिया का कार्बन फुटप्रिंट इसलिए कम है क्योंकि आबादी इंडिया में ज़्यादा और ज़्यादातर इंडियंस रूरल एरियाज में भी रहते हैं तो इसलिए कार्बन फुटप्रिंट इंडिया का टेन टाइम्स लेस देन दैट ऑफ द डेवलप्ड वर्ल्ड सो बी ऑप्शन इज करेक्ट क्लियर न लेट सी द सेकेंड क्वेश्चन अब देखो बच्चा सेकेंड क्वेश्चन पूरा रिवाइज करते चलो इसे अच्छी तरह से कंसिडर फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट्स एंड सेलेक्ट द करेक्ट कोड Oceans absorb 30% of carbon emissions. हाँ ठीक है कह सकते हैं CO2 absorbed by oceans is utilized by phytoplankton for photosynthesis. There are limitations to oceans' ability to absorb CO2 because only top 300 meters of the ocean are in contact with the atmosphere. Tell me what is the correct answer? Tell me what is the correct answer? A. Definitely invincible. That's A. Correct. Good. Good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Fine. Very good. Now see. That's A. Now next question. and this we know we have discussed that consider the following gases nitrous oxide methane ozone carbon dioxide cfcs which of the above are greenhouse gases tell me question number 3 question number 3 that's a okay that's a correct because ozone itself is a greenhouse gas and all these are ozone depleting substances also apart from ozone and also greenhouse gases so all are greenhouse gases as such clear now fourth question which one of the following statement is incorrect the temperature of earth in absence of greenhouse gases would be minus 20 degree centigrade is that correct i think that's correct incoming cosmic rays are long wavelength radiation no they are not long wavelength radiation they happen to be short wavelength radiation the incoming cosmic rays would be only of short wavelength radiation so that's incorrect you can judge that we have discussed that and the rest is correct see next question Consider the following fifth question. Consider the following statements and select the correct code. India belongs to non Annex One category of countries. Just now we have studied. Yes, that's true. Annex One included developed countries on whom the binding obligation of UNFCC holds. That's also true. Annex Two countries are members of Annex One also. That's also true. So all the three statements are correct. Which of the following statement is incorrect? Cryosphere lies above the permafrost line. Clear? Yes, you can see cryosphere is icy layer, so it will be present above the permafrost line. Very good. Now these are easy questions. Yes, yes, yes. Very easy questions. <laughs> Now I'll ask you. I, I'll, I'll ask you. I'll ask you. The, cryosphere is responsible for moderating the temperature of Earth. True, because of albedo phenomena. Depletion of cryosphere can enhance the adverse impact of global warming. Yes, true. Now, what is wrong is melting of cryosphere is responsible for absorption of CO2. It's responsible for emission of CO2. 
which one of the following statement is incorrectly matched blue water rivers and lakes green water purified through osmosis gray water contaminated water after household use paleo water water contained in undisturbed space is that which is the correct answer incorrectly matched which is incorrectly matched now incorrectly matched is b that is green water clear green water is not when you are talking about green water it is the fraction of rainfall it's a fraction of rainfall trapped in soil used for cultivation that's called as green water it's not purified through osmosis that it is called as green water clear and blue water is present gray water is contaminated paleo water means paleo water is what the water which is underground underground water can be of two types one is gray water a uh, green water which is the fraction of rainfall which is trapped inside the soil and second would be paleo water paleo water is called as also fossil water which is present in undisturbed space so underground water can be of two types one is green water and second is paleo water or fossil water now which one of the following statement is incorrect national parks are open for scientific educational or recreational use harvesting and collection of minor forest produce products are allowed in wildlife sanctuaries biosphere reserves are meant not only for protection of biodiversity but also cultural diversity core areas of biosphere reserves are managed by now tell me which is the incorrect answer in it which is the incorrect answer in it it d yes correct d is the incorrect answer yes paleo means rocks those uh, the uh, water which is trapped inside the uh, undisturbed space is the rock and that's why which is called as paleo water or fossil water so i said that underground water would be of two parts one is green water and second is paleo water so the answer is d why because core areas of biosphere reserve you have studied was managed by three acts the forest act of 1927 the wildlife protection act of 1972 and also the uh, forest conservation act of 1980 now <clears throat> consider the following statements and select the correct code can you answer this ninth question there are three statements over here can you say that which is the correct option ninth question which is the correct option now the correct option is a ninth all these statements are correct but remember these statements for your examination because they have asked you question on this also so please remember do these statements for your examination which one of the following statement is incorrect then you can easily say that which is incorrect 10th one biomethanation is a process by which organic matter is microbiology converted into anaerobic condition to produce biogas biogas consists of only methane that's wrong so b would be incorrect answer i think b would be incorrect answer yes definitely b is incorrect answer plasma gasification is used for waste treatment converts organic matter into synthetic gas because all these three processes pyrolysis 
biomethylation, plasma gasification. Now, all these processes were used in Solid Waste Management Act 2016-17, which is based on what? Which is based on waste to energy. So, from waste, we would be developing energy. So, these processes were used. Remember these processes because they are very important for your examination also and they have been asked, one or two pauses have been asked. Now, see. Consider the following statements and select the correct code. National Chambal Century, that's question number 11. National Chambal Century is situated at the trijunction of three states. Is that true? The nest of Ghadiyal gets disturbed because of sand mining on the river Chambal. And Devri Ghadiyal rearing and hatching center is located in Sagar district of Madhya Pradesh. Ghadiyals, according to IUCN, is vulnerable species. Yes, most of the students are from KG. <laughs> now see, we can see that as far as this question is concerned, the first is correct option. Why? Because it is situated at the trijunction of three state and that is what Rajasthan, UP and Madhya Pradesh. That's correct. The nest of Ghadiyal gets these, uh, uh, disturbed because of sand mining activities on Chambal. That's true. Devdi Ghadiyal rearing and hatching center is located in Sagar district of Madhya Pradesh. That's wrong because this is located in Morena district. And Ghadiyal, according to IUCN, is vulnerable species. That's also wrong because critically endangered. Kuchhi bache hume? Critically endangered. So, we can see first and second option would be the correct option. Clear? Ghadiyal initially were present where? These river Ghadiyal. Four is wrong. Yes. See. First is correct. Second is correct. Third is wrong because it is located in Morena district of Madhya Pradesh and Ghadiyals are critically endangered. Clear? So, one and two would be the correct option. One and two would be the correct option. That's your C. Clear? And see, uh, initially Ghadiyals were, initially, uh, now, initially, Ghadiyals were present in river Ganga and Yamuna, but they have shifted from Ganga and Yamuna when Ganga and Yamuna became contaminated. Clear? So, they have shifted to Chambal river and they are on the verge of uh, decline. They won't be surviving for, there are surviving for few are present there and they would be surviving for only uh, some years. They would become extinct. So, in this center, the uh, eggs are brought of Ghadiyal from Chambal rivers and they are hatched. When Ghadiyals um, gain a certain length, then they are reverted back into the Chambal river. The last question. It is managed by um, Madhya Pradesh, Morena district. Now, next last question. The IUCN recently reclassified snow leopard uh, from as vulnerable from its previous classification of endangered. That's true. Snow leopard are found from Central Asia to Himalayas. That's also true. Clear? That's also true. Both are correct statement. And why they have reclassified it? Because the number of snow leopards enhanced. Clear? Number of snow leopards enhanced. That is the reason for its reclassification. Now, we'll have a lunch break now. Clear? Of 30 minutes, 35 minutes and then we will continue. Both are true. Yes, both are true. Both, both are correct. A is the correct option. So, let's take a break and have a lunch break.
let us start. Now, now, before going into the break, we were discussing the questions related to global warming and climate change. Now, first of all, uh, sometimes it also happens that you prepare the entire book, but not a single question would be asked from there. Clear? Cheetah ko teen bhi huye hai saath, very good. All these are information that you have. 22, yes, Petersburg declaration is that. Now, good conversation related to cheetah and kuno and tiger population. Now, now uh, sometimes it may also happen that you prepare the entire book but not a single question may be asked from the book and they would be asking you questions from terminology terms only so today let's uh, discuss some terms related to global warming and climate change and all these terms are significant for us let's see how so let's discuss these terms now the first term that we are going to discuss is called as what it is called as <coughs> carbon <coughs> budget carbon justice and carbon share that's the first term let's discuss these terms when we talk about uh, carbon budget carbon justice and carbon share we are reminded of the Paris Declaration. Clear? We are reminded of the Paris Declaration. Now, the Paris Declaration said that, that temperature enhancement of Earth, Paris Declaration is what? Paris Declaration is nothing but COP 21st and was passed in the year 2015. COP 21st and was passed in the year 2015. So, when we are talking about Paris Declaration, we can see Paris Declaration is what? Paris Declaration says that, that the temperature enhancement of earth, I am saying that temperature enhancement of earth should be less than 2 degree centigrade, less than 2 degree centigrade by the end of this century. That should be the temperature enhancement, less than 2 degree centigrade by the end of this century. That is Paris Declaration. But when we talk about Paris Declaration, we can see Paris Declaration also says that, that it would be better if nations try to, what is global dimming? I will discuss global dimming, do not worry. Now, the, it would be said that, it would be better that if nations try to attain the target of less than 1.5 degree centigrade enhancement. First, the Paris Declaration says that, that the temperature enhancement of earth should be less than 2 degrees centigrade. But it also says that it would be better that nations try to attain the target of less than 1.5 degree centigrade enhancement. Clear? This is Paris Declaration. Now, emissions have taken place in the past. Emissions would take place in the future also. Emissions have taken place in the past. Emissions would take place in the future. Now, from where we are calculating this temperature enhancement? Now, we are calculating this temperature enhancement from where? We are calculating this temperature enhancement from uh, 400 years back, that is a pre-industrialization level temperature. Clear? So, we are responsible for <coughs> calculating this temperature enhancement 400 years back, the pre-industrialization level enhancement. And we can see <coughs> that emissions have taken place in the past. Emissions have taken place in the past. So, if suppose we calculate from 400 years back, that is the base temperature of earth where it is calculated, 400 years back till 2015. And from 2015, we are responsible for calculating till the end of this century. So, here we say, this is the emission of past. Emission of past. 
and this is what the emission of future this is emission of past and this is emission of future now the condition is what the condition is that this you cannot reduce because already you have emitted but this you can curtail this you can check so the condition is what that if suppose we count this sum total of emission ye dono ko jod kar dekhte hain sum total of emission now this sum total of emission sum total of emission so that the target uh, so that the target of paris declaration is met is referred to as what it is referred to as carbon budget or it is called as what it is called as carbon commons so we can say that this would be called as what it would be called as carbon budget or it would be called as carbon commons the sum total of emissions or carbon commons and the irony is what yes zero carbon we'll discuss that <clears throat> but the irony is what the irony is that that uh, three fourth of the carbon budget already has been utilized we have said that three fourth of the carbon budget has already been utilized out of the and only one fourth is remaining today and for this we have 85 years clear for this we have 85 years so out of the one fourth remaining today each and every nation would be allocated their carbon share they are saying that each and every nation would be allocated their carbon share out of the one fourth remaining we say that each and every nation would be allocated their carbon share and developing nations want more and more of carbon share and why more and more of carbon share developing nations want developing nations want more of carbon share why because they haven't developed and if they develop carbon emissions would take place more so they want more and more of carbon share as such clear developing nations <coughs> want more and more of carbon share as such and if suppose developing nations are responsible for reporting more and more of carbon shares then we can see developing nations are responsible for more and more of carbon share it is in this context that the term carbon justice is given that developing nations should be granted given more and more of carbon share clear now we are saying i repeat once more that the paris declaration says that the temperature enhancement of earth should be less than 2 degree centigrade by the end of this century this is paris declaration cop 21st 2015 <coughs> <coughs> but the paris declaration also mentions that it would be better if nations try to attain the temperature enhancement of less than 1.5 degree centigrade now less than 1.5 degree centigrade is based on the ipcc report the ipcc assessment report of 2015 said that why the world cannot afford temperature enhancement beyond 1.5 degree centigrade this was said by ipcc report that why the world cannot afford temperature enhancement beyond 1.5 degree centigrade clear and in this report it has been said that uh, that even if suppose we meet the target of 1.5 degree centigrade 70 to 90% of corals would vanish clear so ipcc was responsible for suggesting certain pathways for this purpose and we'll discuss about the pathways also but this is called as what this is called as the paris declaration now we are calculating the temperature of earth base temperature for this purpose has been taken temperature of earth 400 years back that is the base temperature the pre industrialization level temperature and then the incremental temperature would be calculated now we say that that emissions have taken place in the past emissions would be taking place in the future so if we combine together the emissions of past and the emissions of future that's the sum total of emissions then we can see that the only conditionality is what that the target of the paris declaration is met so this sum total of emission would be called as what this sum total of emission would be referred to as carbon budget or would be called as carbon commons and the irony is what that one third of the 
sorry, three fourth of the current budget has been utilized. Only one fourth is remaining, and in this, each and every nation should be allocated their carbon share. So it is in this context that the term carbon justice is given because developing nations aspire for more and more of carbon share. Clear? Developing nations aspire for more and more of carbon share. But see, the another term is called as what? It is called as, and remember that when you are talking about the temperature enhancement of earth, what is the temperature of earth? The temperature of earth in the 20th century was 15.8 degrees centigrade. That's the average temperature of earth in the 20th century. 15.8 degree centigrade. And July 2021, 2021, according to the IPCC 6th assessment report, was considered as what? Was considered as the hottest month ever recorded. And why hottest month ever recorded? Because this month registered a temperature of more than 0.9 degrees centigrade than the average temperature of Earth recorded in the 20th century. IPCC 6th assessment report also talks about temperature enhancement like this manner and also says that, that the three gases which are emitted, greenhouse gases which are emitted largely are what? First is CO2, second is methane and third is nitrous oxide. Abundant. CO2 is uh, uh, emitted in abundance, then is methane and there is nitrous oxide. The IPCC assessment report, 6th assessment report also says that that Mumbai is likely to suffer vulnerable due to rise in sea level. So, the city of India which would be suffering due to rise in sea level is Mumbai and the city of India which would be suffering from heat waves is Ahmedabad. So, two cities of India have been mentioned in the IPCC report, 6th assessment report as such. Clear? See, all these temperature are calculated, see, post in 1997, we had an uh, agreement was signed between the World Resource Institute and the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. That was in 1997. Now, that agreement is called as GHG protocol, Greenhouse Gases Protocol. Now, the purpose of this agreement is to monitor measure, manage emission and it is this agreement that determined that what emissions have taken place in the past according to the temperature enhancement which is calculated. Is that clear? Fine. <coughs> now, there's another term that you have to know and that term is called as what? We have done, uh, we have completed what is called as carbon commons carbon share and carbon justice, but there is another term which is called as climate justice. Climate justice and climate justice means that, that when we talk about temperature uh, enhancement and global warming taking place, the adverse impact of global warming and temperature enhancement would be on certain segments of society more when compared to others. Clear? The adverse impact of global warming and temperature enhancement would be more on certain segments of society when compared to others. Clear? And uh, for example, marginal farmers would be suffering because of global warming more. For example, women, particularly in rural areas, are suffering due to adverse impact of global warming more. So, if suppose we are taking any initiative for their betterment, then these initiative would be coming under the domain of, it would be coming under the domain of what is called as climate justice. Clear? This initiative would be coming under the domain of what is called as climate justice. Now, under this initiative, we can see that Maharashtra, government of Maharashtra was responsible for launching an initiative and that initiative is called as what? It is called as Climate Adaptive Agriculture. Now, that initiative is called as Climate Adaptive Agriculture. Now, Climate Adaptive Agriculture means what? See, the farmers of Maharashtra were vulnerable for droughts. 
although if you suppose compare the uh, rainfall in rajasthan and rainfall in maharashtra rainfall in maharashtra is more than compared to rajasthan but the vulnerability for droughts for farmers of maharashtra was more why because the farmers of maharashtra tended to uh, cultivate those crops which are water intensive in nature for example sugarcane that's why the vulnerability enhanced clear a small island also coastal community also uh, yes vulnerability for them would be certainly high and for them also climate justice would be uh, uh, there now we can see the marginal farmers have a problem marginal farmers have shortage of land marginal farmers have shortage of water sources so suppose if any initiative is taken for them it would be also falling under the domain of carbon uh, climate justice so the government of maharashtra was responsible for launching an initiative and this initiative is called as what it is called as climate adaptive agriculture and climate adaptive agriculture means what that three main ingredients of this first is water harvesting on a large scale so we can see yes water harvesting should be conducted on a large scale then second is we would be also responsible for developing resilience among farmers so resilience among farmers would be developed how it would be developed by sustainable management of the area sustainable management of the area so we would be responsible for developing resilience among farmers through sustainable management of the area and then suppose if by taking these steps also <coughs> if by taking these steps also what happens is the uh <coughs> the crop production fails crop production fails then what would be done is that establishment of climate index insurance would take place and this climate index insurance would be helping the farmers in case of what in case of crop failure so establishment of climate index insurance which would be helping the farmers in case of crop failure clear so that's called as what that's called as climate adaptive agriculture fine see there were other terms also which should be known to us one term which was used earlier was called as indc indc stood for intended nationally determined contributions and under indc indc was prepared at the uh, warsaw meet of 2013 the framework was prepared and it was implemented under the paris declaration so nations would themselves have to determine what contribution they would be making for global warming and climate change and how they would be responsible for taking these initiatives nations would have to themselves determine but when we are talking about <coughs> when you are talking about uh, this uh, indc we can see that uh, remember one thing about the paris declaration Paris declaration not only was responsible for implementing the INDC but was also responsible for what was also responsible for emphasizing on transparency transparency ka matlab kya hai transparency means that nations would have to report emissions taking place from each and every sector clear har sector se transportation se agriculture se jo bhi emission hota hai use aap report karenge so this was done under the paris declaration so when a question is asked that uh, how the paris declaration is legally binding is the paris declaration legally binding so as far as the paris declaration is concerned it's not legally binding for uh, determining contributions but it is legally binding for reporting of emissions clear it is legally binding for reporting of emissions so paris declaration is not legally binding for determining con you can change your contributions because indc which was determined by <coughs> india in the year 2015 16 was changed in the form of panchamrit later on so our indc today is now nothing but panchamrit clear the five objectives which was declared by the prime minister at the cop 26 that is our indc today clear 
so that stands that is the and you see that we have to deal so that's called s munchamrit now that's why we said that that as far as determining contribution is concerned you can determine your contribution you can shift that also we have changed that also but as far as reporting of emission is concerned it's binding in nature you have to report the emissions clear so it is supposed to be binding in nature clear that's one thing now the next thing that you have to know as far as the panchamrit is concerned the target should be known for at least the preliminary examination panchamrit are the five objectives given by the prime minister under the national statement at the cop 26 2021 and the first target is developing 500 gigawatt of energy through non fossil fuel sources through non fossil fuel sources then the second target is what second target is 50% of energy requirement of india 50% of energy requirement of india the requirement of india would be coming from would be coming from renewable sources 50% of energy requirement of india would be coming from renewable sources now the third is what the third is that uh, is a two the third happens to be what it is that india would be also responsible for the carbon intensity of gdp the carbon intensity of gdp means there is a correlation between gdp growth and carbon emission so this correlation is called as carbon intensity of gdp of india should be reduced by 45% clear and that is by 2030 all the targets are by 2030 fine and then also we say that that india would be responsible for what india would be responsible for establishing carbon sinks carbon sinks for 1 billion ton of co2 obviously of the total projected emissions of total projected emissions emissions and this would be done by 2030 and then there was uh, emphasis on india to declare net zero so india declared net zero by 2070 clear because under the paris declaration we can see <clears throat> clear so we can see under the paris declaration india was uh, Paris Declaration says what? Paris Declaration says that the target of Paris Declaration can be met only if equalization of emission takes place by nation by the mid of the century. Clear? So, if you are responsible for equalizing your emissions by mid of this century, then only the target of Paris Declaration can be met. So, here we are saying that the target of Paris Declaration would be met, but India declared its net zero by 2070, not by the mid of this century. so here india is lagging behind clear now this is panchamrit earlier the indc is now defunct so they won't be asking you an examination that what is india's indc as such clear now this is panchamrit now also we can see that uh, apart from this there are other terms that deserves attention and one such terms that needs to be known to you is called as what it is called as first of all let's take red plus now red stands for what red plus stands for reduction of emission reduction of emission from deforestation from deforestation and forest degradation and forest <coughs> degradation So suppose deforestation takes place, CO two level would be enhancing, 
if forest degradation takes place, CO2 level would be enhancing. Clear? So, the emission which has enhanced due to deforestation and forest degradation needs to be reduced. Clear? Needs to be reduced. Yes, fine. Everything is fine, under control. Let us move forward and try to now fulfill the <laughs> midnight aspiration as such of covering environment and max to max what can be covered. Now, this, this is called as now this uh, red plus initiative comes under a broader initiative and that broader initiative is called as biocarbon initiative for sustainable landscape, which is for reducing emissions from land surface. So, under that emission red plus initiative comes. So, you can see the framework of Let's Plus was prepared at Sivam. All very fine, very fine. Thank you. Now, we can see that the framework of Red Plus was prepared. It was prepared uh, at the Warsaw meet in 2013. But as far as Red Plus is concerned, what needs to be done for this purpose? Under the Red Plus initiative, we would be enhancing forest cover. And we would be enhancing forest cover where? We would be enhancing forest cover in developed nations, sorry, developing nations. And in developing nations, we would be enhancing forest cover with the help of tribal community, with the help of local community as such. So, that would be enhanced. And uh, when this would be enhanced, this would be reducing the emission which has taken from deforestation and forest degradation as such. Clear? When this is enhanced, it would be reducing emission which has taken place from deforestation and forest degradation. But as far as Red Plus initiative is concerned, <coughs> we can see that if you are engaging the tribal community or the local community in enhancing forest cover, why should they work for you? Until and un unless there is a certain incentive given to them. So, the incentive for them would be coming from Red Plus Fund. And in Red Plus Fund, any donor nations can contribute. Any donor nations can contribute in Red Plus Fund. But it would be managed by what? It would be managed by the World Bank. Clear? So, we can see in... Uh, Red plus in Red plus fund, any donor nation can contribute and this would be managed by whom? This would be managed by World Bank. So, UPSC asked you that who is responsible for managing the Red plus fund? It is the World Bank which is responsible for managing the Red plus fund. Clear? Fine. <coughs> now, if you talk about uh, forest in India, we can see the forest cover of India is what? The forest cover of India is 21.7 percent and this forest cover is responsible for neutralizing only 11 percent of India's emission. The rest 89 percent is not neutralized. 21.7 percent is according to the SFR. Yes, red plus to red to red plus is from a forest to forest management concept. Yes, definitely. Now, 21.7 percent is is according to the SFR that is state of forest report 2021 which is responsible for equalizing only 11 percent of India's emission. The rest 89 percent is not equalized and that is the reason why we were responsible for declaring late our net zero because we declared uh, net zero by 2070 as such clear. But if suppose we have to plant vegetation, enhance forest cover and have to plant vegetation, then what kind of vegetation should be planted for this purpose? Now, the vegetation which should be preferred for more and more of carbon absorption, the vegetation which should be preferred for more and more of CO2 absorption would be what? It would be coconut palm. That is the first in ranking. If you have to enhance forest cover, these things should be planted. Second is neem tree. It's not the antifungal qualities of neem tree which is of great value, but also it is carbon sequestration. Then also mango tree, mango tree. Then also not only mango tree, but we would be responsible for also planting mango tree. 
and we would be responsible for not only planting mango tree but also tamarind obviously tamarind tree and the last one is what the fifth one is eucalyptus these are five big absorbers of co2 but now connected with the paris declaration <coughs> and also at the cop 26 what initiative were taken we can see uh, article 5 of the paris declaration deals with the red plus initiative which article article 5 of the paris declaration deals with the red plus initiative and at the cop 27 and at the cop not 27 26 that is Glasgow, an initiative was taken and this initiative that is 2021 and this initiative was called as what it was called as Glasgow leaders declaration, Glasgow leaders declaration or it is also referred to as global leaders declaration because this is for the purpose and more than 100 countries were signatory to it and the purpose of it is to halt deforestation deforestation by what by 2030 clear to hold deforestation by 2030 so that's called as glasgow leaders declaration or it is referred to as what uh, the global leaders declaration and the purpose is to hold deforestation by 2030 so that's how red plus can be connected to the contemporary issues right now next uh, thing that you have to know is what is called as Green Climate Fund. Next term is Green Climate Fund. So let's talk about Green Climate Fund. Fine. Now, Green Climate Fund, uh, the framework of this fund was prepared where the framework of this fund was prepared in the year 2009 and that was at the Copenhagen meet that this framework was prepared you say that framework was prepared but it was formed when formed in COP COP 16 and that it was at Cancun but it was implemented under implemented was to be implemented under Paris Declaration. Paris Declaration. That's COP 21st. Now, as far as Green Climate Fund is concerned, under this fund, last, last CP. Yes, Sivam, last CP. Thodi si last bachi hai. Fine, let's see. Again, we'll continue with let's sees and thumbs up and um, some also T. Okay, implemented in Paris Declaration, Green Climate Fund. Now we can see that as far as Green Climate Fund is con concerned, under this fund, hundred billion dollar, hundred billion dollar was to be transferred from developed to developing nation was to be transferred from developed to developing nation starting when starting 2020 starting 2020 it was to be transferred from developed to developing nation starting 2020 Yes, four hours to world record. I am going to <laughs> I am going to make a world record. But my intention is not of making world record. My intention is your welfare. Clear? You benefit from it. I am I am ready to make a world record, but you benefit from it. Now, it would be transferred from developed to develop nation, uh, developing nation under 2020. Clear? From 2020 and every year. It's not once that hundred billion dollar would be transferred from developed to developing nation, and uh, this would be transferred. So we can see that when it is transferred from developed to developing nation, obviously the developing nation would be responsible for uh, utilizing this fund for mitigating the adverse impact of global warming and climate change. That's the Green Climate Fund. But when you talk about Green Climate Fund, Green Climate Fund is based on what? It is based on 
polluter pays principle those who were responsible for polluting the atmosphere of the earth should be responsible for funding the mitigation measures clear then green climate fund is also based on ecological depth under the colonial or imperial rule those who were responsible for exploiting the developing countries should be responsible for fundigating their mitigation measures so these are two principles on which it is based but as far as green climate fund is called green climate fund never came into force and the reason was what mr trump mr trump you know very famous president of us the former president of us he said that that global warming does not take place global warming is a myth and if green climate fund is implemented the burden would be on us because the biggest emitter is us so if suppose 100 billion dollar is coming from developed to developing nation the contribution would be made as per the emissions and biggest emitter is us so that's why we can say that us was responsible for walking out of the paris declaration clear walking out so this was mainly green climate fund but then comes in the year 2021 when our respected prime minister visited uh glasgow to attend the cop26 our respected prime minister emphasized on i call him respected uh, emphasized on what he emphasized on the climate finance climate finance of 1 trillion dollars कहा से जोड़ रहे हैं बच्चों इसे कोपेन हेगन से ऑफ वन ट्रिलियन डॉलर टू बी इमीजिएटली ट्रांसफर्ड फ्रॉम डेवलप टू डेवलपिंग नेशन क्लियर टू बी इमीजिएटली ट्रांसफर्ड फ्रॉम डेवलप टू डेवलपिंग नेशन Yes, U.S. behaves like hostage in storm. Very good. Now, to immediately transferred from developed to developing nation. Now, this is the history of, and and this is the history of what is called as loss and damage fund, which was decided at COP twenty seven. That is Sir Mel Sheikh in Egypt. Clear. So we can see the Green Climate Fund took for, uh, took. Uh, the form of climate finance and then in the at the cop 27 it was it took the form of what it took the form of took the form of what is called as loss and damage fund loss and damage fund clear loss and damage fund the loss and damage fund jo hai it was decided at what decided at cop 27 that sarmel sake everybody knows that but they can confuse you they can confuse you with the words clear they can confuse you with the words now tell me then when we are talking about loss and damage fund loss and damage fund is for what purpose how it would be helping the developing nation what were the words used at cop 27 now at the cop 27 the words which were used for loss and damage fund was what that it would be utilized by developing nation it would be utilized by developing nation to rebuild to rebuild physical and social infrastructure see the words physical and social not physical and economic interest infrastructure physical and social infrastructure which has suffered due to three decades of adverse impact of global warming and climate change So it would be utilized by developing nation to develop the physical and social infrastructure which has suffered which has suffered due to three decades of adverse impact of global warming and climate change clear and uh, as far as this fund is concerned this fund took the form of loss and damage but yet we can see that the cash inflows in this fund is yet to be decided how the fund would be constituted is yet to be decided so it may take time so that's called as green climate fund and red plus now there are some other initiatives also one term is called as what it is called as climate vulnerable forum is called as what is called as climate vulnerable forum so that's called as climate vulnerable forum and what is climate vulnerable forum 
Now, climate, we can see at the COP 22nd. COP 22nd, COP 21st was conducted at Paris. COP 22nd was conducted at Marrakesh. And at this uh, COP, uh, a group of 47 nations, they, uh, they declared that they would be the first to turn their economies green. And they would be the first to turn their economies green with zero emissions. So, there are a group of 47 nations and they at the COP 22nd, 22nd said that, that is in the year 2016 said that they would be the first <coughs> to turn their economies green. Economies green means with zero emissions. So, they would be the first to turn their economies green with zero emissions with zero emissions with zero emissions fine so they would be the first to turn their economies green with zero emissions and they will neutralize their emissions neutralize their emissions now we can see that there are carbon neutral nations for example bhutan is a carbon neutral nation in india there is a village which is called as minangadi village minangadi Minan Gadi village. This is then it is present in the Vena district. This is present in the Vena district, and this village, uh, that is Minan Gadi village, which is present in the Vena district. Now it is said to be the first carbon neutral village of India. Clear, first carbon neutral village of India. So that's called as Minan Gadi village. And uh, as far as this village is concerned, it has a tree plantation program through which it was responsible for neutralizing its emission. So, that village is called as the Minangadi village. And uh, as far as the Climate Vulnerable Forum is concerned, these group of nations are what? These are tiny islands, tiny islands and they face the threat of what they face the threat of submergence submergence due to rising sea level so they are tiny islands small island we can say not tiny but they face the threat of submergence due to rising sea level Now, please do not <laughs> say conference of phonics from conference of parties. Well, 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 good evening, good evening, good evening, Pinkor. <laughs> so, please do not say so because there is some relevance to it still. Now, these are, but see, at this, now connect it to COP 26 <clears throat> and at the COP 26 that was conducted at Glasgow. India was will take the credit because if our prime minister takes every credit, we'll also take the credit. We'll do the same. So India was responsible for helping, helping in establishment of what? In establishment of infrastructure for resilient island nations. So we were responsible for helping establishing infrastructure for resilient island nation resilient island nation island nations so that they can uh, face the adverse impact of global warming and climate change clear fine so that they can face the adverse impact of global warming and climate change bachcho thakna ne thakna mana hai subhas थकना मना है आज देखो मैं नहीं थका हूं तो आप नहीं थकोगे क्लियर लेट्स कंटिन्यू सो इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर फॉर रेजिलिएंट आइलैंड नेशंस नाउ द नेक्स्ट टर्म दैट यू हैव टू नो सी सीओपी 23rd 2017 was uh, to be held in Fiji, conducted in Fiji, clear? 
हाँ नहीं थको प्लीज बच्चों आज थोड़ा सा आज देखो देखो वर्ल्ड रिकॉर्ड बनाने में तुम मेरे साथ रहोगे तभी तो मैं वर्ल्ड रिकॉर्ड बुलाऊंगा तो ये भी तो होगा ना कि तुम भी साथ थे वर्ल्ड रिकॉर्ड में वी वेयर द विटनेस टू दैट सेशन क्लियर एंड मेरी एनर्जी अभी नहीं अभी तो मैं गरमाना शुरू हुआ हूँ फाइनल कंटिन्यू डोंट वरी डोंट वरी आल इज आल कंटिन्यू आल कंटिन्यू ना सी सी ओ पी ट्वेंटी थर्ड वॉज टू बी कन्वीन इन फीजी एंड वाई बिकॉज because fiji was holding the presidency of unfcc and i have said that that the countries which is responsible for holding the presidency the, in that territory only the cop should be conducted in that territory only the cop should be conducted but for political reason the venue was shifted so it is called as what it is called as bon conference kya kehte hain ise bon conference So it was conducted in Bonn, but the declaration is called as Fiji Declaration. Fiji Declaration. Now there were many initiatives taken. One initiative was called as what? One initiative was called as uh, the Telanoa Initiative. Telanoa Initiative का मतलब है कि it would be helping the developed uh, nations. You know, not developed or developing nation. It would be helping the nations in order to implement their. INDC, so that was called as Telenoa Initiative. But we can see that another initiative was called as what? It was called as one initiative was called as I'm writing here Telenoa Initiative. Now this may not be asked in exam because that's not very relevant as such. Now this was for the purpose of helping nations in order to implement its INDC. Clear? But second initiative was called as what? Second initiative was called as the corinivia joint work for agriculture corinivia joint work for agriculture and that's also not very relevant as such because corinivia joint work for agriculture was what it is it was for the adjustment of the agriculture sector adjustment of agriculture sector and after this we'll have a test on cop 27 clear we already had a test on cbd convention on biodiversity now we'll conduct a objective test on cop 27 so we can see corinivia joint work for agriculture was adjustment of the agriculture sector and for what purpose now <clears throat> in the limelight of global warming and climate change so that it can bear the impact of global warming and climate change but having said so the most important initiative which was taken at the cop 23 that is fiji declaration was called as what it was called as powering past powering past coal alliance powering past coal alliance clear now powering past coal alliance means what see powering means development of energy मतलब ऊर्जा तैयार करना एंड पास्ट मींस बियॉन्ड द यूज ऑफ कोल सो डेवलपिंग एनर्जी बियॉन्ड द यूज ऑफ कोल डेवलपिंग एनर्जी विदाउट द यूज ऑफ कोल क्लियर सो दैट्स अलायंस इज कॉल्ड एज पावरिंग पास्ट कोल अलायंस नाउ दिस वाज लॉन्च्ड बाय अ ग्रुप ऑफ थर्टी नेशंस लॉन्च्ड बाय अ ग्रुप ऑफ थर्टी नेशंस व्हिच इंक्लूडेड यूके कनाडा a group of 30 nations which included uk canada and um, today we can see that this group has more than 100 members now 100 members do not include only in only nations 100 members also include some national entities business organizations but more than 30 nations are present india is not a member of this alliance why because india's dependency on coal is very large clear but this alliance powering past coal alliance is for the purpose of developing energy objective is energy without coal without coal and that is by 2030 clear energy without coal by 2030 so developing energy without the use of coal by 2030 that's the objective india is not a member but this alliance is very famously called as non proliferation treaty non proliferation treaty treaty on fossil fuels 
non proliferation treaty on fossil fuels clear fossil fuel but then it is based on what it is based on see <coughs> ipcc report when again come to ipcc report the ipcc assessment report of 2015 said that that why the world cannot afford temperature beyond 1.5 degree centigrade because that would be a catastrophic situation and ipcc report was also responsible for suggesting certain pathways for this purpose and these pathways included what these pathways included <coughs> these pathways were responsible for including what these pathways included rejecting the use of coal rejecting the use of oil rejecting the use of gas why because if you talk about the contribution of coal the contribution of coal in greenhouse gas emission is what the contribution of coal in greenhouse gas emission is 43% if you uh, if you talk about the contribution of oil the contribution of oil in greenhouse gas emission is 34% if you call about the contribution of gas it is 18% and then we can see one is a big culprit and that is cement industry so when you are talking about cement industry cement industry is responsible for contributing 4.9% in total greenhouse gas emission clear 4.9% in total greenhouse gas emission and cement industry is also responsible for oceanic acidification as the one of the second factors so if a question on cement industry is asked cement industry is a big culprit <laughs> clear big culprit so this is non proliferation treaty on fossil fuels and we can see that powering past goal alliance is based on what it is based on the pathway suggested by pathways suggested by what suggested by ipcc clear pathway suggested by ipcc now that's called as powering past coal lands but at the cop 27 you can see that uh, and you would have read in the newspaper that there was an initiative taken by a small island and that small island is called as vanatau and this initiative was called as fossil fuel non proliferation treaty to reject the use of fossil fuel which was obviously debated but this was started by vanatau so just remember that that initiative was called as fossil fuel non proliferation treaty and powering past coal lands is called as non proliferation treaty on fossil fuel is that clear fine so that's called as non proliferation treaty on fossil fuel <clears throat> now let's move forward now next num see when you talk about cop 24th cop 24th was conducted at in the year 2018 it was conducted at katowice katowice is in poland and nothing significant was made why because <clears throat> it was mainly for the purpose of yes there can be questions related to ipcc report sometimes but remember that ipcc was what uh, it was formed in the year 1988 to conduct a scientific uh, social impact of these kind of occurrences india is a part of ipcc they can ask you but it would be better that if we study clear because you have to link all these things together now this was conducted at katowice in poland and the purpose is what the purpose is the purpose was to study all uh, suggest ru uh, study the rules which are related to the implementation of the paris declaration so that's not very significant as such but when we talk about cop 25th it was conducted at madrid although it was considered as a failure because uh, the uh, implementation of paris declaration was to be made in the year 2020 and it appeared that all the nations have failed even the developing nations like india china etc were accused that not taking sincere steps for the implementation of paris declaration but at this declaration we can see two steps were taken one step which was taken was called as european new green deal european 
न्यू ग्रीन डील एंड यूरोपियन न्यू ग्रीन डील मीन्स दैट दैट बाई हेल्प ऑफ दिस डील यूरोप वुड बिकम यूरोप वुड बिकम द फर्स्ट कॉन्टिनेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यूरोप वुड बिकम द फर्स्ट कॉन्टिनेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड टू अटेन नेट जीरो टू अटेन नेट जीरो बाय ट्वेंटी फिफ्टी एंड दिस इज एज पर पेरिस डिक्लेरेशन बट अनदर स्टेप वॉज वॉट अनदर स्टेप वॉज कॉल्ड एज क्लाइमेट एम्बिशन कोलेशन एम्बिशन कोलेशन and climate ambition coalition was a group of 73 countries held by chile and the purpose was to attain net zero by 2050 net zero by 2050 when we talk about uh, unep report that is emission gap report of 2020 now this emission gap report says what it says that that uh, in the year 2019 the total greenhouse gas emission which was taking place was roughly 59.1 gigatons when you talk about suppose emission gap report there are many emission gap reports but we have selected one here and that is of 2020 and that is given by unep now this report says that that if we consider 2019 the total greenhouse gas emitted was 59.1 gigatons gt gigatons of co2 equivalent that's how it's represented 59.1 gigatons of co2 equivalent and certainly if we are moving at this pace if we roughly move at this pace then the temperature enhancement of earth would be by the end of this century what it would be crossing the target of the paris declaration so it would be more than 3% 3.7 degree centigrade if we move at this pace clear so it was suggested that that if suppose we have to reduce our temperature suppose if the temperature has to be reduced and if you have to meet the target of less than 2 degree centigrade enhancement you have to reduce this emission to what this emission to at least 41 gigaton of co2 equivalent by 2030 then only you can meet the target of 2 degree centigrade less than 2 degree centigrade and if suppose you have to meet the target of 1.5 degree centigrade then you have to reduce this emission by 25 gigatons of co2 equivalent by 2020 2030 that was mentioned in emission gap report clear that's what mentioned in emission gap report clear and uh, we can see that uh, in 2019 if the greenhouse gas emission was 59.1 gigatons of co2 equivalent then in 2020 it reduced what it reduced to reduced by 7% in 2020 due to the covid pandemic the greenhouse gases emission would was reduced by uh, about uh, 7% but this hardly translates into temperature reduction of earth point it only reduced the temperature of earth by 0.01 degree centigrade clear 0.01 degree centigrade it reduced the temperature of earth so if this be the case that the temperature of earth would be reduced by this so unep was responsible for suggesting one thing that this phase of reduced industrial activity due to the covid pandemic should be utilized to meet the target of paris declaration and this is called as what this is referred to as green pandemic recovery clear so if they ask you what do you understand by green pandemic recovery this is what is called as green pandemic recovery that the the condition of reduced industrial activity because of the covid pandemic should be utilized for meeting the target of paris declaration and this is called as what this is called as uh, green pandemic recovery and we can see the silver lining is what silver lining is more than 120 nations of the world has committed to net zero which includes the european green 
Green New Deal, and it also includes what? It also includes the Climate Ambition Coalition, which we have just now talked about, because these are in accordance with the Green Pandemic Recovery. Clear? Green Pandemic Recovery. Now, this is called as Green Pandemic Recovery. And in this limelight, it is said that the UNEP was responsible for proposing some thematic areas. There, there should be some thematic areas. And one such thematic area which was proposed by UNEP was what? <coughs> that there should be reduced industrial activity, more and more renewable energy, electrical vehicles should be more used. But one is very unique, plant-based diets. Plant-based diet should be preferred. Whatever diet we use, we should be plant-based. So we should be turning vegan. Clear? We should be turning vegan for green pandemic recovery. And why? Because if you drink milk, it contributes to global warming. If you eat meat, it contributes into global warming. Why? Because ruminants are contributing into global warming 14.5%. Greenhouse gas emission 14.5%. So they are one of the biggest culprits and we get meat and milk from them. So ruminants are contributing into global warming 14.5% and artificial breeding of these animals is taking place to meet the demand of milk and meat. So if more artificial breeding takes place, more emission will be taking place from them. So the emission which is taking place from ruminants include what? Methane, CO2, nitrous oxide. So they are a big culprit for greenhouse gases. That's why we say that plant-based diet should be preferred, turn vegan instead of milk and meat consumption because milk and meat consumption is responsible for enhancing the adverse impact of global warming. Clear? Fine. Now, at the COP26, we can see not only um, Panchamrit was announced by India, not only the infrastructure for resilient island nation step was taken, and not only this was taken, but also not only the global uh, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration was passed, but in, at COP26, one initiative was taken by our Prime Minister, which is called as One World, One Grid, One Sun Initiative. And one 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 get one sun initiative is for the purpose of what? It is for the purpose of transference of renewable energy from one country to another. But the most important uh, part of that um, uh, COP26 was a pledge which was taken by 104 nations. And this pledge, which was taken by 104 nations, can figure as questions sometimes, anytime in examination. And that's called as what? It's called as Global Methane Pledge. Global Methane Pledge. So when we say Global Methane Pledge, methane is a concern. And methane is a concern because of many reasons. One, methane is a concern because this is although short-lived in atmosphere, but we can see the heat retention capacity of methane is 25 to 28 times than that of CO2. Clear? So that's one thing. Second is oxidation of methane is responsible for generating surface level ozone. And surface level ozone is not only a pollutant, but also part of what? Also part of secondary air pollutant, which is photochemical smog clear and also when methane comes in contact with hydroxyl in atmosphere it turns into water vapor and co2 which are two types of greenhouse gases water vapor and co2 which are two types of greenhouse gases one is short lived that is water vapor the heat retention capacity is twice than that of co2 and second is co2 which stays in the atmosphere from 120 to 200 years clear 120 to 200 years so that's called as that's why methane is a concern fine and methane is also the second most abundantly greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere so methane is a concern but to phase out methane 104 nations, that's why we are saying that why methane is a concern 104 nations were responsible for signing this pledge and this pledge was signed at COP 26, 2021. And the objective is what? The objective is that 30% of methane emission, 
30 percent of methane emission would be reduced by 2030 clear and if this is reduced then the temperature of earth temperature of earth would be reduced by 0.2 degree centigrade see if we say kigali agreement if kigali agreement is successful then the temperature of earth would reduce by 0.5 degree centigrade but if global methane pledge is successful then the temperature of earth would reduce by 0.2 degree centigrade clear 0.2 degree centigrade so that's global methane pledge but the uh, uh, biggest problem hardship in this is what that three countries are there and these three countries are responsible for contributing 35 percent in methane emission and these three countries include what it includes russia it includes china and we'll put ourselves at last <laughs> india clear and all these three countries are not a part of global methane pledge clear they are not a part of global methane pledge so that's also so let's this cop 26 completed now come to cop 27 and solve a test first of all <laughs> because you have studied cop 27 through newspapers so let's solve a test The first question. Consider the following statements and select the correct code. Now, it is said that ecocide has been defined by jurists as unlawful acts with a knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long term damage to the environment being caused by these acts. We know that these acts would be responsible for causing damage to the environment, yet we are indulging in this kind of act clear yet we are indulging in this kind of act so that's ecocide ecocide applies to private companies and uh, their executives in their personal capacity it has been termed as a type of pollution also so tell me that have you any idea about ecocide the first question now the answer to this is what Methane gas is used for fuel. Definitely it is used for fuel. The uh, CNG that you use is nothing but methane. Clear? Now see, if you are talking about ecocide, remember that all three options are correct. All three options are correct. And why ecocide? Why ecocide on discussed in the COP27? See, at the COP27, we can see on the sidelines of COP27, ecocide was discussed by member nation and it was to be approved by UN. It is to be approved by UN as what? As one of the atrocides. When you talk about UN, UN is responsible for approving four kinds of atrocides. UN approves four types of atrocides. One is called as genocide. Second is called as ethnic cleansing. So this is according to UN is called as atrocide. Fourth is called as war crimes. And fifth is called as crime against humanity. Fifth is called as crime against humanity. So there are four types of atrocides which has been recognized by UN. We can see. Now we can see that uh, these four types of atrocides, genocide, and now UN is going to recognize another type of atrocide and that would be called as what? That would be called as ecocide. You know that it is going to damage the environment, yet you are indulging this act. 
So that's called as ecocide. So if suppose you are manager of executive of private companies also, you would be liable for that. And it has been termed as a type of pollution also. All the three options are correct. Clear? Next. Pushed by civil society, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is a broad and legally enforceable proposal for phasing out our global dependence on fossil fuel. It is considered as one of the key failures. This was failed. See, it is considered as one of the key failures of COP27. This treaty was started by which island nation? This is Vanadao. Clear? But this is fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And what we have studied under the COP 23rd was what? It was non-proliferation treaty on fossil fuel, which is also called as powering past coal alliance. Clear, powering past coal alliance. Now see, which one of the following is incorrect related to Amazon Headwaters Initiative? Now, it is an initiative led by indigenous people. This initiative includes a feasible plan to provide legal protection to most important ecosystem on earth. Amazon countries consists of eight countries. This initiative prohibits any further fossil fuel development in the headwaters of Amazon. See, as far as this question is concerned, question number three. Now, as far as this question is concerned, <coughs> Amazon Headwaters Initiative, we can see that this initiative is for what? This initiative is for removing fossil fuel production from the headwaters of Amazon. Headwaters means the source of Amazon. Clear? The uh, wrong option is what? Eight countries because it is consisting of six countries mainly. But all the other options are correct. And Amazon Headwater initiative was taken by the indigenous people and this was discussed also at the COP 27th. Clear? Now, next question. This is just now we have discussed. The loss and damage fund agreed upon is a key outcome of COP 27. Clear? We are saying that loss and damage fund is a key outcome of COP 27. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? See, it is a fund to rescue and rebuild physical and social infrastructure of developing countries by extreme weather. That's correct because for three decades they have suffered. Now, the Association of Small Island State is a group of not 30, that's 39 small island nations and low-lying coastal developing states would largely get benefited from this fund. That's true. But the number is wrong. That is what? 39. Loss and damage forms the third leg of comprehensive global response to climate change, the others being mitigation and adaptation. That's correct. Third leg is what? Third leg and the other two is mitigation and adaptation. That's correct. There is no agreement yet on how the finance should be provided. That's also true. But what is wrong is B option. And I think that you have clear. Now see, next. At the COP27, some countries try to reach 1.5 degree centigrade goal. But a resolution to cause emission to peak was taken out to the dismay of many. Dismay of many nations can peak emissions by which one of the following years? Now the years when the nation can peak their emission is what? 2025. 2025. Clear? At which one of the following venues COP28 would be held? Now that is what, tell me, A, Dubai. So that would be held in 
fine we'll cover up we'll cover up don't worry we'll start now pollution only fine <coughs> the last question which one of the following involves making unsubstantiated claim to deceive consumers into being uh being uh, into believing that a company's products are environmental friendly now that is called as what that's called as ye dekho isme kya hota hai ki ye companies kehti hain ki this are, this is environmental friendly but is this is not now this is called as green washing it's also called as what's also called as green sheen these are some new questions for you clear देखो अप्रोच बच्चों क्या है ना अप्रोच है कि न्यूज़पेपर में और जो ये मार्केट में भी तुमको देखो कई मटेरियल मिलते हैं के का कनेक्ट है कनेक्ट कनेक्ट है माई नोट्स है ये सारे मिलते हैं और मैं ये नहीं कर रहा हूँ कि भाई मेरा ही इंस्टीट्यूट मेरे ही इंस्टीट्यूट के आप पढ़ो ठीक है मेरे इंस्टीट्यूट के पढ़ो और भी देखो और उसके बाद उसे देखो कि क्या कॉमन चीज़ है क्लियर क्या कॉमन चीज़ है क्या रिलिवेंट है इम्पॉर्टेंट है इन मटेरियल्स को थोड़ा सा लेकर देखो आप अभी सारे बहुत सारे मटेरियल्स आए हुए हैं मार्केट में और ये सभी क्वेश्चंस बनते हैं आपके ये नहीं कि आप शंकर आइए लेकर बैठ जाओ सुबह से शाम तक मालूम हुआ कि एक भी क्वेश्चन नहीं आया तो शंकर साहब कुछ नहीं कर पाएंगे मैं भी कुछ नहीं कर पाऊँगा क्लियर सो प्लीज कंटेम्प्रेरी क्वेश्चन आते हैं और इसी तरह के क्वेश्चन आते हैं ऐसे क्वेश्चन बुक्स में होने चाहिए क्लियर बट बुक्स आर वर्चुअली गूगल दिस इज सो दिस इज आई रिक्वेस्ट यू टू गो थ्रू द करेंट कनेक्ट ऑफ के एस जी वंस एक बार जो है ना के एस जी के करेंट कनेक्ट में कहीं से बात कर लो इंस्टीट्यूट से वो दे देंगे आपको तो उन उनके जो करेंट कनेक्ट के हमारे जो इंस्टीट्यूट के हैं ना उसको एक बार सिलसिलेवार ढंग से देख लो तो बहुत सारी चीजें आ जाएंगी दिमाग में और हो सकता है कि तीस चालीस क्वेश्चन वहीं से आ जाए आपको सिर्फ ये भी सक क्योंकि कुछ इकोनॉमिक्स के क्वेश्चन कुछ इन्वायरमेंट के क्वेश्चन तो वहीं से आ जाए तो मैं एक बार रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि एक बार सरसराती निकाल से अभी बहुत टाइम है क्लियर अभी बहुत टाइम है एक एक दिन अगर एक एक कनेक्ट को भी देखोगे तब भी बहुत ज्यादा है क्लियर तो आप प्लीज करो उसे इट वुड बी बेनिफिशियल फॉर यू फाइन बेनिफिशियल फॉर यू नसी नेक्स्ट थिंग दैट विल डू इज कवर अप एक छोटा सा क्वेश्चन है बीच में कि जिसने ने पूछा है सो विल ट्राई टू एंसर दैट क्वेश्चन एंड देन विल मूव टू पोल्यूशन एंड सिंस प्लास्टिक पोल्यूशन इज इन द न्यूज फाइन सिंस प्लास्टिक पोल्यूशन इज ऑलवेज इन द न्यूज एंड वन और टू क्वेश्चन ऑन प्लास्टिक पोल्यूशन कैन बी आस्ड सो वील ट्राई टू कवर अप ऑल दो थिंग्स फाइन see the adverse impact of global warming does not include rising sea level and uh, erratic rainfall or frequency of droughts and floods enhancing the adverse impact of global warming also includes expansion of dead water zones dead water zones dead water zones are water bodies in which the dissolved oxygen level reduces fine we are saying that dead water zones हाँ चलो मैं मैं कराता हूँ प्लास्टिक आपको अभी कराता हूँ प्लास्टिक और ऐसे ऐसे क्वेश्चंस कराऊंगा जो हो सकता है कि आप आ भी सकते हैं आपको फाइन नसी कमर कस लो बच्चों लेट एस लेट एस बी स्ट्रॉगर लेट्स और देखो मैं तो हंसते हंसते खिला रहा हूँ तुम्हें कि पढ़ाते जा रहा हूँ पढ़ाते जा रहा हूँ और अभी अभी रात भी बाकी है सो विल ट्राई टू कवर अप मोर एंड मोर नसी first thing that you have to know in this case is the expansion of dwz dead water zones now we are saying dead water zones are water bodies in which the dissolved oxygen level reduces somebody has asked me question eutrophication etc i just remember that it needs to be answered here so it needs to be answered so let's cover up that and uh, dead water zone generally in water body the dissolved oxygen level is present 
and that is essential for the survival of marine organisms. Clear? But if suppose the dissolved oxygen level reduces, if the dissolved oxygen level reduces, then it would be leading to the formation of what is called as dead water zones. So, dead water zones are water bodies in which the dissolved oxygen level has reduced. Clear? Dead water zones are water bodies in which the dissolved oxygen level has reduced. So, <clears throat> there are three types of dead water zone. Now, the first type of dead water zone would be called as what? It would be referred to as terrestrial DWZ. Terrestrial dead water zone. Now, this terrestrial DWZ would be formed in what? It would be formed in lakes. Suppose this is a lake. It has dissolved oxygen level. But it would be formed in the lakes. And it would be formed in the lakes. How? Due to deposition of sediment. The sediment gets deposited in the lakes. So, when sediments are getting deposited in the lakes, the sediments can get, get deposited in the lakes by many ways. Clear? Uh, by Yes, thank you so much, Rakesh Lakra. Fine. I won't say good night because my good morning is going to be there today. So, I won't be responsible for saying good night to you all. Lekin, chalo, aage badho, sir. Aage badho, jaldi, jaldi karo, sir. Now, terrestrial DWZ, it is due to deposition of sediment. And uh, when sediment gets deposited in the lake, the lakes are gradually filled up. So, aging of lakes which takes place. Filling of lakes means aging of lakes. But these sediments are responsible for enhancing the nutrient content of the lake. Enhancing the nutrient content of the lake. So, what happens when sediment gets deposited in the lakes and nutrient content of the lakes would enhance? Then we can see that algae which are present in the lakes would be utilizing these sediments to grow in large numbers. And this phenomena would be called as what? This phenomena would be referred to as algal bloom. Is it what Algal bloom. What is it? Algal bloom. Fine. But we know that algae, they are present in the lakes, they are responsible for what? They are present in large numbers. Algae are responsible for photosynthesis. So, if they are responsible for photosynthesis, then what will happen? Then uh, we can see that if they are responsible for photosynthesis, then the oxygen regeneration should take place. But here we have said that, that the process of deposition of sediment, which is not only responsible for aging of lakes, but also enhancing its nutrient content, would be called as what? It would be called as eutrophication. Eutrophication. And due to eutrophication, only algal bloom has taken place. So, algae in large numbers cannot withstand their weight. They would be submerging. And when they submerge, they would be utilizing dissolved oxygen level. Man ki wo algae jo hai, wo submerge kar jate hai. To submerge kya ho jayega? So, if they submerge, the dissolved oxygen would be utilized. And the dissolved oxygen would be utilized by microorganism for the decomposition of these algae. So, dissolved oxygen agar man lo utilize hota hai microorganism ke dwara for the decomposition of this algae. See, the difference is many because uh, the foundation environmental courses are different and the marathon we are responsible for delivering at a very high speed. Dictation is also in the class. Some accepts are dictated, so, explained also. This is marathon session is mainly for revision purpose. But the vibes are different when you join the foundation course. Clear? Now, this is called as eutrophication and this is called as algal bloom. And algal bloom takes place due to eutrophication only. Algae, they cannot withstand their weight. They would be submerging down. And when they submerge, they would be decomposed by saprophytic bacteria utilizing the dissolved oxygen level. And if the dissolved oxygen level is utilized, then certainly 
the formation of dead water zones would be taking place. Sometimes dead water zones are referred to as what is also referred to as biological deserts. For example, Yamuna is called as a biological desert. Why? Because of the formation of dead water zones. Clear? Now, this kind of dead water zone would be called as terrestrial. But it's not that. Only terrestrial dead water zones are seen. In the coastal areas also, dead water zones would be seen. But in this case, the main agency for deposition of sediment would be the rivers. So, similar kind of dead water zone would be seen in the coastal areas. Similar kind of dead water zones would be seen in the coastal areas. Where the main agency for deposition of sediment would be the rivers. Main agency for deposition of sediment would be the rivers. Algal boom would take place in this space also. A dead water zone would be formed here also. But in this case, who is calling me Hemanta Viswa Sarma? <laughs> okay, let me look like the Chief Minister of Assam, Hemanta Viswa Sarma. Very good. And see, just we are coming to, we are coming to COP27 also. Maitri, some part of COP27 we have discussed. Two other initiatives are left. I will discuss that before. I will, de definitely I will discuss that. And then we will have a question on series on plastic pollution also. So, let us revise today. Now, what will happen is that the rivers will be responsible and coastal DWZ will be formed. But when algae are present in large numbers in the coastal areas, some of the algae, for example, red algae, they are responsible for turning the water of coastal area red. And that is why this phenomena through which the water of the coastal area is turned red would be called as what? It would be called as red tide. Good evening, everybody. Somebody has joined now. Now, the basics of biology can be covered from, look, NCRT ki purani edition hai. Usse le lo bache, wo mil jayega tumhe kahin par. Cover to if suppose uh, preliminary examination is very near, so it would be difficult. But for next year, you can take that. Fine. Now, <coughs> Now, here we can see that the color of the water would be turning red. Now, this phenomena is called as red tide. It may be due to the presence of algae. It can be also due to the toxins released by algae that the color of the water would be turning red. <coughs> clear color of the water is turning red. Is that clear? This phenomena is called as dead tide. But in the midst of the ocean, we can see dead water zone is present in the midst of the ocean also. And it is present in the midst of the ocean from 600 to 1200 meters deep. Clear? In the middle of the ocean, it is present from 600 to 1200 meters deep. A natural dead water zone is present, which is called as OMZ. Now, due to global warming, what is happening? That dead water zones are expanding. And expanding why? Because if temperature Enhances due to global warming. The MCQs. If temperature is enhancing due to global warming, we can see that uh, not only temp if temperature is enhancing, the dissolution rate of oxygen in water would be getting reduced. And if dead water zone expands in the middle of the ocean, jellyfish from this area would be migrating to the coastal area. And this phenomena would be called as jellyfish bloom. So, in the coastal areas, they would be responsible for jellyfish bloom and they would be disrupting the coastal ecosystem. Disrupting the coastal ecosystem. Clear? Secret star, sir, you taught us IR in Keol January. Some countries are not covered. We told to the coordinator, but we will take the remaining classes. Okay, the, tell the coordinator whenever we will, I will also share the video of my classes. Do not worry about that. Refer current affairs are all red algae toxic. No, not red algae are toxic, but the toxins released by algae. 
Toxins reach balls. We entertained all environmental crisis, right? It's necessary to watch the marathon for 2024. Yes, you can watch the marathon for 2024 because the number of questions are there. Now, no, 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 no. Matri has asked me that the remaining part of the COP27 has not been covered. So there are two initiatives which have been taken at COP27, which need to be covered. One initiative is called as what? It's called as Mangrove Alliance. Mangrove Alliance. Now, Mangrove Alliance is a group of what? Seven nations. Seven nations. And four are code members. <laughs> One is the Western code member also. Two are Western code members. Now, the four members are what? India. UAE. It was launched by UAE only. Australia. Japan. So, all these are four COD members. This is not a real COD member. It is a member of Western COD, UAE. But it was launched by UAE only. And we can see then Spain, Sri Lanka, Indonesia. So, these are seven members of Mangrove Alliance. The purpose is what? The purpose is to enhance awareness related to mangrove. The purpose is to enhance awareness related to mangroves. Clear? Because mangroves are what? Mangroves are uh, responsible for reducing the adverse impact of global warming. Clear? See, the strategy, uh, Ankush uh, single for uh, preliminary examination environment is what? Blend both the conventional topics with the contemporary issues. Fine. Fine. Now, this is to enhance awareness. Another initiative was taken and that initiative was taken at COP 27th and that was called as what? It was called as International Drought Resilient Alliance. International Drought Resilient Alliance, which consists of what? Which consists of 30 nations. 20 business organizations. Clear. And this was uh, this was for the purpose of what? This was for the purpose of pe preparing for future droughts. And why? Because the frequency of droughts and floods have enhanced due to the adverse impact of global warming and climate change. And as far as the relevance of mangrove is concerned, it reduces the adverse impact of global warming by producing what is called as blue carbon. It is also responsible for reducing the intensity of tropical cyclones. It is also responsible for reducing the intensity of uh, tsunami waves because it acts as a hindrance. Clear. And uh, we can see that as far as And also you can see that's not only this, but also uh, mangrove area is of high biodiversity, high ecological productivity, it's an ecotone, that's the resilience of mangrove areas. That's why this alliance has been formed. Clear? Now from here we start with pollution, some important things about pollution. Now if we talk about water pollution, we can see that water pollution has taken place. There are many contemporary issues related to water pollution. They are not going to ask you BOD and COD right now because already they have asked in examination <coughs> earlier. So, yes, wildlife uh, species, you can uh, discuss many a species in that. But uh, the thing is that it becomes very in, uh, lengthy to cover up. But there are certain areas where you can emphasize on. For example, we have discussed just a test on protected areas. Now, these types of questions can be framed. And also some questions other than invasive uh, wildlife can be asked as questions. So, these kind of questions can figure in your examination. That's the first kind of organization on dot. Yes. Now, as far as pollution is concerned, we can see pollution. We can see that arsenic pollution Arsenic pollution has taken place in the northern plains of India. 
northern plains of India. Clear? Arsenic pollution has taken place in the northern plains of India. I would have explained, but due to paucity of time, we will pick up the uh, all those points which can be asked as objective questions. So, northern plains of India, it includes Punjab, Haryana, Bihar. But the first reported case of arsenic was in uh, West Bengal, Murshidabad district. Murshidabad district. And today we can see maximum level of arsenic, level of arsenic is present in Balia of Uttar Pradesh. Balia of Uttar Pradesh. Clear? Now, the reason for contamination is irrigation and you can call Green Revolution of India also because post Green Revolution we were responsible for withdrawing excess amount of water for irrigation purpose which resulted in arsenic contamination. But the source of arsenic is what in the northern plains of India where it comes from? It comes from Himalayas and it comes from Himalayas through the perennial rivers through the perennial rivers. Perennial rivers, that's about arsenic pollution. Now, what it is responsible for? Range is 0.5. Yes, yes, range is. Uh, in, in fact, WHO says that the presence of arsenic in water, drinking water should be 5 ppm parts per million. But uh, as far as uh, the Indian standards are concerned. The government of India says that it should be above, it uh, should be the uppermost limit should be 50 ppm. Clear? 50 ppm. Okay, Amar. Very good. I am not preparing for the exam, but it's a pleasure to be in your class. Fine. Very good. And these things would be helping also. Arsenic pollution. And arsenic pollution is responsible for what? It is res responsible for diseases like melanosis melanosis means skin turns dark keratosis keratosis means skin turns dry and scaly and also it is responsible for black foot disease just remember this thing as far as preliminary examination is concerned in arsenic pollution that what is the reason behind pollution what is the source of arsenic and we can see so, source of arsenic is Himalayas, from the perennial rivers it comes and the geological processes which were responsible for the formation of Himalayas were also responsible for presence of arsenic in the rocks of Himalayas and this is the real reason behind arsenic pollution. But the second pollution contemporary issue related to water pollution is uranium contamination. Uranium contamination. Now, uranium contamination has taken place where? In Punjab. And Punjab, Faridkot, Hoshiarpur, Bhatinda, districts of Punjab are the worst affected due to uranium contamination. But also in Rajasthan. And we can see one third district of Rajasthan has reported uranium contamination. So, Punjab, Rajasthan, then Telangana also. When we talk about Telangana, we can see the granite rocks of Telangana is responsible for uranium contamination. Clear? The granite rocks is responsible for uranium contamination. In Rajasthan, it is irrigation which is responsible. That's the green revolution. Why? Because when you are pumping water, pumping water, pumping, naturally see uranium is present in underground water. Wetlands and swampy land difference? Sir, please just name the other initiative of COP2 except mangrove alliance. That is international drought resistance uh, alliance. Now, preliminary examination, CBD, COP27, all these things. Sir, please just name the other initiative of COP2 except Mangrove Alliance. That is IDRA, the International Drought Resistance Alliance. And the other, uh, uh, the other initiatives which I have um, discussed in the form of test is the 
Amazon Headwaters Initiative, Loss and Damage Fund, Clear Fossil Fuel non proliferation Treaty, Ecocide, all these are the initiative. Fine. Because of largest amount of plast pesticides used in drought. See, as far as uh, Rajasthan is concerned, Rajasthan uh, uranium contamination is why? It is mainly due to what? It is mainly When we are talking about uh, in Rajasthan, the uh, ma uh, mainly it is why it is mainly due to irrigation because in underground water uranium is present and when you are pumping underground water, oxidation of underground water takes place and oxidation of underground water is always responsible for its enrichment. So, when uranium becomes enriched, it is nothing but a pollutant. Telangana granite rocks are responsible, but when, when we talk about Punjab, Punjab there are many reasons, we cannot zero it on one to be the cause of uranium contamination in Punjab, use of agriculture, use of fertilizers on a very high intense rate in agriculture, then also excessive withdrawal of underground water, then also this part of Punjab, some part of the Punjab is present near Siwaliks where the rocks do have uranium content. So, all these are reason behind uranium contamination in Punjab. But when you talk about <coughs> Shale gas extraction, shale gas extraction, shale gas extraction is also responsible for water contamination. Shale is what? Shale is a sedimentary rock, sedimentary rock and it has natural gas, methane deposit in it. Shale is a sedimentary rock, it has natural gas, methane deposit in it. Clear? Okay, mother dairy tasty lassi, that one very good, okay, <laughs> fine. So, <coughs> shale has, uh, shale is a sedimentary rock which has natural gas, methane deposit in it. Now, we can see extraction of shale gas is conducted by mechanism and that mechanism is called as hydraulic fracking in which sand is mixed with water, chemicals, some chemicals like HCl, NH4Cl is used, HCl is used for making a dent in the rock, NH4Cl is used to make the germ, uh, the reaction germ free, the process germ free. So, all these are done uh, for extraction of shale gas. So, this method is called as what? This method is called as hydraulic fracking. So, when the debris is emitted due to shale gas extraction, because we use what? We use sand, chemical and water to blast these rocks and when the rocks are converted into uh, flakes, then only extraction would be conducted. Then only we are responsible for conducting the extraction when the rocks turn into flakes. But rocks turn into flakes, then the extraction is conducted. There are many adverse impact of shale gas extraction, which includes contamination of water body nearby, then methane also would be emitted, which would be responsible for enhancing greenhouse gas emissions. But when you talk about uh, the Ganga pollution, Ganga pollution mainly occurred due to what? Mainly occurred due to leather industries of Kanpur, burning of dead bodies near Varanasi and also due to open defecation near these rivers. Now, we have Namami Gange project started from 2014. But before that, Ganga Action Plan 1 was started in 1986, which was meant for 25 districts of uh, this area. And also, Ganga Action Plan was taken out in the year um, 2011, which was meant for 59 districts of that region. Clear, 59 districts of that region. So, Ganga Action Plan were taken. But in Namami Gange project, the process of bioremediation was used. So, Ganga Eco Task Force was also established and the process of bioremediation was used. The concern is what? That they can ask you a question on plastic. And we can see that in news always happens to be the biggest example of water pollution in the world. And the biggest example of water pollution in the world is what? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Clear, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So, we can see in the Pacific Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, Pacific Ocean and uh, 
in the middle and the northern part of Pacific Ocean. There is a patch present. Patch means a suspended trash is present. A suspended waste is present. And this suspended trash is 2,200 kilometers in length only. 2,200 kilometers in length only. Then this happens to be also 800 kilometer in breadth. And this is 10 meters deep also. 10 meters deep. Now this is called as what? This is called as Great Pacific Garbage Patch. You would have seen in the news also. Recently also in the news it was there. Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now this consists of what this consists of fishing lines fishing lines matlab fishing nets fishing lines this consists of what diapers bachon ke bade ke bhi diapers and also it consists of not only fishing lines and diapers but it also consists of what it is also consisting of bottles plastic bottles cans cans. So, all these things are present in Great Pacific Garbage Patch. But how it has been formed? It has been formed due to jurs. Jurs means when two oceanic currents mingle, at that place we can see, see river, po uh, river pollution is a serious problem all over the India and uh, the main uh, seriousness is due to the presence of storm water drains. Storm water drains means they are drains which are responsible for discharging sewage in rivers. And these drains are a big concern. Why? Because they discharge sewage in the rivers, contamination of rivers takes place. For example, in Ludhiana, there is a drain which is called as Budhanala. In Delhi, there is a drain which is called as uh, the Najabgarh Nala. And all these drains are responsible for enhancing, all these drains are responsible for enhancing the contamination of rivers. Clear? In rivers, we can see arsenic and zinc level is present as per the prescribed limit. But rivers in India have reported enhanced level of metal, heavy metal contamination. For example, iron is present, chromium is present, lead is present. These are heavy metals which are present in uh, rivers to a greater extent. These are heavy metals which are present in the rivers to a greater extent. Now, that is a concern clear that is a concern now this is called as great pacific garbage patch now to uh, what happened was that this has been formed due to jars because when two oceanic currents mingle whirling of oceanic water takes place which is called as jar so, two of the biggest years of the world are present in Pacific Ocean, which is called as East Pacific Jar and West Pacific Jar. East, East Pacific Jar and West Pacific Jar. And as far as the oceanic currents are concerned, the oceanic currents were responsible for carrying the waste from the continents. And due to jar formation, this stress has resulted. Due to jar formation, this stress has resulted. Fine. Trash has resulted. It's not only the biggest example of, see, there was an expedition of scientists launched in 2009, which was called as Tara Ocean, to study the nature of this patch, to study the nature of this patch. And uh, not only this was done, but uh, also we can see, and the objective of Tara Ocean was to not only study the nature of this patch, but also to prepare a, a marine da a database of marine organisms marine organisms clear but when we talk about great pacific garbage patch we can see that great pacific garbage patch is also the biggest example of not only great pacific garbage patch is not only the biggest example of water pollution in the world but also the biggest example of what? Biggest example of plastic contamination in the world. 
we can see the great pacific garbage patch is not only the biggest example of water pollution in the world but the biggest example of plastic pollution in the world why because 2 lakh 69000 million tons of plastic is present in it it's a big sum and these plastics are divided into three types one is called as what one is called as macroplastic now macroplastic would be having a diameter of more than 200 mm second is called as what second is called as mesoplastic mesoplastic would be having a diameter between 4.75 to 200 mm and third is called as what is called as microplastic because microplastic would be having a diameter of less than 4.57 75 mm clear plastic microplastic is also called as what it's also called as plastic beads thank you dr malaika fine <clears throat> now when we are talking about thank you for the compliment हाँ मैं कर रही हूँ अनुल मैं करा रहा हूँ पोल्यूशन भी करा रहा हूँ सब देखो इम्पोर्टेंट चीज़ को मैं उठा उठा के कराते जा रहा हूँ ठीक है और उसके बाद थोड़ा सा बायोटेक्नोलॉजी भी कराऊंगा इसके बाद डोंट वरी वी कैन सी दैट एज फार एज माइक्रो plastic is concerned microplastic is also called as what it's called as plastic beads and it's not only called as a plastic beads but it's also called as micro beads micro beads now it should not be referred to as plastic pellets but when we talk about the source of that what is the source of microplastic we can see that the source of micro uh, we can see the source of microplastic is what the source of microplastic is uh, nothing but consumer products that we use for example toothpaste in toothpaste microplastic is present toothpaste microplastic is present then also in facial scrubs facial scrub microplastic is present so it is present in the toothpaste it is present in the facial scrub and these types of plastic these types of plastic are responsible for what just one thing just one second battery is running out let me get it charged okay now these types of plastic which is called as microplastic plastic beads or micro beads now they are responsible for this resolute reducing the dissolved oxygen level they are present in toothpaste and facial scrubs and uh, we can see that if they ask you that which type of micro pollutant is present in the oceans uh, in abundance that's microplastic but if microplastic is not given and tar dust is given remember that tar dust is a type of microplastic clear tar dust is a type of microplastic only so if tar dust is given then it's a type of microplastic only that you have to know clear and uh, as far as microplastic is concerned another type of microplastic is called as plastic noodles plastic noodles kya hai lentil size plastic hai chote chote plastic hai and these plastic noodles lentil size plastic these plastic noodles what they are they are small sized lentil size plastic so they are concern why because they are mistaken by marine organism as their food stuff Nettles spread on a large scale in 2021 when a marine disaster occurred in Sri Lanka. There was a wreckage of 
डिस्चार्ज है देर वॉज रेकेज ऑफ एक्सप्रेस पर्ल Just one second. This is a change in batteries. Batteries got exhausted. Not the teacher. <coughs> Fine. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Your lectures are very crucial for me in revision of film. Thank you so for helping me to consolidate my press. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, always welcome, I am. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Now let's continue because let's. talk about the great pacific garbage patch and also in that let's talk about the plastic we have seen that that as far as plastics are concerned microplastic is a grave concern and in microplastic a type of plastic is not only tar dust but another type of plastic is plastic noodles plastic noodles and noodles are a concern wise because of their size because they are lentil sized small sized and since they are small sized we can see that uh, they are often mistaken by marine organisms as their food stuff food stuff and uh, also we can see that they are made up of polystyrene polyethylene polypropylene polyvinyl chloride these are the chemicals which are making it and uh, not only they are spongy in nature so if they are spongy in nature they are responsible for attracting toxic chemicals toxic chemicals clear thank you so much thank you satnayan now we can see that micro uh, plastic is also present in micro plastic is also present in the air that we breathe Microplastic is also present in our blood because it was tested that microplastic is present in the human blood also. So microplastic is also present in the blood. Fine, definitely microplastic is present in our blood, and uh, also we can see that as far as microplastic is concerned, it has many adverse impact. But not only microplastic is a concern. the concern is what the chemicals which are present in plastic there are many chemicals present in plastic that also happens to be a concern one chemical which is present in plastic is called as what it is called as phthalates go phthalates hai plastic mein 20 kism ke phthalate hote hain this is used to make the plastic products more flexible and this is responsible for what this is responsible for genetic disorder among children disorder among children and this is also responsible for sterility among males ye athletes ka kaam aur agar maan lo ki ye bottle hai har bottle ka expiry date hota hai aur expiry date isliye hota hai kyunki agar maan lo tumne is bottle ko jyada din tak rakha so what will happen is what will happen is that phthalates would be passing from the plastic into the water clear that's why the expiry date is given second is what second is bisphenol a bisphenol a kya hai now bpa is a type of chemical which is used for making plastic products more soft then you have Bf bfr that is brominated fire retardants which we have just now studied both bpa and bfr are responsible for what they are responsible for endocrine disruption endocrine disruption ka matlab hai ki isse hormonal imbalance honge endocrine disruption then you have vinyl chloride vinyl chloride kya hai vinyl chloride is responsible for what it is responsible for damaging central nervous system so all these are chemicals used in plastic and also you can see that when you purchase mobiles there's a white wrap sheet 
Now this wrap sheet is called as what? It's called as styrofoam. Styrofoam. And this is what? This is nothing but an extended form of. This is nothing but an extended form of polystyrene. And this is reported to be carcinogenic in nature. Carcinogenic in nature matlab, this would be damaging. Carcinogenic in nature because yes, toddlers use plastic for milk feeding. Now these are virgin plastic, but this is also responsible for release of microplastic. Yes, it is present in the lungs. It is present in the blood, not only in the lung. Clear? Not only the lung, it is present in the blood also. So that is uh, called as an styrofoam is present. This is responsible for being carcinogenic in nature. It would be responsible for causing cancer. So this is all plastic mein chemicals. Now, let's see what we can do. It has not been solved yet. Now, let's see what we can do. Look, it's not enough. Whenever you are responsible for burning plastic, burning of plastic would be responsible for emission of gases like dioxins and furanes. And both dioxins and furanes are carcinogenic in nature. Okay? They are responsible for causing cancers. Now, if suppose we say waste incineration is a, waste incineration is a source of furanes. Waste incineration is also a source of, waste burning is also, plastic burning is also a source of uh, dioxin. And uh, dioxin sources also include paper and pulp bleaching, pesticide making, all these are sources of dioxin. And dioxin can be asked anytime in your examination. Thermocol is also a pack, uh, type of plastic. Just now we will solve the question also on that. Now thermocol is also a type of plastic. Now dioxin is a type of uh, toxic gas, carcinogenic in nature. And dioxin is a group of 100 odd gases. The most detrimental of which is 2, 3, 7, 8, tetrachlorodibenzo P dioxin. Or you can say TCDD. Clear? TCDD. But this is the same gas which was used by US as Agent Orange in Vietnam War. Clear? Same gas. So without fighting a war, we are, we are being exposed to this kind of plastic. Clear? Yes, I am still fe feeling fresh and energetic. Because after 24 hours, I'll, my battery would be down. <laughs> my battery would be lasting for 24 hours. <laughs> Fine. Thermocol also is a type of plastic. But see, why dioxin and furans can be asked in examination? Dioxins and furans can be asked in examination. Why? Because from the landfills, due to waste incineration, dioxins and furans are emitted. One thing. And the biomedical waste management rules of 2000 and uh, management amendment rules of 2018 were responsible for banning chlorinated plastic bags and gloves because incineration of these products are responsible for emission of dioxins and furans. Incineration of these products are responsible for emission of dioxins and furans. Is that clear? Fine. So, dioxin and furans can be any time asked in your examination that what is dioxins and furans. But plastic pollution is not over. We will continue plastic pollution. We can see that uh, plastic is being dumped inside the ocean by rivers also. Clear? So, they are riverine contributors of mismanaged plastic in the oceans. Riverine contributors of mismanaged plastic in the oceans and the biggest contributor is what the biggest contributor is Yangtze of China and why we are saying Yangtze of China because Yangtze of China is responsible for dumping 3,30,000 tons of mismanaged plastic in ocean every year the second is Ganga our holy Ganga is responsible for dumping 1,20,000 tons of mismanaged plastic per year. Per year. Clear? Ganga is responsible for dumping 1,20,000 tons of mismanaged plastic every year as such. That is also done. But 
we can see that the plastic footprint of India, like we have discussed water footprint, ecological footprint, carbon footprint. So, we have a plastic footprint of India also. And the plastic footprint of India means that per capita, per person, plastic waste generated. Per capita, per person, plastic waste generated, mismanaged plastic generated. So, we can see that the amount of mismanaged plastic generated per person in India is 3.2 kg per year. Now, this is far less than the global average of 17 kg per year. Clear? But then, if the plastic footprint of India is low, yes, biotech is still remaining. After this, we will start with biotech. At 12 o'clock, we'll start with biotech. <laughs> Clear? At 12 o'clock, we'll start with biotech. And we'll discuss human genome, stem cells, uh, GM mustard, BT brinjal, BT cotton, BG2 cotton, all these things. Briefly, we'll discuss. What we'll discuss? Clear? After this. And we'll discuss also uh, cloning, triple parent baby. So, a concept we will उसे भी खत्म कर लेते हैं क्योंकि बायोटेक से क्वेश्चंस आते हैं ना एग्जामिनेशन में देखो मैं जानता हूं कि तुम ज्यादातर चीज करंट अफेयर्स के खींच लोगे लेकिन फिर भी मैं चाहता हूं नहीं कर नहीं करना आज ही करना है यस टुडे ओनली विल कंप्लीट नाउ यू आर नॉट सो यू शुड बी सपोर्टिंग मी राइट नाउ प्लीज डो नो कल मुझे भी नींद आ रही है बच्चों बट जस्ट फॉर just, just for your sake, we are getting together. हाँ, मैं बायोटेक से पहले पोल्यूटेंट करवा रहा हूँ ना, पहले तो पोल्यूटेंट करवा रहा हूँ ना, उसके बाद ही बायोटेक शुरू करूँगा। रिस्लेशन तुम कर लो, एक कुछ तो अपने से कर लो, और आल स्टार्ट। हाँ, तीन बजे तक रहेंगे आज सात, तीन बजे तक, तीन बजे मैं भी, ओके, वी कैन डू इट, प्ल don't lose, don't lose the confidence, please. अगर तुम lose करोगे तो फिर मैं भी lose कर जाऊँगा confidence. तीन बजे तक हम लोग साथ रहते हैं और उसके बाद discuss करके इसे बारे बजे मैं एक break लूँगा इग्यारे पचपन पर, ठीक है? करके ही रहेंगे मैत्री, very good. ठीक है? हाँ, सब चीज बता दें. आज पहले 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 आज बात टेक्नोलॉजी कर लो. फाइन तो थोड़ा सा आज करो आज साथ रहो आज दोनों देखो इसमें कितना बड़ा है अपने से करोगे कितना बड़ा सेगमेंट है फाइन नो नो ओके थैंक यू सो मच विल टेक एट ब्रेक एट 11:55 फाइन एंड देन 10 मिनट्स ब्रेक एंड देन विल कंटिन्यू नो सी we can see 3.2 kg. But why Ganga is second biggest river and contributor? If suppose the um, plastic footprint of India is low, Ganga is the second biggest river and contributor because half a billion people reside in the catchment area of Ganga. We can see that plastic is present in e-waste also, electronic waste also. Plastic is present in biomedical waste also. It's present in e-waste also. Plastic is present in biomedical waste also. And uh, when you are talking about <coughs> e-waste, biomedical waste, plastic is present. So, and the bulk of e-waste, e-waste mein manu sabse bada component jo hai, that is plastic only. Plastic only in e-waste. Biggest component of e-waste is plastic. And biggest component biomedical waste is also plastic. But there are some developments also which deserves attention. One is what? That in India, there is no law related to textile production, which is also responsible for plastic pollution. Look, landfills में 17 percent textile ही है, और जो भी textile हम लोग पहनते हैं, जो cotton भी नजर आते हैं हमें, they are come from plastic. Why? Because polymers, polyester, is from the petrochemical industry. We take polyester from petrochemical industry. And this is used for textiles. 70% of textile is nothing but polyester based. Clear? So, when textile production takes place, it is also big contributor in greenhouse gas emission. In greenhouse gas emission, it would be contributing 
which is uh, contributing uh, to about roughly about equivalent to 186 thermal plants. That is the contribution of textile production in greenhouse gas emission. Clear greenhouse gas emission. Yes, only 9 percent of is recycled and the other is mismanaged plastic is that only. Clear? Now, those are important. <coughs> now, as far as, as far as plastic pollution is concerned, we can see also that the plastic products which are littered on the beaches they would be melting under the influence of solar radiation. And when they melt under the influence of solar radiation, they combine with some natural compounds and they form stones out of plastic, which is called as what? Which is called as plastigomerate, which is called as plastigomerate. So there, there can be stones out of plastic also, which is called as plastigomerate, clear? And this is one of the worst types of environmental degradation that we can see. But as far as what needs to be done for plastic, it's not that the five R principle, refuse, reduce, re, uh, reuse, reorient, repurpose, recycle can be used. But for, yes, I'm rock star. Yes, I know, <laughs> plastic over it. But also the contribution made by plastic man of India cannot be denied. Plastic man of India is Dr. Raj Gopalan Vasudev. Raj Gopalan Vasudev and he is called as the plastic man of India because he developed stones of plastic waste that is called as plastic stones and he also developed roads of plastic, so plastic roads he developed in India and he was conferred was, he was conferred with Padma Shri in 2018, clear, so his name is called, he is called as what, he is the plastic man of India and his name is Dr. Raj Gopalan Vasudev, clear. And as far as the plastic waste management amendment rules of 2021 is concerned, under that rules we can see single-use plastic has been completely banned. And single-use plastic has been banned from when? It has been banned uh, from July uh, 1st, 2022. And the Thickness of the plastic bag has been enhanced. The thickness of the plastic bag has been enhanced from uh, 50 microns to 120 microns and it has been enhanced from 50 microns to 120 microns and this has been done from the uh, December 31st, 2022 so that it can be reused. But also we can see in the year 2018, we were responsible for celebrating this year as beat plastic pollution year. So, we celebrated this year as beat plastic pollution year also. So, this was and these initiatives have been taken for plastic pollution, clear? Now, see, as far as air pollution is concerned, now let us solve a question on plastic pollution, first of all. that test. <clears throat> Probably at the, after the break, I will try to bring it on the board so that it can be solved. Now see. After the break, I'll try to bring that on the board so that it can be solved. Maybe that's missing, but that's prepared. We'll try to solve that. Now, as far as air pollution is concerned, we can see that uh, air pollution is 
in the form of aerosols or particulate matter. It can be PM 2.5 if the diameter of particulate matter is 2.5 micrometer or less. So, it would be called as PM 2.5. But if the diameter is 10 micrometer or less, it would be remaining suspended in the air and it would be called as PM 10. Clear? PM 10 and PM 2.5. So, diameter would be always there. Now, this is measured in terms of uh, pollutants are present in the form of aerosols, so it is called as aerosol optical depth and we can see that they are measured in terms of what? It is measured in terms of microgram per meter cube. So, it is measured in terms of microgram per meter cube and uh, the as far as National Air Quality Index of India is concerned, National Air Quality Index of India includes 8 indicators which includes what? Which includes PM10, PM2.5. NO2, carbon monoxide, O3, then sulfur dioxide, ammonia and lead. These are 8 indicators which are measured in terms of microgram per meter cube. But there are some other indicators, 4 more indicators in the National Ambient Air Quality Index of India which includes arsenic also along with the, these 8 which includes nickel also, which includes benzene also, which includes benzopyrene also. So, these are 8 indicators, uh, 12 indicators which is present in the National Ambient Air Quality Index of India. But uh, we can see the northern cities of India are more air polluted when, the, when compared to the cities of south and Delhi is one of the worst in terms of air pollution. Now, that is due to stubble burning. And stubble burning is due to a variety of paddy which is called as Pusa 44 variety of paddy which is a long standing variety of paddy which gives less time for wheat cultivation, clear, less time for wheat cultivation for the farmers. So, that is called as Pusa 44 variety of paddy which gives less time for wheat cultivation. And uh, as far as stubble burning is concerned, we can see that stubble burning takes place in Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan and uh, Western Uttar Pradesh. But in case of stubble burning, many steps have been taken. For example, we were responsible for the, uh, the NGT was responsible for banning stubble burning in all these states, but ban has been not been implemented properly. The PUSA Institute came up with new variety of paddy like PUSA 121, PUSA 126, which are what? Which are nothing but short-lived varieties of paddy so that stubble burning can be reduced. Then also again, Supreme Court of India was responsible for banning the use of lithium, anti money, mercury, arsenic and lead in firecrackers also. So, all these steps were taken for stubble burning. We also, the government of India was also responsible for purchasing some devices, for example, happy cedars, hay rakes, straw choppers for this purpose. So, it was produced. Uh, it was uh, f given to the farmers of these, uh, farmers of these states also, fine. So, all these things was done for stubble burning. But another concern is what? Another concern is burning of furnace oil. On furnace oil, they have asked you question in examination also. In the NCR region, which is a highly industrialized nation, region, burning of furnace oil takes place on a large scale in the industries. Initially, it was exempted from the state tax. But furnace oil is a concern. Why? Because the <coughs> furnace oil is one of the uh, by products of uh, petroleum, rust gate byproducts of petroleum refineries, but is rich in sulphur. We can see that furnace oil, the sulphur contains is 15,000 to 20,000 ppm, but that of the diesel is only 5 ppm as such. That of the diesel is only 5 ppm and sulphur is a gas, but when it comes in contact with uh, moisture in atmosphere, it would be turning out into what? It would be turning out into um, we can say uh, particulate matter which is responsible for enhancing the pollution level. Another uh, another byproduct of the petrochemical is called as what? It is called as pet coke. And we can see pet coke is used for energy. It is used for energy instead of coal, although pet coke is costly. But the energy, uh, we can see the Sulfur content of pet coke is very high, 69,000 to 74,000 ppm, ppm, that is the 
सल्फर कंटेंट ऑफ पेटकोक ग्रीन क्रैकर्स आर दोज क्रैकर्स इन विच लामाल इज नॉट प्रेजेंट लिथियम एंटीमनी मरकरी आर्सनिक एंड सल्फ लेट इज नॉट प्रेजेंट सो इट वुड बी रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर लेस ऑफ पोल्यूशन क्लियर लेस ऑफ पोल्यूशन सो दस कॉल्ड एस पेटकोक सो द सल्फर इज सो सल्फर इज डेंजरस बट इन करविंग एयर पोल्यूशन देर मेनी स्टेप्स विच हैव बीन टेकन एंड वी कैन सी दैट the national clean air program was launched the national clean air program was for reducing pm 2.5 and pm 10 level by 20 to 30% by 2024 it was launched in the year 2019 the national uh, clean air program fine so that was launched in the year 2019 and the purpose was to reduce uh, the pm 2.5 and pm 10 levels by 20 to 30% as such and also we can use devices we we have used green mufflers green mufflers means vegetation on both sides of the roads to reduce air pollution we have used bs norms also for this purpose the bhar stage norms and bharat 6 is implemented in india bhar 6 has been implemented in india clear so that norm has been used and also we have used for vehicular emission for reducing vehicular emission we have used catalytic converters so catalytic converters are responsible for converting nox into nitrogen because nox is emitted from vehicles into nitrogen which should be escaping into the atmosphere clear bs6 norms have been used clear and also we can see that in delhi the anti smog tower has been used also and these smog towers would be responsible for catching the polluted air from the top and releasing pure air near the bottom so anti smog towers also has been used for this purpose clear as far as see as far as electronic waste is concerned e waste is concerned we can see on electronic waste they have asked you question it's a concern in india because india is considered to be a dumping station of e waste by developed nation it's a concern in india because india is considered to be a dumping station of e waste by developed nation first thing the second thing is what that e waste consists of hazardous substances ab dekho ek bar unhone kya kiya tumhe question pooch diya hai e waste par और वो क्वेश्चन जो है ई वेस्ट पर उसमें एजार्डस सब्सटेंस को पूछा गया कि क्या इसमें है क्या नहीं है नाउ इफ वी टॉक अबाउट द बिगेस्ट अट्रैक्शन ऑफ ई वेस्ट देर मेनी थिंग्स विच आर कमिंग फ्रॉम ई वेस्ट वन इज कॉल्ड एज गोल्ड इट कम्स फ्रॉम द कैपेसिटर्स गोल्ड फ्रॉम द कैपेसिटर्स देन वी कैन सी कॉपर कॉपर कम्स फ्रॉम वायर then we can see also the biggest attraction is plastic like is bulk of it is nothing but plastic clear bulk of it so first concern is what that these are the attractions of e waste but india is regarded as a dumping station of e waste by developed nation why because they send e waste to india because either the mechanism of disposal is a costly affair or the mechanism of disposal even the mechanism of disposal is a costly affair or we can see the mechanism of such disposal not only would be a costly affair but sometimes it is energy intensive for example pyrometallurgy hydrometallurgy all these are mechanisms which are used in india it is a concern because 95% more than 95% of e waste is improperly disposed by the unorganized sector so more than 95 Five percent of e-waste is improperly disposed by the unorganized sector, and as far as e-waste is concerned, we can see <coughs> there are some things. E-waste can be classified into three categories. One is called as white goods. White goods means that they are household appliances. Second is called as what? Second is called as uh, brown goods. For example, TVs and cameras would be considered as brown goods. third is called as what third is called as gray goods gray good means communication devices would be considered as gray goods more than 70% of e waste is nothing but gray goods only 
more than 70% of e waste is nothing but grey goods only fine grey goods only now also do remember the fact that that in e waste what is there in e waste the question that has been asked to you in your examination also americium is present americium is present where it is present in a device called smoke alarm and this is reported to be what this is reported to be carcinogenic in nature clear second is what americium is present in smoke alarm this is reported to be carcinogenic in nature then we can see second mercury is present mercury is present where it is present in the computer monitors and this is responsible for dementia dementia this loss of memory then we can see that third which is present that is sulfur sulfur is present in the lead acid batteries lead acid batteries and sulfur is responsible for what sulfur is responsible for lung and kidney damage then we can see cadmium is present cadmium is present where it is present in the rechargeable batteries it is present in the rechargeable batteries and this is responsible for what this is responsible for liver and kidney damage then we can see that lead solder is present soldering you understand is present where it is present in the circuits and like like this a question has been asked in your examination and this is responsible for lack of cognitive behavior lack of cognitive behavior then also we can see lack of cognitive behavior then also we can see beryllium oxide is present beryllium oxide is present it is present in the cpus that we use and this is present this is responsible for skin damage then we can see that not only beryllium oxide is present also bfr is present bromated fire retardant is present this is present in the plastic component plastic part of e waste and this is responsible for hormonal imbalance and then we can see hexavalent chromium is present hexavalent chromium means that if you examine your laptops the steel plates present in that but these steel plates which are present in that are uh, very <laughs> thin but these appear to be hard why because a hardener is used this hardener which is used for steel plate is called as what it is called as hexavalent chromium so it's used as hardener for steel plates <coughs> steel plates and we can see that this is responsible for what this is responsible for dna damage dna damage now this is a list of articles which is present in e waste clear which is present in e waste the hazardous one and we can see today solar waste is also considered to be a type of e waste only
okay see that solar waste is also considered to be what also considered to be a type of e-waste. Let us continue the next day save energy for tomorrow, but uh, we have we, we, we should be covering up after we will take a break right now of uh, 10 minutes and uh, then we will deal with what then we will deal with what we will deal with biotechnology because some students they want biotechnology to be covered up some parts which they are difficult to understand. I know that the factuals you will cover up. But some parts are to understand, so let's cover up that. Take a break right now for 10 minutes. We resume at 12 o'clock. We resume at 12 o'clock.